Test one, two. Test one, two.
our city council meeting of March 25th, 2021 to order. For those who would like to join us, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. We're excited tonight. This is the first time we've all been here together at the dais um, in a while, in a, probably a year. A city clerk, if you could please conduct a roll call. Councilmember Garner. Present. Councilmember Kors. Here. Councilmember Woods. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Present. Mayor Holstech. Here. All council is present. Thank you. So we have some business presentations and then we have some presentations um, after that. So the Palm Springs International Airport update from our city manager, Dr. David Reddy. Thank, thank you, Mayor, members of council. This is uh, really some very exciting news. I just would like to note that uh, Southwest Airlines announced that uh, nonstop Southwest service to Vegas. As you know, uh, Southwest, we've been looking for them to come to Palm Springs for, for many years. Uh, they announced service to Palm Springs, uh, and now with this announcement today to Vegas, is very exciting. It's going to start on Sunday, May 9th. It's going to operate Thursdays through Mondays. Um, now, this is exciting because it's also we have Phoenix, Denver, and Oakland, um, and this certainly adds to our airport collection of where we can get from Palm Springs. So this is very exciting news, and we appreciate uh, not only Southwest, but also all the other carriers who have expanded in our airport. And on this slide, we see United is expanding and Delta and Alaska. They're increasing flights and expanding to their seasonal destinations. Uh, and it's certainly what we've been wanting to see. And I will just uh, note one more time that, that I will say that in, in 2000, when I became city manager, we used to have to pay American Airlines $200,000 a year just to have one flight to Dallas in the summer. So this is where we've come. This is a major, amazing thing, and this is very exciting uh, for our destination. So thank you. Thank you for all your work on that. I know you've been working for 10 years or longer um, on these initiatives, as well as Scott White with the CVB and so many others. So really exciting um, updates for our airport. The next, we have the COVID-19 case update from Emergency Management Coordinator, Danny DeSelms. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council. It's good to see everybody back on the dice. Uh, so just a quick update today. So I sent this out on Tuesday. Uh, the case count per 100,000 on Tuesday was 4.8. That's actually increased to five as of today. Uh, it's not a big increase. And what that signifies is just we have a, a, a natural uh, leveling off uh, uh, of cases. We're not going to see a drastic case reductions like we were going from 100 uh, down to where we are today. So there's going to be some natural fluctuation but we are still right in that sweet spot of what will become the orange tier uh, shortly. So just a picture of the cases that we have uh, in the county. So far this week, there's been 558 cases in Riverside County. Uh, total last week was 856, so we're looking pretty good. And looking at Palm Springs, we had nine this week uh, compared to 27 last week. So. Very good. Uh, those are the active cases that we know of for residents, uh, is 175 in Palm Springs. Uh, that number might look a little different when we look at the wastewater treatment. If you've seen downtown, uh, it is bustling. So the wastewater treatment numbers might reflect differently than the hospital case numbers. So it's good that we're just going to bounce them back and forth. Uh, for testing and vaccination, uh, Testing numbers are starting to decrease. We just want to remind everybody that testing is one of the metrics that they use to uh, adjust the tiers. So testing is still important, uh, places all over to get tested. Uh, and then for vaccinations, uh, there's two changes coming up. One April 1st, age 50 and older. Uh, no health conditions required, just anybody 50 and older will be able to get the vaccination starting April 1st. And that is going to go down to 16 and older starting on the 15th. Uh, the state is expecting about 5 million more doses uh, next month. So that's all I have unless there's any questions. 
Thank you. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Thank you so much for all your work on this. We appreciate it. Keeping us updated for a full year about these COVID numbers. Next, we have the COVID-19 wastewater treatment update from Assistant City Manager Marcus Fuller. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is our biweekly report on our testing. So the information I'm showing you tonight is test results from last week, Monday and Tuesday. I wanted to show this overall graph, which we've been continuing to update and post on our website, which shows the testing we've done going all the way back to August 17th. <clears throat> and what I wanted to show is that back when we were in the red tier in last September, October, we had COVID data with a, a viral load per liter uh, less than 50,000. As you know, we spiked during the holidays to 2.6 million. And good news is, is we're still hovering at the same about volume as we were back last September, October. Uh, what's interesting, this is a, a, blow, a blow up of, of recent um, tests. So the 2.6 million over the holidays. So the test data that we have from last Monday, Tuesday does show a continuing trend of higher volume of COVID present in our wastewater on Mondays versus Tuesdays which would make sense because of the tourism we have over the weekends in Palm Springs. Um, and so as I'm showing you here, Monday versus Tuesday, the viral load and the estimated number of cases go up and down. And then unfortunately, last Monday, we did see it go up again to about 749 cases and then drop back down. Uh, and that, that, that estimated number of cases is comparing to 57 active cases reported by Riverside County. I, I think tonight, though, more importantly, what I wanted to show, show the public is, as you know, we've been testing, the lab's been testing for the presence of two mutations that they can find that are present in the UK variant. And some of those mutations are also present in other variants um, that are hypertransmissible. And when we started testing for these, we had no detection until we had a detection on March 8th then we didn't have a detection. And then both Monday and Tuesday of last week, we had detections. And so the important point here is that the lab says that with these continuing presences of the mutation, it's a strong indicator that the UK variant or possibly another related yet identified variant is circulating in the city. Uh, what I didn't show you is that the, the percentage of the mutation was also higher on Monday versus Tuesday. Again, I think it's just reflecting what we know is the tourism that's here over the weekend. So again, we just need to be vigilant. Even though people are getting more people are getting vaccinated, we need to continue to use face masks, social distance, and other measures to ho hopefully uh, prevent any kind of spike in cases that might occur. So we'll continue to do this and report biweekly. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Marcus. Are there any questions from Council? Seeing none, thank you, Marcus, for your foresight using our wastewater treatment water like this. It's really incredible leadership, and I think it's helpful information for the entire region, especially how tourism is impacting our numbers. So really excellent work. Thank you. Our next presentation is from me. So um, in the update for especially now that the state is opening up the age categories and allowing um, everyone over the age of 16 um, pretty soon here in two weeks to be eligible for vaccines, um, I'm excited to announce our new Vaccine Buddies program. And so this has been a collaboration of a lot of different nonprofit organizations as well as the city. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Lisa Middleton has also been working with with us on this um, to find trusted volunteers and trusted buddies in our community to assist people in making a vaccination appointment. So we know that there are equity issues and barriers um, to many people, especially the most at risk in our community, making an appointment if you don't have access to um, the internet or if you're not able to fill out the forms or you just need assistance for a variety of reasons. Um, you need language access. So we have a team of trusted volunteers here to help with um, the Mizell Senior Center. If we can go back to the first slide, I want to list out all the organizations. So um, Mizell Senior Center, Desert AIDS Project, J Jewish Family Services, the Jocelyn Center, um, and the LGBTQ Center are all partnering to offer staff and volunteers to help you make appointments online for vaccines. So I'm really excited for this 
for this um, program. It will launch on Monday, March 29th, and volunteers will be standing by. For the next slide, we also have services in Spanish, and we're working on um, providing access to anyone who needs it. Um, so please give us a call. Um, you can see here the numbers for in Spanish. Um, I'm sorry, my Spanish is not good enough to read that flyer right now, um, but we will provide language access for anyone who needs it. So you should see a Valley Voice coming up about this program, and please contact us here um, or these nonprofit organizations to get assistance in making vaccines. And we'll continue our effort to get everyone who wants one a vaccine here in the city of Palm Springs. Next, final, oh, there's a traffic alert. I don't think so. So finally, uh, we have our fun presentation. So as many of you know, today is our city manager, Dr. David Reddy's last city council meeting. David is retiring after 20 years of extraordinary service to the residents of Palm Springs, and his last day is Thursday, April 1st. David has tirelessly given his life to our city these past 20 years, and his accomplishments with the past and present city council members have truly resulted in a historic Palm Springs renaissance. He has been directly involved in the transformation of our city from a sleepy village to a global destination. And much of this wonderful success culminated today with Southwest announcing a new direct flight from Palm Springs International to Las Vegas. For over a decade, David, city leaders, and tourism officials have worked relentlessly to forge a relationship with Southwest, and in particular, to get a flight to Las Vegas. Now it's finally reality. And that's just one example of all that David has accomplished um, over the past two decades. Um, it's in great part thanks to your extraordinary ability to forge partnerships, think outside the box, and get things done. We're so fortunate, fortunate um, you decided to leave Flint, Michigan 20 years ago to come to Palm Springs. With that said, we have a couple of videos we would like to show as a special tribute to Dr. Reddy. The first one is a compilation of current and former council members and a few stakeholders sharing memories of David. We had so many people participate, and we actually have overall, I think, a 20, 25-minute video for you, which we will not show you today. Um, so if you're someone who did a video for David, um, that is going to be sent to David, and he'll have access to everyone's comments. But in the interest of time tonight, um, we, we shortened it just to a few. Um, so... Apologies for those who aren't getting their moment here on um, TV. So we'll go ahead and roll the video to honor Dr. Reddy. David, thank you for your 20 years of service to the residents in the city of Palm Springs. You are an incredibly hard worker. You go above and beyond to serve every single resident of this city. You have changed this city. So you've brought it into the 21st century. You've expanded our downtown. You've grown our economy. And you've truly built a Palm Springs that we can all be proud of. And we wish you all the best in retirement. David. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you for all that you have done over these past 20 years for the city of Palm Springs. 20 years ago, we were a very different city than we are today. The kind of renaissance that has occurred in our city, many could take for granted, but you know better, we know better. The renaissance of our city took a tremendous amount of effort, initiative, and intelligence, all of those things that you embody so very, very well. We are grateful for your service to the city. We are grateful to your service to the public in general. I simply want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you have done. Congratulations on your retirement, David. In 20 years, you've truly transformed Palm Springs. You've an amazing mentor and role model on what good government is, always putting the residents and businesses first. It's been amazing to work with you, to be your friend, and I wish you only happiness and joy as you continue to learn and engage in the world. David, we would not be here without you. Palm Springs is a much better city because of your leadership. Uh, thank you so much for all that you've done, and I look forward to hearing about all of your adventures post city manager. Hey, David, professor. Doctor, Mr. 
Thank you for all you've done for the city of Palm Springs for the last 20 some years. Your contribution to this city has been fantastic. You've steered the ship to a place of prosperity that it is today. We've been able to even weather the COVID crisis due to your leadership in the past to prepare for such emergencies. I personally cannot thank you enough for all you've done for me to be able to live in this type of a city with a lifestyle that is beyond belief. And I think many other residents feel the same. A lot of that, David, is attributed directly to you. And because of that, I'm grateful as I'm sure many others are. So thank you, David. Hi, David. I want to congratulate you on over 20 years of, of successful work here at the City of Palm Springs. I, I'm privileged to say that I've worked with you uh, almost all that time. Uh, you, you've been a mentor of mine and um, congratulate you and, and wish you the best in the la next chapter of your life's journey. David Reddy, you and I worked together for four short years, but we had a little slogan. Remember this? You can season it, you can saute it, you can marinate it, you can tenderize it, but I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna have that for dinner. You and I made it tough on people who wanted to come to Palm Springs because we wanted to maintain the highest level of quality this city deserved. You have made me and this city proud from the day you took your office. You are one of Palm Springs' greatest success stories. Thank you for your years of service and best wishes in your next endeavor. I love you, David. David, you have contributed to our city in so many ways. And the fact that you've lasted longer than any city manager in this valley says a whole lot. I just want to say thank you, and I wish you the best in your future and all of your endeavors. God bless. Hi everyone, I'm doing this video in front of the award-winning Palm Springs Animal Shelter because I believe it epitomizes the leadership of David Reddy. When the residents of Palm Springs expressed that our city needed a new state-of-the-art shelter, David found the way to make it happen, as I believe he has with every issue he has tackled. He worked hand-in-hand -hand with the friends of the Palm Springs Animal Shelter to help raise the money and to see this beautiful shelter come to fruition. So on behalf of the board, the staff, the volunteers, and the thousands of cats, dogs, bunnies, pigs, and other assorted cr critters that have found their forever homes, and especially from me, we love you and thank you, David. You will be missed. David, amazing that you've been here for 21 years, almost 21 years is just incredible. The average length of a city manager is more like around seven years, and so you've been... Uh, here for three city managers worth and speaks a lot for uh, uh, your love for this city. Best of luck, David, from uh, myself and Don. Enjoy your retirement. David, Palm Springs has emerged as a remarkable and magical city. And that is in no small part because of you. As a community member, I owe you a great debt of gratitude. But more importantly, I want to thank you for being my friend, because that will go on forever. David, I wish I was saying this to you in person. You are a terrific city manager. You are a terrific leader for the city of Palm Springs. For myself, I thoroughly enjoyed working with you on the revitalizing of downtown Palm Springs and you are so instrumental in the renaissance of the city of Palm Springs. You guided us through the Great Recession, and for two decades you've served our community. I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know you've got great things to do in your future, but we couldn't be luckier to have a man like you at the helm for 20 years. Thank you so much. David, uh, this is Harold Matzner, chairman of the Palm Springs International Film Festival. Thank you for your more than two decades of um, outstanding uh, service as city manager of our city. Uh, your personal support of our festival and film awards, uh, which is now the city's signature event, uh, has been greatly appreciated over these past 20 years. It has been a fantastic journey working together with you and the city to grow this event into the global success it is today. Thank you for being our friend and champion and I know you will continue to be an important part. Of Thank you for being our friend 
and champion, and I know you will continue to be an important part of our community. You may even wind up being chairman of the film festival. Take care, David. David, congratulations. And on behalf of the entire tourism industry, thank you. Your leadership, your professionalism, and your support has enabled us to grow our economy. And more importantly, here at the airport, look what it's done for our destination as we continue to add more routes and more airlines. Southwest, I think, is the pinnacle of our success of working together and creating something truly remarkable and unique. We're going to miss you, but congratulations, and hopefully we can work together again in the future. David, my friend, it has been a pleasure working with you these past two decades. On behalf of the hospitality community and the tourism partners, I want to thank you for the incredible accomplishments that we've done in the past two decades. From the $40 million expansion of the convention center to the formation of the PS resorts, the hotel incentive program passing of measure J, C, and D, that's been an incredible run. And we are going to miss you, and I'm gonna miss you the most. The one thought that summarizes our retiring city manager is this. David saw what many had seen, but he envisioned and accomplished what if you have. His absence will be felt. The team at Grid Development wishes you all the best, David. David, on behalf of the governing board and administrative team at Desert Regional Medical Center, we want to thank you for the years of service that you had on our governing board and for the collaboration you've provided to our hospital throughout the community to ensure a healthy and safety community for all. Our partnership has been greatly appreciated and we wish you well in your retirement. Cheers. Hello, congratulations. David, ready for your retirement after 20 years of exceptional service to the city of Palm Springs. I present you this congressional record, which is a testament to your great work. Uh, the congressional record is part of the United States history. Uh, it will record our deliberations, our recognitions, and it will now be recorded in our United States history. So I just want to say thank you for your steadfast dedication to the residents of Palm Springs, to the businesses, for your dedication in development, in making sure that Palm Springs is a great and continues to be a great tourist attraction uh, throughout our country and around the globe. Uh, thank you for your hard work. I appreciate working with you for so many years. And, uh, and on behalf of my family and the residents here, I, I want to say thank you for your years of dedication and your service. Hi, David. It's Hank Plant. You know, I've interviewed governors since Pat Brown and presidents since Richard Nixon. And I have to say that uh, as far as public officials go, you are among the best. I've always found you to be extremely competent and really easy to work with. And I wish you all the best in retirement. So, David Reddy, city manager, is retiring. You would think congratulations would be in order, but you'd be wrong because I've got some questions. First of all, for background, David Reddy and I start our jobs at about the same time. A little over 20 years ago, I sat in this chair and he sat in his chair at City Hall. And I was older than David at that time and I'm older than David now. Yet he's getting ready to retire and I'm looking at 10 more years sitting in this chair. Oh sure, I had kids late and well, it's you know news, how hard can it be? I can sit here for 10 more years and be fine, but still, it seems a little unfair. Or at least somebody was much better with their money than I was. From all of us at NBC Palm Springs, David, thank you for everything you've done for us over the past 20 years. Thank you for everything you've done for the city and the Coachella Valley as a whole. And we wish you all the best and we're not a little bit bitter and jealous. Well, most of them aren't, I am. But everybody else is very happy about it. All the best, David. Dr. Reddy, congratulations on your retirement. 20 years in Palm Springs is quite an accomplishment with the many changes and developments over the years, including the new downtown, short-term vacation rentals. Speaking of those, had anyone ever even heard of Airbnb or VRBO 20 years ago? Thank you for answering as many questions as fully as possible whenever we called you for comment. From everyone here at News Channel 3, congratulations and best of luck to you in everything you do in the future.
Thank you. And because we know David loves these moments so much, <laughs> we have another short video um, highlighting David through the past 20 years with our residents and staff and the many, many special community events Palm Springs has to offer. So we'll roll the video. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. So we have one more special speaker, which is retired council member Jenny Fote, and then we'll present you with a proclamation. Um, and I know we have all the department heads here in the audience uh, to honor you as well. So council member Fote. brought tears to my eyes. Um, 17 years of your 20 years uh, we've spent together. And I remember when I first got elected to the council, this was a totally different city. And I was this radical feminist lesbian that got elected. <laughs> and you were, you were taken aback. And, and I don't think actually knew how to deal with it. And spent, I spent my first five years on the council, I think, with you assigning Chris Mills to be on every subcommittee with me <laughs> to keep me intact. But uh, over the years, I've seen so many changes that really could not have happened under any other city council, any other city manager than you, David. So I just wanted, I just wanted to take a moment because of the specialness that we've shared 
uh, marching in San Diego in the Gay Pride Parade, uh, sponsoring the 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 um, the team that went to Paris, um, doing all the things that the, from the Multiple Species Act to to all the changes that have happened in Palm Springs, you've been responsible for them, and council members come and go but you've been the steady hand that's led this city. And, and on behalf of all of my fellow council members that are not able to be here tonight, thank you. And thank you on behalf of the city and the members of, of uh, our city, our residents. And I have one other thing, and I just want to unabashedly going to do, unabashedly, uh, from a group that, that I belong to, and this says, anyone can be cool, but awesome takes practice. And this is David. Thank you for all the support that you have given us over the years to preserve the beauty of the lands of our incredible city. We send all of our best wishes to you as you begin your life's new adventures. This is from Friends of the Palm Springs Mountains, and it's from myself, Kathy, and Nikki. So thank you, David, for all you've done for that, too. Thank you. Thank you. So finally, <laughs> it's not over. Just a few more things. So we'll read the proclamation um, that we issued for you, and then we will have a standing ovation for you, and then we'll take a photo together, and then we'll ask if you'd like to make any comments. So the proclamation for the city of Palm Springs, California. Whereas city manager David H. Reddy has tirelessly led the city of Palm Springs with honor, integrity, and the greatest professionalism for the past 20 plus years, coming to City Hall in June of 2000 from Flint, Michigan, where he previously served as city administrator. And whereas David's extraordinary talent for public administration, finance, community relations, and overall thinking out of the box, problem solving skills are unparalleled. He is well known for his passion for good government and providing exceptional public value. And whereas David is legendary for responding to every resident inquiry and for always being available to the media to comment on any issue seven days a week. In fact, we think he may have given the majority of local reporters and Palm Springs residents his cell phone number. And whereas David is known to be the longest serving and most respected city manager in the Coachella Valley and the only city manager in the state of California, as we know, who holds both a Juris Doctorate and a PhD. In fact, his expertise as city manager is so revered throughout California that David was recently awarded the prestigious City Manager's Award of Distinction from the League of California Cities. And whereas David, in partnership with Friends of the Palm Springs Animal Shelter, shelter helped find funding and ensure construction of a much needed new state-of-the-art shelter for our four-legged friends, the only no-kill shelter of its kind in the Coachella Valley, a project which in David's mind represented the highest level of public value. And whereas David was instrumental in developing the city's innovative hotel incentive program, which has resulted in several multi-million dollar reinvestments in the city's hotel stock, transforming the Palm Springs destination and resulting in a historic renaissance. And whereas David, working with the city's tourism and hospitality partners, implemented a $45 million expansion of the Palm Springs Convention Center, along with several multi-million dollar capital improvement projects at the Palm Springs International Airport that have led to a significant increase in tourism, wildly popular new airlines like Southwest, and the kind of economic development and prosperity that most cities can only dream of. Whereas David helped lead the public education to pass Measure J, a one cent sales tax increase that has transformed Palm Springs and led to the completion of numerous citywide projects, including extensive street repaving, the renovation of the Wellwood Murray Memorial Library, a newly renovated and expanded fire station, and of course, funding for the downtown revitalization project and the new downtown park. 
And whereas David spent an arduous 14 years working to ensure through creative public-private partnership the successful redevelopment of the former Desert Fashion Plaza into now what is a vital hotel, shopping, and arts district that residents and visitors from all over the world enjoy and appreciate, which was no easy task. And whereas David and the city council's decisive leadership with the COVID-19 pandemic has centered around keeping residents safe while providing businesses, housing, and rental assistance programs, um, along with the latest information about city orders, testing, and vaccinations to help residents, business, and workers impacted by the pandemic. We thank you, David, for leading the ship during this extraordinary difficult time in our nation's history. And whereas in his time as our city manager, Palm Springs has transformed from a sleepy village to a global destination that prides itself on being one of the most welcoming and inclusive cities in the nation. And whereas when David first arrived at City Hall in 2000, the city's total budget was $88 million. Now, 20 years later, it has grown to $258 million illustrating the tremendous economic and civic growth Palm Springs has experienced under David's visionary leadership. And whereas, it's not gonna, this is the last one, David. Whereas <laughs> David's outstanding leadership these past 20 years has ensured Palm Springs remains the inclusive, iconic, uniquely original, world-class city it is today, like no place else. On behalf of the residents of Palm Springs, the city council and staff, we wish you many happy, carefree days in retirement. You've earned them. When it comes to world-class city managers, David Reddy, you are truly like no one else. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, by the power vested in us with deep appreciation and gratitude for his remarkable 20 plus years of service to Palm Springs, do hereby declare today, March 25th, 2021, as David H. Ready Day. Thank you. If everyone could join me in a standing ovation for our city manager. a photo together. So David, now's your time if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, sure, but I'll be brief. Uh, Amy, thanks for getting Michelle in those pictures and for, for that. Um, thank you. A anyway, thank you. This is uh, um, quite a surprise. Um, it's most appreciated. But j just in a, in a couple moments, I, I would like... The, the, the councils are such an integral part of this that I've got to thank thank you for all that you do because this is not easy. Uh, you know, we we get paid a pretty good salary and you don't. And the decisions that you have to make, this is all noble work that you're doing. And and thank you for all of your leaderships. And it's not lost on any of staff how difficult your job is. And thank you for your support. And I've got to thank the, all the previous councils. And, and Jenny, uh, those comments were just uh, amazing. It's 
you know, it's hard to explain, but you, you've got to do this as a team as we know. So the councils and, and, and the mayors, all that put together is what makes this go in partnerships, aligning it with all our stakeholders and those partnerships. And we see time and time again how it has improved our city. But none of this all happens without our staff. And as you see, many of them here, uh, and the staff you don't see every day, the over 500 employees that we have working hard to, to, to do what our city needs. And none of this really happens without them. And so it's been my pleasure and honor uh, to work with them because it has been uh, re really an honor to do that. And, and I would note that the excitement part of being city manager in Palm Springs, and you can appreciate, there's the highs and the lows. From the highs to, imagine the, the animal shelter, you know, the whole neighbor, one PS organization, the development, the downtown, the housings, the affordable housings, the new projects. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's nothing that makes people more happy than, as you know, when they get their street repaved. <laughs> the excitement of that. But more it's about, you know, how do you build public value? And, and what do you have to bring into existence uh, to make community life better? And that's been the exciting part of it. But there's also been the, the, the low parts, as we know, in government. And the lowest part was, you know, because nothing trains you for when you wake up one day and you face that two of, of your police officers have been, have been killed. And, and that was the hardest day. And I remember, Ginny, we were at the hospital. And, you know, knowing the family's coming and there's nothing you can do. And I remember, Ginny, I had to call the council. You know, Ginny screamed. <laughs> um, and we went to the hospital. The chief was there and you know, all those things that happen. And it's all part of the reality of what this government service is and, and, and what that means. And, and so if I could just, could we just for a moment be in silence for Leslie Zrebny and, and Gil Vega. Thank you. Um, their sacrifice will never be forgotten. And just finally, I would like to say that we all, we all have an opportunity to change our city. And that's the exciting part, that we're all here. It's why you're there, our staff and the, and the council members. And certainly, it's been my privilege uh, to be your city manager. And uh, I, I know Justin's coming in. Uh, uh, as I was able to build on the previous people that did this every day, he's going to build and take us to the next level with your help and with the help of our great staff. So thank you. And, and again, I, I could go on for 20 minutes thanking everyone, but, but Cindy and Sherry and Amy and uh, Yubisela and everyone that we work with every day, uh, you're so important to this operation. And I have to, one final thing, we really couldn't have done this without Marcus. <laughs> Marcus has, has been there and he can write a staff report like no one else. <laughs> so, so uh, Marcus, thank you for, for all your efforts. Um, and and uh, obviously, Jeff and Anthony. But again, from the bottom of my heart to all of you, thank you. And council members, I, I couldn't have imagined a better tribute this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you. Um, would any council members like to make any comments before we begin the business meeting? I think Dr. Reddy said it all. Thank you for your service. We can't begin um, to thank you for all of your work. And you don't know that I'm going to request this, and I didn't ask you, and I, I'm not sure if you would have agreed with it if I had. Um, but I'd like to ask the City Council to consider at our next meeting naming the Palm Springs Dog Park after Dr. David H. Reddy. Thank you all for being here and thank you for your work to make this city the amazing place it is. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. So now we will move to the business portion of the agenda. Before we do that, we're gonna take a five minute break, um, recess to move into our offices for COVID safety and do the rest of the meeting from Zoom. Thank you.
agenda is acceptance of the agenda. The City Council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items, or request consent calendar items be removed for separate discussion. I'd like to entertain a motion for acceptance of the agenda. And are there any items that staff or council members would like removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and or vote? So first I'll go to city staff. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, I do wanna note that there was a revision to item 1K uh, in which a new sample letter of support from the Office of Assembly Member Friedman was distributed to the city council and staff recommends authorization to issue the proposed letter to the authors of AB 43 uh, traffic safety. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any items any council member would like to pull? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and then council member Garner. Uh, I would like to pull 1K for a very quick comment. I would like to pull 1O. Council member Cortes, did you have an item? No. Uh, are we allowed to just give quick comment without pulling something? Yes. I believe so, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, for 1H, for the caravan for Palm Springs High School, I just want to say thank you to all of the high school students who wrote in to us. I think that's really important, and we really appreciate that you, that you took the time to tell us your thoughts. Thank you, Councilmember Garner. Councilmember Wood, do you have any items you'd like to pull? Nothing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So I'd like to entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar with items 1K and 1O pulled for separate discussion. So moved. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Kors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Holstech. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you, and that included a revision to item 1K. Next, we have a report of closed session from the city attorney. Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the city council, members of the public, the city council met in closed session to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda, and there was no reportable action. Thank you. The next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us which agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. Tonight, the city clerk will be contacting speakers by telephone. City clerk, if you could please begin. Maribel Nunez, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hello, um, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, Palm Springs. Thank you for letting me speak. This is Maribel Nunez uh, with Inland Equity Partnership and here uh, in support of um, item 1-0, uh, denouncing uh, violent crimes against our Asian API um, brothers and sisters. Um, support this and uh, working closely and organizing it and with Bayani Han and Apala, and I wanted to give them a thank you for putting this together and working with you all on this. And I feel that within our API community, they're part of our community. They make our city better. Um, uh, they're a fabric of our community. And I really wanted to thank um, all the activism and organizing that I've been also learning a lot with them and making uh, this a better place. And like I said, a lot of these groups um, engage their community members, get them civically engaged. And I think that to me, I just want to make sure that we protect our community members, particularly the API community against these violent crimes. And I think we have a responsibility to make sure that they're protected, that their rights, and that we're not only talking about negative things, but we always uplift all the different culture and history because um, they are part of our, our community. They make Palm Springs. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll disconnect. Madam Mayor and City Council, uh, that concludes public comment.
Thank you. The next item is city council and city manager comments and reports. Do any council members have reports at this time? Council member Garner. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to raise up something that happened uh, on Tuesday, which I'm just really excited about. So uh, on Tuesday at the Agilon Baptist Church, we had a vaccine clinic, and it was this really amazing turnout with over 400, and 400 people vaccinated, and all of them, or most of them, coming from um, low-income communities or communities of color, and it was just this really incredible effort. And it all started because one of our Palm Springs residents, Juan Espinosa, began advocating for domestic workers to be uh, get the COVID vaccine uh, earlier than than uh, they were currently on the list. And you know, I know that I made some some comments to the county about this. I know I heard the mayor make comments asking about it as well. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of things that we could do. Well. I recently became a board member with Desert Regional Medical Center, and so I raised it at a board meeting. And at first it was like, well, maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can't. But we kept talking about it and then found that through a number of factors, we could hold this clinic uh, directly in the community because uh, there was you know, racial, dem racial demographics um, and income demographics and, and some healthy living uh, index demographics that could make it possible. Um, and so then I was connected with Linda Evans from Desert Care Network, who's also the mayor of La Quinta, and we started collaborating. And then we found out that um, Conrado uh, Barzaga, who's the CEO of Desert Healthcare District, was also talking to the residents of Desert Highlands Gateway Estates about doing this as well. So we all kind of came together and were able to create this COVID vaccine event directly in the community. And it was just incredibly moving. Um, I, I made phone calls to residents uh, in, our, in our district, especially to our Spanish-speaking community, while a lot of the Desert Highlands Gateway Estates neighborhood, uh, along with Pastor Carter and, and Wes Rankins, reached out to the Black community, and we were able to vaccinate so many people. And my phone was just flooded with text messages with people saying that they were finally able to get this vaccine after waiting for so long. And so many of them are people who have been working tirelessly throughout this entire pandemic. Um, so I just want to just tell everybody it from, you know, I'm so grateful for all of the people that made this event happen uh, and to the community members uh, who we just, we appreciate you so much. And, and thank you as well to, to Brothers of the Desert who were also there volunteering and uh, members of the neighborhood who were there. Um, it was it was a true, truly beautiful day on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Garner, for your incredible leadership with all of the other leaders who joined you on that. What an important moment for the community, and that's true life or death work that we're saving lives there. So thank you. Other updates from Council Members? Seeing none, um, is there any report from police staff? Uh, no, Mayor, just other than uh, th thank you again for, for everyone's kind words. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item is the consent calendar. I would like to entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar with the following items removed for separate discussion. That's item 1K and 1O. So moved. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Course. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Council Member Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. And if I could just note, um, I didn't want to pull it for separate discussion, but one item one G is an authorization to accept grant funding for the amount of $869,000 from the governor's office of business and economic development or go biz um, for the California cannabis equity 
program. And so thank you to city staff for really leading the way in California on this issue and for finding nearly a million dollars for this program, I think is just really incredible work. Um, and so we, we thank you. The next item uh, pulled for separate discussion is item 1K, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and I will try to make this very short. Uh, since we met last, uh, Assemblymember Friedman, who's now the chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee, has added some amendments to uh, uh, AB 43, which more fully embrace all of the recommendations around uh, the setting of speed limits that were recommended by the Zero Traffic Fatalities Task Force. Uh, this bill now is one of the most important traffic safety uh, measures that uh, the legislature has uh, uh, seen in decades. Uh, and I am thrilled uh, that we are uh, poised to uh, endorse it. Cities around the state are doing so. There is a companion bill to this one, which is AB 550 by Assemblymember David Chu. Uh, which addresses the enforcement recommendations that came from the Zero Traffic Fatalities Task Force. And I would like to ask staff to bring to City Council in the future a recommendation of support for AB uh, 550 as well. Uh, and with that, uh, again, my thanks to Assemblymember Friedman for her leadership uh, on this bill and to uh, Rachel Carpenter with the California State Department of Transportation for her leadership within uh, the agency. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion and a second to approve this item? Move to approve. I'll second. Okay. So there's a motion and second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Councilmember Garner. Aye. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Mayor Holstech. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. And I didn't read the title, but that was for a resolution of the city council uh, declaring its support for Assembly Bill 43, Traffic Safety. Thank you to Mayor Pro Tem Middleton for all her continued leadership on that issue. The next item that was pulled for a separate discussion is item 10, which is 10, which is a resolution of the city council denouncing violent crimes against Asians, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders in the AAPI community across the country. Council Member Garner. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the reason I pulled this is, is just because I think now more than ever, we really should read this out loud for everyone to, to hear. Um, and, I, and I do want to note for Council that there's a couple of um, pretty, not, not too big of revisions that some members of the AAPI community sent to me. So I am including those so you will be able to hear that. And um, I, I, think you'll, I think you'll be fine with them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, whereas the COVID-19 pandemic is a public health emergency that has caused devastating effects throughout the world and across political and social boundaries and was not created or caused by any race, nationality, or ethnicity. Whereas the World Health Organization recognizes that public health emergencies often lead to stigma, demonization, discrimination, and scapegoating towards certain communities and groups. Whereas Riverside and San Bernardino counties have declared that racism is a public health crisis. Whereas anti-Asian racism and legislation have been a long-standing part of United States history from People v. Hall and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 to the 1942 executive order that led to internment camps for Japanese people in the United States. Whereas hate crimes targeting Asian American and Pacific Islanders increased by nearly 150% in major cities, despite decreasing overall in the last year, and 44% of the incidents reported to stop AAPI hate are from California. Whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have been facing biased incidents such as verbal harassment, physical assault, job discrimination, and destruction of their businesses as they are being blamed for the outbreak and spread of COVID-19 perpetuated by rhetoric stemming from federal leadership in 2020. Whereas three deadly shootings targeting Asian 
American women in Atlanta, Georgia on March 16, 2021, whereas violent attacks have particularly intensified against senior citizens and such xenophobia and discrimination can have a range of adverse physical and mental health consequences for stigmatized groups and their communities. Whereas the mission of Palm Springs Human Rights Commission is to promote and protect the diversity of our community and to improve human relations through education and community awareness. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Council of the City of Palm Springs that the City of Palm Springs will not tolerate xenophobia, white supremacy, and sexism, and condemns all hate crimes, attacks, and attitudes against Asian American and Pacific Islander communities that the city of Palm Springs urges residents to join in calling attention to these harms and denouncing hate to keep us all safe during this pandemic and beyond, that the council and city of Palm Springs will commit to protecting residents who are targets of hate by providing tools and resources for reporting such crimes, that the city will prosecute and curb hate attacks related to COVID-19 in partnership with the nonprofit organizations, the Riverside County District Attorney's Office and the city's police department. So thank you to Mayor Holstage and members of the AAPI community who helped to bring this forward. Um, and I, I just strongly urge our, our residents to think about the words that I just read and make sure that we are all supporting the Asian American Pacific Islander community now and always. Thank you, Council Member Garner, for your leadership and for everyone who worked on this resolution. Um, and just if I could add one thing is the intent of this action is to not only denounce um, the discrimination and, and, and hatred that the community is facing, but also to convey the um, importance um, that AAPI members play in our community, that we're so grateful for your contributions, um, for the people who live here, who work here, who work at the city, um, who, you know, run businesses and who study here and go to school. We truly value you and you are an incredible asset to our community. Um, and the AAPI community has a long history here in Palm Springs and in, in building Palm Springs um, and playing such an important role here. Um, and, you know, in labor movements um, here in the Coachella Valley and your contributions um, are always valued today and every day. So thank you to everyone. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. Thank you. If I can, I heard too at the same time, I might have Councilmember Garner second. Um, she uh, worked on this um, in depth, I believe. So there's a motion and a second. Mayor Holstich. Councilmember Garner? Yes. Councilmember Kors? Yes. Councilmember Woods? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton? Aye. Motion passes 5 to 0. As Thank revised. You to everyone for your Thank you to everyone for your support for that important item. So the next item are public hearings. So the next item is item 2A, presentation on city homelessness programs and efforts, public hearing on the review of the conditional use permit issued for Well in the Desert, located at 441 South Highway in Celia, and a presentation from county staff regarding homelessness programs. So these are all homelessness related, so we put them as A1, A2, and A3. So first we're going to start with a presentation on city homelessness programs and efforts to um, go over the city programs um, first, and then we'll ask questions of staff and we can discuss that as a city council. And if I can, uh, people are being added to the Zoom meeting, but if you could um, continue to mute. Um, and actually we won't need some of speakers until after. Um, so the second item will be the public hearing um, for Well in the Desert. And then the third will be the county presentation. Um, and. I might ask if council, if we want to, we can also open the public hearing for the well in the desert and take public comment. Um, and then we can close the public hearing and we could um, allow the county to present. And then we could deliberate at the end um, on item A2, which is the well in the desert CUP, if that makes the most sense for people. I see, I see people uh, shaking their heads yet. Um, so first, I would like to ask for a staff 
presentation on city homelessness programs and efforts. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, yes, you, you, this uh, agenda item is uh, combines uh, a couple of different things. You explained it well, so I will begin with a brief presentation. This is just to uh, discuss of the things that the city is doing, uh, and then we will move to the, the public hearing on the well. And, and I would note uh, Mr. Rodriguez uh, from, from the county supervisor, Prez's staff is with us, and he will introduce the staff uh, from the county uh, when he presents his, does his presentation. So uh, we'll go forward with a city presentation. Uh, I would just note that, uh, you know, obviously cities like Palm Springs, uh, we, we get our funding, because uh, we have jurisdiction in the general fund areas such as police, fire, safety, parks, but social services is that funding for those functions is generally is it's a responsibility of the state. Uh, typically, they can perform these things through through county governments. Uh, but the, the the nature of the issue of homelessness is 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 very complex and it's a. a, a, a growing issue and so over the last several years city council has added additional funds from the general fund uh, our resources uh, to address these these issues of homelessness so what have we done? Uh, we've participated, uh, obviously, Roy's Desert Resource Center, which occurred uh, roughly around 2011-12. It was a shelter. Uh, obviously, here's some information of, of who was there and why they were there, the clients that participated, case management. Uh, the city contributed about 103,000, uh, along with other cities in the valley, and obviously, uh, it was the county program. Unfortunately, Roy's uh, was closed in 2017. Now, what have we been doing for the last few years? The city has spent approximately 4.3 million in city funds. And on the right, you see the list of things that we have done uh, with several different partners, uh, but primarily about that 4.3 million is what the city has done. Uh, and, and again, uh, these are resources directly from our general fund, everything from uh, additional contract with the county for crisis team, um, outreach, wraparound services. Uh, of course, we've uh, supported Well in the Desert uh, and several other um, programs that you see listed here. And what are the outcomes of these programs? Uh, this is just some general statistics that we were able to put together over the years. And, and cer certainly we can see that uh, it didn't have a good outcome. Uh, the numbers there certainly show that the services were important to people and we were able to provide permanent housing, temporary shelter, uh, behavioral health, uh, and those things that were occurred through our partners with the county and other social service agencies. Um, and again, these were all things that uh, Working together, we were able to achieve, particularly with the additional resources that came from the city. A couple weeks ago, or last meeting, we had a presentation from CVAG. Um, the, the 103 that the city contributes annually, it is goes towards the CVAG's effort in homelessness, which is their focus on the chronically homeless. And so as they reported that in just 40 days they assisted 20 individuals from their list of 200 chronically homeless persons. So this was another uh, component of the range of things and partners that we have to try to deal with the homelessness issues that we have in Palm Springs. In addition, another component was the rental assistance. Uh, we received a little over half a million in community development COVID block grant funds, and uh, what we're able to do is provide rental assistance. We have a contract with the Lift to Rise organization, uh, and as you can see here, uh, they were certainly able to uh, move forward, and uh, we will have some additional information on an update on how many people they have been actually able to provide um, rental assistance for. So those funds are going entirely uh, towards uh, that effort. Another component is, as you are aware, uh, the state had granted the city a $10 million specific grant for homelessness. So our goal, obviously, is to leverage those dollars to the greatest extent possible so we can do as much affordable housing, permanent supportive housing, as possible. Uh, in, in August 2020, uh, you did approve $3 million funding for the Ivy Hotel project. 
for the 75 new permanent supportive units. Uh, however, in December of 2020, uh, our count, the county, our partner at the time, in the end, uh, we were not able to purchase that, that hotel. Uh, since then, in January of 21, uh, the council did have commitments of $4 million for these two other projects, the Agave and Vista Sunrise, for uh, affordable housing projects. And we do have uh, that additional $6 million that we will be talking about uh, in, in the coming months of how we're going to move forward with um, those dollars expended. Now, even though we've done these things, uh, the homeless issues persist, and we see those, see, we all witness them. So here, here's a picture of Baristo Park. As you can see, um, it just, it's in essence a campsite. And this is Indian Ramon. As you can see, there's, there's trash uh, piled up. And here's another one, uh, the quality and the Ancelia side. Uh, again, you can see that uh, these issues of homelessness seem to be uh, exacerbated and expanding in our city. So that is uh, a summary of where we are and why we presented this this evening is because uh, we want to make sure that we start to have this comprehensive discussion about what is the city doing, uh, the, the well in the desert, the CUP, uh, how we move forward with that. And then, of course, uh, we're appreciative that the county and their staff are here to talk about the programs they have, uh, because going forward, obviously, it's going to take uh, a very close partnership uh, with the county and other partners to address these issues. So with that, Madam Mayor, I'm going to turn it over now to Planning Director uh, Flynn Fagg, who is going to proceed with the uh, public hearing for the Well in the Desert uh, Conditional Use Permit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. And, and before we do that, if you can, um, go back to a few of the slides, because I don't think we read them out loud for the public who might be listening in but might not be seeing those slides. And we just want to go over and clarify what the city has done. Sure. If there's a specific one, um, th this is the list of the additional services that the city has provided. So again, it's the, the crisis team that we actually contracted with the county to have a, a specific crisis team of social service workers dedicated specifically for Palm Springs. Uh, wraparound services for Martha's Kitchens, warming cool centers, well in the desert. Our contribution to the CVAGs, their 200, a uh, Focus 200 program, uh, CV Housing First. Uh, we've had food distribution centers both at the Convention Center and at the Highland Unity Center. Uh, those have been uh, uh, really utilized, and it's 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 uh, you know a, a sad commentary that uh, the lines were almost wrapped around the block of cars waiting uh, at the convention center uh, for food distribution that I saw. So those were very important programs, and at the uh, Jesse Center, uh, obviously we contributed to Roy's. Um, now in the police, the police department, we've added substantial numbers of staff dedicated to the homelessness issue, uh, both community service officers and police, uh, the bus transportation voucher programs, and of course we, we spend a significant amount of money uh, with property storage and camp cleanup, uh, and obviously we do that within the confines of the law, but there are times when we do have to make those cleanups as well. Was there another specific slide you wanted to see, Mayor? That works for me. Are there other council members who'd like to see um, slides directly? Sure. Um, can you go back to the last one with sort of the results of this, those efforts and go through those? Because I think it's important for people to know what, oh. so they can have a sense of what's been successful and where we need to do a different work. Uh, Mayor, Mayor, uh, council member Kors, which slide was that, please? It started with the number of people permanently housed since the programs that the city started in 2016. 2016. The outcome slide. Oh, the, the outcome, outcome slide. slide. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. The outcome slide. Yes. Here we go. Okay. So the outcome slide, obviously, these are, are numbers from the reports that we received, and uh, clearly the outcomes indicate that a lot of people have been served. A permanent support of housing, temporary housing and shelter, behavioral health, substance abuse treatments. Uh, individuals became employed, 143. Um, provided with Main Street, 
mainstream benefits, and of course, uh, overnight in cool, warm shelters. And each of these are a component, of course, to the overall homelessness issues that the various individuals are experiencing. So it's this range of outcomes uh, that, that we, we try to achieve and get those numbers as high as we can. Thank you. And those outcomes, 413 individuals provided with permanent housing, that has been from the programs that the city funds, right? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jay Verrata, our community development director, to step forward. He can address some of these more specific on the, the statistics. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Uh, that is correct. Those are uh, outcomes from the city funded programs. I should mention city funded and desert health care funded. The reported information comes directly from the crisis teams who submit the reports to the city, along with reports provided by Martha's Village. And uh, when they were in operation, uh, Path of Life also provided information. And so staff just kind of worked to consolidate all the information from the uh, city-funded activities. Thank you. And these are just our activities. Right, so we also have a number of activities and at least $6 million, if not more, for affordable housing to reduce homelessness, right? Could you explain that a little bit as well, Jay? Uh, yes, could you um, repeat the question, though? Sure, so just detailing the work that we also do on affordable housing for homeless individuals. That's not included in this presentation, but that we have also funded a number of housing projects um, for homeless individuals and units. And um, if you could give details a bit about our work on affordable housing. Uh, the city's affordable housing efforts do date back uh, quite a ways. Uh, I believe 19 projects had been developed by the city in the past, and we currently have uh, three projects with uh, two with funding obligations from the city, one with an executed disposition and development agreement. So uh, those projects are, uh, I guess, more than just an idea. There are financial commitments from the city, from the state, from the county to help move those projects forward. Thank you. And the total amount of funding that the city is committed to homelessness services, um, that does not include the at least $6 million or $7 million that we've spent on affordable housing as well, right? In just the last few years. That, that's correct. I, I should note the um, uh, there is overlap with uh, a portion of the redevelopment funds funding some of the newer projects I mentioned. And uh, that is in conjunction with some of the homeless funds because those units will have permanent supportive housing units for formerly homeless. Thank you, Jay. Are there any questions from city council members? Seeing none, we will now move to item 2A2 which is the public hearing city council review of the conditional use permit issued for well in the desert. Um, I'd like to ask for a staff report, please. Madam mayor and members of council, the item you have before you is a review of the conditional use permit for the well in the desert facility. Just by way of background, the Conditional use permit for the facility was approved in June of 2017. The facility provides a drop-in center for homeless individuals during the day uh, and is limited to specific hours in terms of its operations. As part of the approval, the City Council required periodic reviews of the facility. Those were conducted after six months after 18 months, and then this review this evening is following an additional 18 months. 
The City Council also considered an amendment that was requested by the applicant in June of 2020 to amend one of the conditions of approval to allow the construction of an outdoor shade structure in the courtyard area behind the front building. And so the conditions of approval were amended at that point in time. The purpose of our review this evening is really to look at two things. Number one is conformance to the conditions of approval of the conditional use permit. And then secondly, to review the impacts of the facility. In terms of review of the conditions of approval and conformance to those conditions, one of the things that city staff has done over the last 18 months has been more diligent in terms of having staff inspect the site. Our code compliance division has been conducting weekly inspections of the site. We've included the reports from the code compliance division for the last four months in your backup materials to give you an idea of some of the things that they have viewed. Their reports are the basis for uh, my discussion with you this evening relative to the conditions of approval. So going through some of the conditions of approval where there have been issues, uh, let me start first with uh, condition ADM6, which discusses the need to maintain the property where the facility is located. Uh, while this has been noted in past reviews as an ongoing issue, the Well in the Desert staff has added landscaping over the last several months. Uh, they've been a little bit more diligent in terms of picking up trash from the facility, uh, and our code compliance staff has witnessed them in cleaning the outdoor areas. Another issue is related to condition PLN7, which addresses on-site security. That condition specifically says that the Wells security staff is to be on site an hour and a half before they begin operations in the morning and then an hour and a half after they close the facility in the afternoon or evening. Uh, while we have observed them from time to time after the facility is closed in the evening, uh, there are times when we have been there when security has not been on site. Another condition, PLN 9, is relative to lighting. The condition states that there shall be lighting from dusk to dawn at the exterior entrances of the building and at stairwells. Uh, this has been an ongoing issue as well, but the uh, Well in the Desert staff have corrected that issue, and as has been noted in the reports from Code Compliance, I believe that was uh, completed in November of 2020, making sure that they have lighting in all the areas where it's required. Uh, another issue has been with condition PLN 14 relative to not allowing any outside storage. Uh, code compliance staff has witnessed clothing racks outside, chairs and tables occasionally stored outside. Condition PLN 19 addresses the use of outside areas. Uh, generally speaking, none of the activities at the site should be conducted out of doors. Uh, there was an exception made for the new shade structure that was added and approved in June of 2020 to address uh, COVID restrictions in terms of social distancing for the patrons of the well. So in certain areas that has been necessary for them uh, during this period to have certain activities outside. Uh, but what has been most prominent is the fact that they've had chairs in the back parking lot for a smoking area in, in order to keep those patrons separated from uh, the other areas of the facility. Another issue has been relative to condition PLN 23. That condition requires that the security personnel that, are prov that is provided by the well in the desert uh, have certification um, and also that they wear uniforms when they are on site. Uh, well in the Desert has gone through the process of having their staff members certified. We've received proof of, I believe, five staff members who have obtained their guard card, as it's called. However, the uniforms are not always worn, and so that has been an issue there as well. I also understand that Well in the Desert has used um, private security companies in addition to their own security personnel. 
One of the biggest issues has been relative to condition PLN8 and condition ADM10, which are fairly similar and discuss issues relative to loitering on the site as well as loitering on adjacent properties. Um, while the Well in the Desert staff is generally pretty good about loitering on their site, one of the issues that we have had is relative to loitering on adjacent sites. As we've discussed in past reviews, Well in the Desert is not authorized to enforce loitering off of their property. And so that has been a continuing problem uh, in terms of trying to address the situation of loitering. And you've seen the photos that Dr. Reddy presented earlier of how that impacts the neighborhood. So those are the conditions of approval where there have been issues. And again, uh, we have had our code compliance staff working diligently with Well in the Desert staff to try and address those issues. Uh, and in certain cases, they have put forth a good effort to try and correct those. The applicant has submitted a letter to us as part of this review requesting to amend certain conditions of approval, including the allowance of clothing racks in their outside courtyard area to allow the smoking area that they've been using in the back parking lot, to allow a tent on the site for outdoor events and activities, to discontinue the quarterly meetings that are held between the police department and the community, and to reconsider the time frame for the conditional use permit reviews. At this point in time, staff is not recommending amending the conditions of approval to accommodate that. However, you as the city council may consider those requests and may modify the conditions of approval as may be appropriate should you choose to do so. Next, what we'd like to do is to talk about the impacts of the facility. And what I'd like to do is turn it over to Captain Mike Kovalev of the City of Palm Springs Police Department to discuss those impacts. You do have his memo and his statistics in your backup materials in the report. Uh, but again, I'll turn that over to the captain. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, um, there's been a lot of discussion regarding this, this business and the location. Uh, background of the history, we've expanded the area that we analyze for these statistics uh, each year because of the impacts. We started out, uh, the area that we analyzed was the south side was Ramon, uh, the north side was uh, Saturnino, the Indian was on the west, and Cayel Segundo was to the east. Uh, we started seeing a bigger footprint from the uh, impact of homelessness in the area from the police perspective. The overall calls for service related to homelessness have gone up each year. And the area impacted has gone up as well. When we first started receiving the complaints, they were frequently from the businesses directly to the west of the business regarding loitering, uh, disturbances, drug use. Those issues expanded to the nearby Baristo Park and the condominiums across the street, the Brits condos. Uh, over the course of time, the complaints have continued and uh, became increasingly uh, more frequent to the areas, uh, the businesses between Ramon Road, Indian Canyon, South Palm Canyon, and uh, the Rite Aid Pharmacy. Uh, those cases have continued across Palm Canyon. We frequently get complaints uh, regarding homeless actions uh, at the Eisenhower Medical Center in the 400 block of South Palm Canyon. Uh, each night, we have issues within the downtown parking structure, within the elevators that our city staff have to address in the morning. Uh, the complaints have continued farther south to the Sun Center. Uh, myself and police management and supervision have met with many of the business owners and, and tenants of that complex. We've received complaints farther south to Kentucky Fried Chicken, the car wash, and complaints about the issues in the Talkwitz Creek. One of the issues we experience is while the Wells business hours uh, provide services during the day, 
they leave after the end when they close at 3 p.m. or 5 p.m., 6 p.m. when it's hotter. Um, and all those individuals have to go somewhere. And as a result, we're seeing more and more complaints. Uh, it's continuing and it's continuing. And quite frankly, uh, it's not sustainable for the police department to keep handling all of these calls. And it's presenting a burden a lot on us and the business community itself. So continuing with our presentation, that brings us to a conclusion of the report on the conditions of approval and the report on the impacts, uh, the secondary impacts associated with the facility. At this point in time in conducting this review of the conditional use permit, uh, the City Council may modify the conditions of approval as may be appropriate to address the issues that have been brought forward. Or as an alternative, one of the things that staff would present to you is that we would work with Well in the Desert staff to look at possible alternate locations for the facility where perhaps the impacts could be lessened or reduced. And so again, as part of conducting this review, those are the options that are available to the City Council. That concludes our staff report to you and we would be happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff before we open the public hearing in order to hear public comment and deliberate? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think my questions are largely for Captain Kovalev. Uh, yes, Mayor Captain. Pro Tem. Um, you, uh, you rather gracefully uh, described uh, some of the work that uh, the uh, uh, Stacey Schaefer and her maintenance crew have to do. Uh, and while I don't want to shock anyone uh, uh, unnecessarily, I think it's uh, appropriate and necessary for you to describe what it is that uh, they are encountering uh, on a almost daily basis. The, uh, there are two elevators within the downtown parking structure uh, on the north side of Baristo between Indian and South Palm Canyon. It's quite frequent, uh, sometimes daily, sometimes several times a week where they're cleaning up uh, human feces from the elevators, urine, um, drug paraphernalia, uh, a lot of damage there. I think they've replaced 10 fire extinguishers in the last few months at $200 a piece, a lot of vandalism in there. And this was required the police department to now go there three times a night. Our officers uh, go into those elevators, uh, make sure that nobody's in there doing this and address uh, the issues that are happening in there. I will say this, that that type of issue is just not solely um, happening at the parking structure. We get reports from downtown businesses, um, and other areas of this, this analyzed region of the same type of behavior happening. Uh, I believe it's Officer Sandoval that you have spoken of uh, and the kind of uh, work uh, that went into just dealing with uh, one individual uh, who was uh, homeless that actually resulted in some success. But could you talk about how much time uh, was spent by our officer and what uh, some highlights of what that entailed. We, we approach each situation um, really of a service oriented. You know, we all know that you're not going to arrest yourself out of homelessness. You're not going to enforce yourself out of it. So we're constantly trying to provide services to those that are unhoused. Um, Officer Stephanie Sandoval, one of the officers dedicated to uh, homelessness, literally spent eight months getting a couple into housing. Um, and there's, there's hurdles logistically with the providers, but the main hurdle comes down to when you're, when you're uh, dealing with homeless individuals, pinning them down, getting them to complete the required tasks to getting them into housing, um, 
and following up, locating them and, and continuing to push forward, uh, that presents a challenge. And, and you know, our officers, the, the last thing we wanna do is arrest homeless folks. That's not, that's not what, what we're here to do. But we still have to address the problems. And, and um, you know, we're, we're there to do that, but it's quite, um, quite a, a tremendous task. And unfortunately, right now with the nature and the straight up volume of complaints, the staff of the police department dedicated to homelessness really cannot focus on offering the services. They're more about addressing the immediate problems because there's so many of them that we can't keep up with them. Uh, could you describe uh, the difference in the uh, types of encounters and the number of encounters that you've had over uh, the past year uh, since COVID started in the last few months? Yes, um, the biggest challenge we face with certain aspects of this community is the drug use and the behavior uh, associated with drug use, whether it's theft, uh, littering, loitering, um, disturbances, fights. You know, in the past, you know, prior to 2014, possession of heroin, cocaine, crack, methamphetamine, all of these hard drugs uh, was a felony. When we, we arrested folks, we took them to jail, and they stayed in jail for some time, and they were sent to some sort of drug diversion. Um, when we passed that, we uh, Proposition 47, we, we changed those to misdemeanors. So now, with the frequent use of these drugs, we can write a ticket for it. Uh, Palm Springs PD, unlike nearly any other law enforcement agency in the Valley, we continue to transport these misdemeanor drug possession violations to our local jails, where they are subsequently released within a couple hours. Now that there's a pandemic, the only people that are staying in jail are very violent offenders. All nonviolent offenses, whether it's uh, car theft, drug possession, grand theft, whatever it is, if it's a property crime, they are going to be released fairly immediately. Their court cases are uh, delayed for months, if not years. And it's just a qu quick revolving door. And with these individuals that cause the bulk of our problems, it's empowered them. It's really rendered our immediate response to address these problem individuals um, Voided. It's empowered them. Quite frankly, some of them laugh when we tell them we're going to arrest them for heroin possession because they know that they're going to be out within a couple hours. Um, and it could be 10 arrests for heroin possession. It could be 15. It could be 20. There's no magic number that we reach to where they're going to stay in jail for a time or be forced into any kind of treatment. So it just complicates the overall matter of homelessness particularly with those that are addicted to drugs or whatever they're addicted to. Uh, Captain, thank you and thank all of your officers uh, for uh, their incredible work. Uh, I, I'd like to ask one quick question of uh, uh, Director Fagg. This will be very uh, brief. Uh, plan. Uh, I want to uh, ask again, you, there were modifications that were uh, requested of the CUP and it is staff's recommendation that there be no modifications at this time. Is that correct? That is correct. We are not recommending approval of the modifications at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for their indulgence. Council Member Garner. Thank you. I, I also have a question for Captain Kovalov. Um, I know that you have uh, discussed these issues with other agencies who are experiencing different things on homelessness in those communities. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and kind of your your thoughts about uh, how this can the situation can be improved. Yes, Councilmember Garner. Um, there's obviously several different agencies out here experiencing the same thing. Uh, but the bulk of the uh, homelessness issues rely on Palm Springs and the city of Indio. Um, 
but we're not alone. I, um, you know, I, there's massive camps along the freeway um, in Ranch Mirage. I've spoken to staff from the Palm Desert Sheriff Station, and they're dealing with issues at Washington and Country Club, uh, along El Paseo, uh, along many areas. So, and they're seeing in the increase also, quite frankly. But one of the things that we've learned from the city of Indio, when I asked them about how is the relationship with Coachella Valley Rescue Mission and Martha's Village, how does that work for the city? Does it work out for you? Does it work out for the businesses? The, the overwhelming response from uh, their assistant chief to their line level officers was, it's a great relationship. It works. It helps us. It's an asset. Um, when they ask why, I say, well, we, we have a service provider that provides results during the day, um, but you know they shut their business down and there's no long-term results throughout the rest of the day. And they say, yeah, that, those types of situations. And I, and, I, and I learned, you know, speaking to Santa Monica PD, um, Long Beach Police Department, if you do not have an overnight type of facility that's providing all of these services and acting as a hub to get them into housing, mental health, whatever the service they need, it's not going to work. And that is what we're seeing right now is this compounding of the matter of the issues and it's sustaining it quite frankly and that's the way I, I, um, my colleagues see these types of things and that's the way uh, if you study how your response to homelessness should be you need to have some sort of 24-hour operation to address this because it's not an eight-hour job to fix homelessness it's a 24-hour a day seven day a week 365 task to solve these issues. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Are there other questions for the captain? Let's do it that way so he doesn't have to go back and forth. Council Member Kors. Thank you, Mayor. One question, no? Yes, one question for the captain, if I can. Thank you. Uh, I know it's obviously we're going to talk um, hear from the county later, um, but as we're talking about well in the desert, I know they, you know, historically, if you're, I've met with them, are really trying to be careful about not providing services for people who may be engaged in criminal conduct. And so just sort of what you're seeing is there, because there seems to be a concentration right now in that area, but also hotels are being used in Project Room Key and just sort of what your sense of how that's working with Well in the Desert now? Well, there is an absolute surge in homelessness in that area. Um, whether it's the Project Room Key location nearby, Well in the Desert, it's just the overall uh, issues with homelessness. Um, we're seeing it a lot more. Um, the Well does kick out clients that are problems. Uh, they called us 118 times on their own over the last year out of the 500 or so calls we went there. And typically it was due to some sort of disturbance with an individual that they were kicking out. I don't know what their exact policies, is, uh, policies are in terms of banning individuals. Uh, that's not our purview. Uh, that's something they could address. But I know that they do take that liberty to address um, individuals that are not working or playing well with others there. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, those individuals remain in the area, which uh, results in complaints to us that we have to address. So um, that's just one of the constant battles with uh, this type of situation right now. And then it's complicated. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Wood. Thank you. This is also a question uh, for the captain, Kobo. So the cities have the, a tool called a conditional use permit that allows a business or an entity to go into a place, and then you can condition it so that it has minimal impacts on its neighbor. From the information that you've given us, the well in the desert has a very large impact on its neighbor at this point. 
Are there conditions we can add, or do you think this is the right location for well in the desert? You know, over the course of the time that they've been there, we've added conditions. We added security. But um, like the planning director stated, you know, their security team is not responsible for Baristo Park, for the vacant areas, for the businesses, for the after hours uh, locations. So I cannot see a way to condition this to mitigate the complaints. The location in and of itself, when it's directly across from a condominium complex, um, with restaurants directly behind it, with a public park that has playground equipment, with a lot of uh, high density housing where children want to use that playground, and then all of the businesses downtown that thrive on tourism and that uh, aspect, this location is, it's, it's, it presents a lot of challenges. Um, and those challenges uh, have expanded. They've been there from the onset, but they've obviously expanded with the issues of homelessness. And, I, and I, I'd be, you know, I have to say that I cannot say that the well in the desert is the source of all of these homelessness issues. That's, that's, that would be completely unfair. But I can't say this. I'm coming up on 23 years here with the city of Palm Springs. I take passion and I really have a lot of insight into various aspects of this city. We have never had the volume of issues that we are having uh, in that area in my career here. And uh, the amount of staff time to address these issues is uh, cheating the other parts of the city right now. Thank you. Are there questions for the captain? I have a few, if you can answer them or other city staff. So you detailed the number of calls for service related to homelessness, homeless individuals from June, 2019 um, until the end of 2020. So it looks like the calls for service doubled in a year. Is that right? So it says that there were 575 calls for service between June 2019 and November 2019. It looks like that was consistent um, around 500. And then the numbers went to 900 uh, calls for service, 924 calls for service between June 2020 and November 2020. Can you um, confirm if that's correct and give us a little insight into why that would be the case? Yeah, yes, Mayor, the, that is correct. And quite frankly, the majority of it has to do with proactive patrols in the area that are generated from complaints of activity in the area. Uh, we've had to direct resources, patrol checks, property checks, and resources there that are all related to homelessness. And um, that has grown each year because of the complaints about the activity have grown. Uh, if we just ignored it, um, we'd be remiss in, in failing those that are complaining about this activity. Thank you. And you detailed the work and the burden on the police department um, to police this area. Do you know, and I don't know if you know this number off the top of your head or if it would go to city manager, um, but a sense of the cost, the additional cost um, to police this area or to provide service. You know, that would take a lot of an analysis to, you know, how much time we're, we're on the calls, um, the call volume, how many officers are involved in each, um, each call. Um, not off the top of my head fairly, but I would, it would be, um, a lot. <laughs> I don't think that would be the, it would be a lot of money to, uh, a lot of our resources and time. Um, and, the, and the time just can't, you can't, uh, you know, pin it on the police officers. You have to, the, the calls to our dispatch center, the calls to the medical aides in the area um, for our fire department and uh, AMR to respond. Um, you know, a police officer's benefit package 
with salary is a couple hundred thousand dollars a year with all the benefits and everything. And right now we, we have three officers dedicated to homelessness. And it's not, they're not all focused on this area, but uh, you know, it, it's a lot of resources and time. And what's really uh, troubling to my patrol staff is in the past we've been able to handle homeless activity with the three officers and a couple community service officers throughout the daytime, seven days a week. These days, our patrol staff, 24 hours a day, are having to address these issues, whether it's the downtown parking structure or the various businesses in the area and frequently have to patrol them. So that cost uh, would be quite a bit. Thank you. And then I have another question. I'm not sure if it's for the captain or city staff. So Well in the Desert provided numbers about the number of patrons served and the services that they're providing, the number of coffee, snacks, water, showers, and clothing, and rides to provide it. So the numbers from the Well in the Desert say that they're serving 3,700 3,748 people, uh, total patrons in January 2020. So I assume, are those unduplicated numbers, meaning um, they're serving 3,700 people a month, or are they duplicated numbers, meaning they're serving the same X number of people per day in total that calculates to 3,700 in a month? <laughs> Madam Mayor, I believe in terms of the numbers that are provided, uh, those may include duplicates of individuals who come back for services. So it's not uh, 3,700 unique individuals. Thank you. Has the applicant provided unduplicated numbers for their clients? I, I don't believe that they have. We might ask that question of the applicant. Thank you. And I've, I've asked that a few times in getting these numbers. Um, and I, it's, I think that's really important. You know, we're talking about how many people are homeless in Palm Springs. How is that increasing? We have our point in time count. Um, and then we have, you know, and then the specific issue of how many the well in the desert is serving. And I think it's really in, important for the council to know in the community how many total patrons um, unduplicated. So I'm trying to look at the showers number, um, you know, trying to calculate what would that be the unduplicated number, but it's really difficult. So maybe that can go to the applicant um, if they're speaking during the public hearing. And those are all the questions I have of staff um, before we open the public hearing. Are there any other final questions? Seeing none, at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. The applicant will have up to five minutes to present their case. If requested, the applicant will have two additional minutes at the end for rebuttal. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. City Clerk, if you could please contact the applicant. Arlene Rosenthal, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have five minutes to provide wow, your comments. Wow, and I'm not even asleep. I thought you were going to be much later. Congratulations. Okay, I would love to address the council right now. So, Mayor and City Council members, I'm real pleased that you asked me to speak for five minutes about what has become one of the most difficult problems the whole United States is facing and in this case, Palm Springs. Homelessness. On this subject, after 20 years being on the ground, working with the people that we're talking about tonight, I could spend hours and even days talking about it. Homelessness, homelessness is not new, and it will always be a part of our history, unfortunately, unless it be given a priority over profit and insensitivity. Tonight, you, the council, will determine if the well will continue all of the services it offers <clears throat> at our current location. I will explain why we must continue there and make some suggestions regarding the future because we are not married 
to that site. And we don't like that people are unhappy. So we want to make it sure everyone is considered in this. Right now, city council is facing a lot of negativity and are blamed for everything wrong in the city. The attacks serve no purpose because we get nowhere with hate. I'm shocked when I hear the comments from many in the community. Kind of borders on hysteria, and I find it frightening. The well in the desert works with some really wonderful people, clients who want to improve their lives, who have lost everything through no faults of their own. We also see people who are addicted in an economy where drugs are readily available for huge profits. Our people do not deserve to be punished or gotten rid of, as some have suggested. They deserve to be helped, yet those services are not yet there for them. I have heard some in the community want the well and its clients just to be thrown out of Palm Springs altogether. And I ask, where is their humanity, their compassion for people suffering? Why not help? Ask what you can do for others not as fortunate. Together, we could make something really happen. So I would like to ask you all to base your decision on the real facts that you have. Many of the things I have read are really not believable, and I'm not talking about the needles, things like that. I'm talking about other things I've heard. So I'd like your decision based on the hard facts that you have before you. We've been a positive resource for thousands of people every year. Uh, we rejoice in seeing our people find their way out of poverty and homelessness. We see people finding jobs, soulmates, housing, and we see the rays of hope amongst our population of clients, and we help them. We're not a hindrance to the city. We want to continue this progress, and so do our partners amongst two who are in your briefings, uh, DAP, Desert Regional, Martha's, nurses and doctors from CSUSB Nursing, and many, many others. We have been working. We haven't been sitting still. Besides working with our people, we're working on getting secure places for homeless people to sleep, which will immediately cut down on the problems. We have the right teams in place, cross-sections of good people with solid ideas, and we're working on that, both Martha's and the well, along with the city. We are also launching, we had our, our final meeting today, we're launching a cleanup program of the streets. Even those people creating the problems are not our clients. And we do know that many homeless people have been sent to Palm Springs from other places and that the Sheriff's Department also dropped them off in Palm Springs. But people talk about it as it's the well. It's not. Uh, you know, those, there are those that think that we attract, that if you didn't have the cooling center, if we weren't there, people would go away, and that's not true. So let's look at our people as they are, all kinds of human beings as we are, and let's not let hysteria guide us. We weathered a year of COVID, and we can actually say our people are well. We followed all the rules. So we're asking an extension. Promise that during that time, we will, working with you and other city officials, find an alternate site so we can stay there for years to come where we can find more peace than what we're experiencing. In, in closing, I would like to extend a huge thank you to David Reddy for all that he has done all these years, helping us along the way, and thank him for all the good stuff he taught me along the way. On behalf of those disenfranchised, homeless, poor, that are struggling, the board of the well in the desert, personally, thank you. And Ms. Rosen um, do I get asked questions now? Uh, Ms. Rosenthal, so we'll I just... always forget the routine. I'm sorry. So Ms. Rosenthal, we'll disconnect now. We'll take the other public comment, and then you'll return for a rebuttal, and then the council will ask you questions. Okay. okay. My phone will be on. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flynn. Bye -bye. Uh, Ms. Pitts, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. My name is Joni Pitts. 
I am a senior woman who has lived in my condo for many years, since well in the desert, moved into our community almost four years ago. The decline in the quality of life in my neighborhood has diminished. I no longer feel safe in my in my own home. Sorry, I used to walk around the block into the nearby Rite Aid. I no longer do this. My neighborhood is no longer safe to do this. My neighborhood is now a dangerous place to live. My neighborhood has experienced many crimes, burglaries are now a common occurrence. This has affected my quality of life. Our community has been experienced many laundry rooms, restrooms, car break-ins, etc. constantly. Even taking out the trash now is an inconvenience because of the drug use and public sex going on in our trash enclosures. Our community has had to place locks on our enclosures to help prevent these incidents. I am asking the council to move this business to another location where it will not negatively affect residents and businesses. I, I don't think you would want your mom to experience what I can and our community has been enforced to endure for nearly four years. It's time to move the business. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Pitts. Stephen Jaffe, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and yes. you have two minutes to provide your comments. And you can begin. You're, you're breaking up. I'm sorry, uh, you have two minutes with the Palm Springs Council and you, you can begin your comments. Right now? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Stephen Jaffe. Uh, I know a few of you. Uh, I am not a resident of Palm Springs, but um, it is my opinion that the issue you're discussing tonight affects uh, the entire Coachella Valley, certainly the western Coachella Valley. Um, I'm calling... Um, because uh, while I'm speaking in my individual capacity, I'm the president of Democrats of the Desert, which is a large democratic club. And I believe that my feelings reflect the feelings of most of our members. Uh, I want to urge the city council to not make an emotional or impulsive decision on moving the well. I heard the... Uh, the fellow who preceded me a few speakers ago, uh, uh, who's, I guess, representing the board of the well, um, I was surprised to hear him say that he is open to moving, which I think is uh, an incredible uh, uh, re remark of civility and willingness to compromise. But uh, I'm worried about taking precipitous action uh, that would uh, adversely affect the very people that the institution is supposed to serve. So I urge you to not make precipitous action and uh, perhaps study the situation uh, for a reasonable period of time and get a report on what your uh, genuine options are. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, and we'll disconnect. James Gavin, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. My name is James Gavin. First of all, this should not be a review of the conditional use permit. It should be a hearing for the revocation of the conditional use permit. The reason being is that the well death has been in violation of the conditional use permit since opening July 1st, 2017. The business continues to violate this city document to this day with the full knowledge of the council and the department heads. Your CUP document states non-compliance with any of the conditions will result in revocation. This includes any citizen complaints which you have any and any uh, which Mr. you have. Mr. Gavin? The ADM, ADM8 and Mr. ADM8, your Mr. document. Mr. Gavin.
Hello, Mr. Gavin. So yes. I, I restarted your time uh, because we were having a difficult time hearing you. So you can uh, go ahead and uh, we did hear your first about 30 seconds, but then you started breaking. Can up. I start over with two minutes? Yes, go ahead. Okay. First of all, this should not be a review of the conditional use permit. It should be a hearing for the revocation of the conditional use permit. The reason being is that the well in the desert has been in violation of this city document since opening July 1st, 2017. The business continues to violate this city document to this day with the full knowledge of the council and the department heads. Your CUP documents state non-compliance with any of the conditions will result in revocation. This includes any valid citizen complaints, which the city has received many, and any from business which it has received. See ADM 11, ADM 8, and ADM 3 of that document. And because of the council and department has lack of accountability to this irresponsible and reckless business owner, crime and chaos are out of control. According to the notice of public hearing, any challenge of the proposed project in court may be limited to those issues raised at this public meeting. I'm doing this now with this conditional use permit. Our community is ready to challenge your decision you make tonight. So when you get this challenge in court and present and past council members and department heads are deposed under oath, the truth is going to come out. This irresponsible and reckless business continues to violate this CUP. In in uh, violations as of today are PLN 7, PLN 8, PLN 9, PLN 14, 21, PLN 1, and ADM 10. And how do I know this? I live here. I witness this daily. I'm willing to take Planning Director Flynn Flag with me over there and prove this to him. Your decision to allow this reckless and irresponsible business owner in our community has made our neighborhood a dangerous place to live. It is no longer a safe for seniors, families, and businesses. The quality of life has been diminished. It goes to the thing that the council just doesn't care. It's time to move this business to a section of the city where it's zoned for. This is a great example why you have zoning laws in effect to prevent situations like this from happening. If you stand up to Ms. Rosenthal, her response is to attack with reckless statements. And I'm ready for him tonight. I call homeless animals, and I'm anti-Semitic. That's you, her Mr. response. Gavin, I hope you all sleep good tonight. Our community hasn't for three years, eight months, and 25 days. Thank you. Thank you. William Gavin, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. I'm William Gavin. We in this neighborhood are well aware that Well in the Desert will most likely be greenlighted by this city council. It has happened time and time again. We do know this because many in our community, this neighborhood that face this, this irresponsible and reckless business operator, that the city council just doesn't care about the community. We are aware that anyone who speaks negative criticism about this business owner is called out by Ms. Rosenthal as they hate homeless people, or now she uses the word they're anti-Semitic. A very disgusting and hateful response from a business owner. The issues we have brought to the council has never been about the homeless issues facing the community of Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley. Homelessness is an important issue that we all, all have uh, uh, feelings for. Communities need excellent organizations to assist in this arena. Martha's Kitchen, Coachella Rescue Mission are two excellent organizations that this city should uh, uh, strive to bring into the city. We left out well in the desert because it has failed the community, the neighbors, the businesses, and the homeless. The issues we have brought forth to the council time and time again has nothing to do about homelessness, but it is about the destruction of our neighborhood and the businesses at the hands of this business owner since it opened its doors. Increased crime, increased theft, increased vandalism, drug trafficking, drug use, abuse, the use of private property to urinate and defecate, public sex, public nudity, 
creating an unsafe environment for seniors and families that they're afraid to go out into the community, to go out into their own areas to use a pool or to use the laundry mats. Destruction of a peaceful environment. Mayor Moon Mr. at a Gavin, past council meeting stated, quote, Arlene has been forced out of numerous locations. I do not have the heart to do it again, end quote. We all know why Mr. this Gavin, your business time owner over. was forced out of other locations, don't we? She destroys neighborhoods and she destroys neighbors. Tonight is the night that council needs to stand up to this business operator and Mr. decide Gavin, as to whether or not to move this business. Well, for the neighbors of this reckless irresponsible business owner it's time to move the business i know that arlene Gavin, rosenthal has over. the unconditional I'm going to to support have of now. many faith communities out there and to the faith communities that support her unconditionally Gavin, and give her respectful the of support and the integrity of what she's doing open your communities your facilities and welcome this this business to operate out of one of your facilities stand Mr. up Gavin, and do no you your, your time is over and we were support. disconnecting now thank you brian Bowles, you're live with the palm springs city council and you have two minutes to provide your comments brian Bowles. Hi, good evening. My name is Brian Balls. I live in Baristo neighborhood, specifically a village tradition. With that being said, the presence of homeless people in and of itself is not a threat. However, we have experienced threatening behavior, disturbance of the peace, and trespassing on our property. The inability of Desert in the Well to operate um, efficiently uh, contributes to this dilemma. Um, Desert in the Well should, should provide appropriate humane services and not minimal services, like referrals to drug rehab, housing, uh, transportation, and a homeless services network. Otherwise, we are drawing them here to set up camp and without anything to offer. Tourism and businesses are being intimidated and threatened by this lack of effectiveness. I know and expect homeless routinely to be outside the walls. We are living in a gated, walled community to be harassed. And just a few days ago, we found homeless in our pool, as well as intimidating walkers by on the sidewalk as they pass by our development. Specifically, Baristo's Park is perimetered by residents with children. And there has been evidence of drug dealing, unstable and threatening behavior, and lack of lighting, which unfortunately is missing at night. And for what I understand, has never ever been utilized. The trash and sanitary conditions are of course to be expected. In conclusion, if you want to provide services and actually provide the right kind of services and don't just want to push them to another town or location, obviously it's a failure and it's not a world-class solution that I've heard we think we possess earlier in the broadcast. So what do you Mr. expect Holes, we do when this center closes at night? The police are not social service advocates, nor do they perform the service of a social service advocate. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Patrick Weiss.
Okay, Patrick Weiss, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hello, this is Patrick Weiss. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Um, dear Palm Springs uh, City Council members, the only way we can get many people off the streets is a homeless shelter in the West Valley that is permanent. We have heard tonight of the success of Martha's Village and Coachella Valley Rescue Mission in the East Valley by the officer who spoke tonight. NIMBYism is always going to be a problem. The 10 million or portion of should be going for a permanent homeless shelter. Unfortunately, it looks like half has already been spent. Since it is state money, using eminent domain to acquire the property can be done. Also, the use of homeless dumping into Palm Springs needs to stop. We should only take care of those who become homeless within the boundaries of Palm Springs. I'm glad to read AB 816 is now moving through the state legislature, allowing local governments to be sued who do not do anything for their homeless, like La Quinta, Palm Desert, etc. The state needs to legislate homelessness directly. Otherwise, the issues may continue, where Palm Springs suffers while other city, cities ignore their local homelessness issue. So uh, the only permanent solution to people being on the street is to have a, a, a homeless shelter, which is 24 hours. But I don't see any resources or plans going towards that. Also, I was part of the, uh, I was being invited to the Palm Springs Homeless Task Force, and it seems like you have not had a meeting for at least three months, which was on Zoom, and I don't know why those meetings were cut off. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll disconnect. Joseph Romani, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hi, this is Joseph Romani. I want to speak regarding my... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I want to state that uh, this concept of building a desert is driving all of You know what, Mr. Romani? Okay, Mr. Romani, uh, you can go ahead and start over. Yes, sir. Yes, this is Joseph Romani. I am the owner of 450 to 490 South Palm Canyon Boulevard. Uh, the concept of well in the desert is driving all of the businesses of my plaza out of business. And none of my tenants nor their clientele and customer are parking their park in my parking lot because of the problem that they are dealing with on day to day with the homeless and all the problem which is caused by the transient from the wealth in the desert. The issue is we have a supportive document from one of my tenants, Woody Palmhaus, and you can look at the record of their sales from 2017, which was a million one hundred fifty thousand. In 2018, it went down to two million thirty three thousand. And 2019, they went to 784,890. And this is not the only business which has been suffering substantially. My other tenant, Johnny Costa, is just about closing their business because of the operation of well in the desert. They are telling me the customer are not coming to back because of the issue of the homelessness in our neighborhood. The council member want to consider what is the goal? Is it the goal of the council member to make this like a skid row, like a third street promenade in the city of Santa Monica where the just about two thirds of the business have shut down and they have gone out of business because the homelessness and everything else, drug use, all kinds of illegal activities and our site 
and in the surrounding side where people are not traveling. If you look at the fact of Mr. Romani, our block versus the whole entire Palm Spring, downtown Palm Spring, you can see people are not coming to our site because of the issue with the homeless and they refuse to come to our site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mark Rosnosti, you're live with the Palm yes. Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hello? Yes, you have two yeah. minutes to provide hey, your hey, comments. Hey, hey. Hello, Mark? Hello. Yes, you can begin your comments now. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank the mayor and the city council for giving us time to speak tonight. Um, we own a business in, in the heart of downtown Palm Springs, uh, right in the heart where Captain Koploff was talking about. Um, we're right down next to Rite Aid, the other parking structure. Uh, we border the South Palm Canyon and Indian Canyon. And, um, you know, our, our biggest issue is theft. Um, we're losing approximately sixty to $84,000 a year just in shoplifting. Um, we've had our managers assaulted. Um, we have our planters destroyed. Our trees are ripped out. They uh, sleep in the in the parking lot at night. Um, they use our property and our sidewalks as restrooms. Um, we've had people come in that are, are strung out and even urinate in the store itself. We have um, customers that no longer want to shop with us, especially in the evening. Um, because of the amount of homeless that are hanging out um, around town, especially uh, next to BevMo and around the parking structure and at the bus stops. Uh, we have people at the hotels that have walked over to the store in the evening and have been afraid to walk back and have taken Ubers back to their hotel because they don't feel safe. Um, we just, you know, Palm Springs is a destination town. And when we have tourists that come down and they're afraid to walk downtown, and walk back their hotel rooms it's 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 hard to hear and when they ask why we don't do anything about it our hands are tied is there a need for a homeless um um place that a place for the homeless to go absolutely but in the evenings once well in the desert closes it we in downtown turn into the kind of the wild wild west we need a place where they can go and it's a 24-hour place where they're not turned out in the evening to be on their free will and cause chaos in, in, in businesses. Um, I know I'm not alone. Our business next door, um, their hands are tied. Um, we just we just ask for help. We need help um, with the homeless and um, just them staying in, in downtown and, and kind of destroying our business and driving our customers away. We know there's a need, um, but we don't believe this is the answer. Uh, but I think the great city of Palm Springs and the awesome businesses that we have um, can come up with a, a better alternative to get them into a 24-hour shelter um, where they're not turned out in the evenings and made to go sleep on the sidewalks and the streets and fend for themselves so much. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Natalie, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Hello, I work for Joseph Romani, who you heard from tonight and at previous meetings. He manages the retail center located at 490 South Palm Canyon Drive, which is about half a mile from the Well in the Desert Cooling Center. I support the services that the Well in the Desert offers, but I also have serious concerns about the limitations of those services and the effect that the location of the well has had on the surrounding area. Uh, from what I can tell from the resources listed on the city's website, the closest shelter is about 13 miles away. And the next closest cooling center is about 18 miles away, which combined with very specific language in the CUP that prohibits overnight occupancy and loitering at the cooling center means that once they've had a snack, a drink, a shower, they really have nowhere to go. The security posted for 
I believe it's an hour and a half before and after business hours, ensures that no one remains on the premises, which all but guarantees that the chronically homeless and unsheltered individuals that visit the center will then migrate to both the Palm Canyon Shopping Center and other surrounding businesses and residences. And these properties cannot function for their existing purpose while they're also in use as a shelter and, as been mentioned a few times, a toilet. Uh, suggestions were submitted during the last meeting that seemed to have been ignored. Even something as simple as implementing porta potties for overnight use. How degrading for someone to have no option but to go to the bathroom outside in full view of the public. It's unfair to the already vulnerable homeless community and unfair to the property owners who bear the cost of the cleaning and above that, repairing vandalism that takes place, such as the multiple break-ins that have occurred in vacant units um, by people who are desperate for shelter. The public has a fundamental right to have meaningful input into what occurs in the city, but the proposed suggestions, which largely center around relocating the well in the desert to an area with more extensive resources where they will have more of an impact, has been completely disregarded. And I, at this point, I think we're all wondering if anything will ever be done to address our concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Denise Gowaldis, yes. you're live with the Palm Springs Hello. City Council. Hello, Council. Um, thank you for listening to me. I've lived here all my life, and this is the first time I've ever had to speak at a council meeting, so forgive me. if. Um, anyway, I'm very distraught um, witnessing um, the slow destruction of my hometown. What um, they, I'm going to turn off my TV, sorry, distracting. When the city was first considering the conditional use permit for the well in the desert, there were many businesses and residences, residents that spoke out against it for the very reasons Captain Kovalov spelled out. So I don't need to repeat any of that. I'm just asking that. Um, maybe we can find a better location away from downtown. It's not working. Businesses are suffering. Residents don't feel safe. Um, we're a resort town, and it breaks my heart to see it disintegrating before my eyes. And poor little Joni Pitts. It breaks my heart. And um, anyway... I thank you, and I hope that you can take our feelings into consideration. We're, we're sick at heart. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll disconnect. Hello, Jenny Gill. You're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hello. Good evening, thank you for calling me. My name is Jenny Gill, I'm Executive Director of Desert X, and I wanted to comment tonight to, first of all, thank the mayor and the city council members for their support, as well as the Palm Springs Police Department in dealing with some of the security issues that we've been having close to our art installation that is on 333 South Palm Canyon Drive in Palm Springs. We've had, since we opened 12 days ago, four reports from visitors who have uh, contacted me to let me know that they've had um, aggressive and violent encounters with a different people around the site on 333 South Palm Canyon. Um, both the police department and the city council have been very fast in responding and giving us advice on how to deal with the situation. But I did want to make everyone aware of the, what it seems to be like an increasingly violent um, encounters in downtown Palm Springs in broad daylight with visitors, both from Palm Springs and outside of town that are coming into um, our cultural event and to see some of our art installations. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll disconnect. Franco Lucas Ormani, you're live with the Palm yes. Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide yes, your comments. Good evening. Good evening, honorable C council members. My name is Franco Sormani, and I'm part of a property management uh, in Palm Springs. I am 
truly concerned with the homeless crisis taking place as a result of oil in the desert and the humongous damage they are causing to our community. Our tenants and myself have to deal with homeless constantly breaking into our units. So we had no option but to board up the property. Then court enforcement required us to obtain permits. We complied and had to pay for those permits in a time where money is tight. Our tenants who daily do their best to overcome the consequences of COVID also have to deal with homeless constantly causing trouble. They defecate, they urinate, leave their belongings. I myself have witnessed two homeless performing sexual activities in our parking lot. They do drugs and then leave needles all around. They become aggressive when we ask them to please leave the premises. And most of the time they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs. We don't receive the enough support from the city, yet we are required to comply with every single rule established. We are aware that well in the desert receives sufficient funds to handle this issue, but seems incapable to manage the homeless crisis they have created in Palm Springs. Instead of being a support for the community, they are causing for Palm Springs to become another skid road. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll disconnect. Madam Mayor and Council, I want to let you know that that does conclude public comment rather, other than uh, Ms. Rosenthal's uh, rebuttal. Um, and we were able to reach everyone who uh, registered to speak tonight. Um, and I'll reach Ms. Rosenthal now. Ms. Rosenthal, you're live with yes. the Council and you have two minutes. Okay. Wow, that was fast. Ms. Rosenthal? Yes? You have two minutes uh, to provide your rebuttal. What? You have two minutes to provide your rebuttal. My rebuttal to what, dear? Well, uh, there were a lot of uh, comments tonight about your facility, and you have two minutes if you want to add anything uh, related to what people have said. Well, I... I truthfully was not listening. Um, negativity of the sort that I'm sure you were just listening to uh, doesn't belong in my world if I can avoid it. So I would add that because I'm, I'm sure I can guess who some of the people called in were. I thank the people that did call in to say good things because I know there was some. We didn't want to take your whole night, so we told our people uh, they didn't have to call. But we've got a lot of good references, you know that. Um, I don't know what the calls, the people that complained about uh, whatever was going on at the well. Um, but I, I'm sure that some of the things that people are concerned about um, might have some aspect of reality. I would, I, if, if the man from across the street uh, made any comments, uh, I, I don't listen to bigots, and he's been one of our biggest detractors, hates us, hates me, and I don't even know the reason. But I would say that the things that are happening can be worked out, really can be worked out. We have a good security team. They all have their security cards, have taken the tests. We have stringent rules over there, and we suspend people. So some of those people that are, like, at that little barista park, and I know some will do, you know, they have needles. They, we don't allow them. We don't allow those things. And the police are wonderful with our clients and wonderful with us. So whatever it is, needs we can't do it alone we'll do it with others and again i did mention that we've got programs going on and i think down the line we're actually going to resolve the issues of housing temporary getting people with their heads on beds and pillows while the right people will work on permanent housing it can't be everything can't be solved but a lot of it can be. And we've got wonderful clients that want to be part, they, they're part of the citizenry. And we need to trust them. 
and, and people that might have said hateful things and horrible things, I just wish that they could see differently in people. That's all. Okay, thank you. And uh, please stay on the line. Uh, we'll see if okay. the council has comment or questions or comments for you. Okay. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment, and um, Ms. Rosenthal is still on the line. Thank you. City Clerk, would we close the public hearing, or do we hear from the applicant first? Uh, you would close the public hearing, and then you can ask questions if you'd like. Thank you. Um, at this time, there being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Since we have Ms. Rosenthal on the phone, does the council have any questions for the applicant? Council Member Ports. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And um, so, Arlene, I just want to ask you, we've, you know, um, definitely seeing an increase in issues in sort of that part of Palm Springs. Um, and have you seen a difference? I know there have been issues obviously with hotels being used in the area, with buses being free and people coming from other cities. I don't know if they're utilizing the well, um, but can you share what your experience has been? I, I know the property clearly um, has been cleaned up and the landscaping uh, has been improved, which is greatly appreciated. But just looking at the numbers, that, that region seems to be um, a growing issue. And so just sort of what you attribute it to, and what you're seeing with the clientele and the non-clients. Okay. So Ms. Rosenthal, I know you have a hard time hearing the council. Um, I'll try to repeat the question. Uh, the question you. is, have you noticed an increase, like what's your perception or your thoughts about why there might be an increase in issues and disturbances in the area? Um, and if you could respond. Yes, I think there is an increase in the area, not necessarily with us. You know, we overall, in the, in the year of COVID, we've probably seen about a 15% increase. But these are our clients, uh, the, the people, because we've sent people out. And the increase, I think, results of other cities sending us clients and the sheriff letting loose all the people in prison that he sent in. Uh, I, I don't recognize them, I we haven't had those people, the ones that are have come out of the jail or been sent from other cities. So we don't see an increase. We'll see new people. I don't know if they're amongst those, but they sure don't come because you know if they come, they're people that need help. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Other questions for the applicant, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Arlene, I'm looking at the uh, numbers for uh, the patrons that you serve, and I believe these are your numbers, which have a monthly average of about 3,000 uh, uh, patrons that you serve each month, so uh, which is about 100 uh, uh, people a day. Is that mostly the same uh, uh, hundred people, or is it a big mix of individuals that changes uh, on a daily basis? Uh, I see a lot of our people, uh, but our people don't always. The same people don't come every day. Uh, I could, I you know, it, it takes time. Uh, we could have numbers. We do that. What we do at our hot meals is we, we put the name of the person down and then we put the number of meals so we have a distinction. And like, you know, we offer, we usually do between 100 and 125 meals. The people that come in during the day, actually they do, they're more than about 100. It comes up to about 135. And uh, we don't, uh, we don't know that if there's the duplication we see some people, today I would say I saw five people, 10 people that I didn't recognize. So, you know, uh, I don't think we're seeing the same people every day, but I can't quantify that. 
you know, for you. All right. The numbers that you have tell us uh, how many uh, coffees you serve, snacks, water, showers, clothing, rides, all really good information. Uh, I know when you first opened, uh, some of the individuals were getting showers for the first time in months, if not years. Um, do you have data on how many individuals from the well have uh, moved on to permanent supporting housing? I, I couldn't quite sure. understand. So, I'm sorry. so the question is, do you have any data on the number of people who have moved on into permanent housing? We have. We don't have data. The other organizations that we work with would have that data. I know Martha's has placed a lot of people. I can tell you that uh, yesterday, in fact, five of our people were transported down to the rescue mission, and they're going to be going into one of their programs. And so, you know, that was five off the streets there. Uh, not everybody finds permanent housing. Some leave. We've had people get jobs, uh, uh, someone in Alaska. Many of our people don't stay here. They move on. When they have their feet on the ground, you know, and not everybody is homeless. People have apartments and people share homes. So not all of our clients are homeless. But I've seen a lot of people move forward. It's very heartening to, to find out that this happens. But we can't track everybody. They don't. It's almost impossible. It really is. You'd have to probably talk to the service providers that work with us. And now we're starting to work with uh, Tom Cox. So that's just another uh, one of the providers that works with us. And they would have they would have those numbers. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My last question: Do you have numbers on how many people uh, that you've served at the well? Who have gotten a job. So the question is, do you have numbers on the number of people you've served that no, have received employment? No, no. It, you know what it is? It's what we see, who we don't see, people giving us reports when we don't see somebody that we've known for a while. We'll say, you know, hey, what happened to so-and-so? Some cases we get she or he died. We'll get so-and-so got a job and moved out of town. But no, we, we are not able to track that because people don't always tell us. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Councilmember Garner. Hi, Arlene. Um, you know, Councilmember or Mayor Potem Middleton asked a bunch of questions about demographics. And I am interested in that. I know that you've expressed just now that it, it is really difficult to, to get that information. Uh, but I'd like to hear if, if you have some willingness or if you think that there's some, a way for us to get some more demographic information, just in the same way that you count um, how much food is being provided and how many showers are taken. So I'll repeat the question. Uh, Councilmember Garner would like to know if you have a willingness to start collecting demographic data um, similar to what Councilmember Middleton was asking about, similar to how you collect data on how many meals are served. Well, you know, um, uh, Linda Barack is wonderful to work with, as is her team. And she has data of the people that they've served, that they've gotten into housing and or jobs. I, it's very easy for the service provider to do that. It's a lot, I have willingness to do anything that will help our clients, you know, but it's pretty hard for us. It really is difficult for us when the service providers I don't know that. I used to ask the rescue mission all the time. Well, how many of our people that are you seeing? How many have you helped move on? And they could never give me data. But Linda does give data. 
And I think that the easiest thing would be to have our providers be more accurate and report to us. And I can talk to each one of them. I'm not saying that that's going to produce what you're looking for, but we can try to find a way working with our providers to get those numbers. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, my, thank you, Arlene. I appreciate that. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Shoot. Um, I, sorry, Arlene. If there is there, what is the one thing, or or, or what do you think that that you need, or the well needs, in order to be able to um, better support unhoused people? So the question was, what do you need in order to be able to support um, and and house more people? Well, we're not housing right now. We give are me, hoping give me one second. to. Let me, let me make sure I got the question correct. Give me one second. Sorry, I, I, I used a, just a different term. I'm, I just want to know what, what the well needs in order to be a better supporter of the homeless population. Um, is it a larger space? Is it, you know, what is it that could be, could better serve the community? Okay. So the question is, what do you need to be, be able to better serve the homeless community? Is it a better, bigger facility or, or something else? Well, I think that if there were a facility that were bigger, that had all the amenities that we don't have and that we have, uh, I think it would go a far way because... When you're under the gun all the time and you have people calling the police, they're so good. They're so good with the homeless people and they're good with the well. But when they have to be called out on, on little things all the time and sometimes by the same people, you know, they're coming to our property. I had, we called. When we can't handle the situation, we'll call the police, but we're careful and make sure that where they're really needed. So we try to handle all our own security. So if we had a place where people would stop harassing us and, and hating us, and I know that nimbyism exists everywhere you go, but some people are gonna have to get over it and, and do yimbyism. I said this before, yes, in my back bar. Listen, I live out on five acres in Sky Valley. If I've asked myself this question all the time so that I can try to understand other people, if they develop the next five acres next to me into being a homeless city, what would I do? I'd go next door and, and rattle the, gate, the fence and I'd say, what can I do to help? This has got to be, this has got to be. We have to have people that care. And if you look at every movement, that we've had, it takes caring people who will risk their names and their reputations, as I've seen the council doing, to get things righted that are wrong. And homelessness is wrong. So, you know, Ms. yes. Ms. Rosenthal, I do want to yeah. clarify that she's asking you if what kind of resources you need to be able to better serve the community. Support from council, a place where we could go that's not in Boonesville, and maybe the financing, some financing, but, you know, we're doing okay. So, you know, we can handle it. We get lots of volunteers that are wonderful people. And, you know, once in a while, maybe have a council person come over and volunteer. I know that we have, that, that our clients are so trusting and, and those that came when there were clients there, they saw that Dennis was there and Christy was there and, 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 and Grace. The, and the, the clients were just so, they felt so important to meet you all that were there. It gave them pride. So a little bit more of working together. And we're not, you know, let's find a, another building. We may have found a couple, you know. Okay, thank you. And help with the move. <laughs> Noted, thank you. 
Other questions for Arlene? Council Member Wood. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Hi, Arlene. Um, thank you for everything that you're doing, and um, it's, it, I think it's appreciated. Um, you said that, um, just to follow up on a, a response earlier, there is a willingness to move if we find a better place for you. So the question is, is there a willingness to move if there is a better place for you to go? Yes. Hey, uh, you know, I heard one of the rumors that I heard was that the well was married to this building. And I said, I never married anybody. I mean, I was with my partner for 49 years. We didn't get married. I'm not married to that building. You know, nobody is. It's got its defects. We put a lot of money into fixing that building up so that it accommodates our people as well as we can. No, we're not wedded to that building. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a question if I can, Arlene. You have run the well in the desert for a long time. You've been in, I think, at least four locations in the city. I've seen you in three. Um, what is your what's you're an expert in running this program throughout the city where do you think is the best location well i don't know what locations are available uh we need help the city has a lot of that information and you know planning and all that we kind of need help in that and uh like i said uh a couple of us have gone out and about. We've seen a couple of places, uh, one's for sale, but it could work. And it is on a bus route and it's not, you know, uh, it's not impacted by a lot of housing. But again, where are you going to go? Uh, there are places off Ramon on those commercial and industrial streets. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, Eugene and all those streets over there. And I drive around and I see buildings and there are some buildings that I think would have enough space. Uh, again, some of them don't have air conditioning. They only have evaporative cooling. And we have found from a couple of the places that we're in that, you know, in the summertime, you really don't have a cooling center. So, uh, you know, I think if, if a place is on a bus route and and people, you know, can go on their, some will be able to ride their bicycles. It might be far, but our people travel far on their bicycles. Uh, so I think it just needs to be on a bus route. And I think it needs to be able to have a couple of showers and a couple of uh, bathrooms and office space because we do a lot. And we, again, we share a building with Martha and with other providers and an outside that's amenable to some of our providers because they like to come and put up their uh, canopy and see the people that way. I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's an impossible thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Not seeing any. Thank you, Arlene. We appreciate um, your time tonight, and I know it's late, so thank you. We will, uh, we're going to, if it works for council, um, pause this conversation and not deliberate because it's related to um, the county and their report and um, they're also waiting on the line. Um, and then if we can council, we can deliberate at the very end. Does that still work for us? I'm seeing heads nod from all the council, so there's consensus around that. Um, so we will go ahead and move to item A, 2A3, which is presentation from county staff regarding homelessness programs. City staff, are we prepared to do that at this time or do you need a short recess to bring them into the Zoom? I believe we're gonna start with Greg Rodriguez and then... Uh... Greg, do we need to bring people in on... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we, Aaron, can we bring uh, the other county staff in on the Zoom? Thank you.
All right, great. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, and staff. And um, before I get started, David, uh, on behalf of the supervisor, congratulations on the retirement. On a personal note, I've worked with you for a number of years, even in the congressman's office, and truly a valuable asset to the city who will be truly missed. So thank you so much. Consider you a great friend as well. So um, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to address the council tonight, um, especially we know that uh, two meetings ago, I believe it was, um, uh, some of the issues arose, and I'll address that in a little bit. But uh, you know, I'm not going to stand up here tonight and promise you that I'm going to solve all the problems we've just heard over the last couple hours. Um, I will guarantee you, though, that the county, in partnership with the city, uh, works every day. Uh, realizes the challenges that we are facing when it comes to homelessness, the growing number not just in the city of Palm Springs, but throughout the Coachella Valley and the county as a whole. What I'm hoping tonight to do is to be able to educate the council as well as the public on some of the programs that we as a county do. I could literally spend probably eight hours here in a deep dive on the particulars, but I will indulge or ask for your indulgence for just a little bit of time. And luckily it's not 10:15 like the last time we were here. So um, again, I, uh, uh, most importantly, though, what I hope we get out of this is how we move forward on this together as a partnership. The city of Palm Springs and the county over the last three years, four years since the supervisor was appointed, have really developed a really good working relationship. And yes, do we still have challenges and do we still have homeless uh, situations? We do. But I believe, uh, the supervisor believes and the county believes um, that we're headed in the right direction. Um, uh, just by way of introduction, sorry, uh, I'm Greg Rodriguez. I do work for the uh, supervisor, Manuel Perez, for the county. I'm also contracted for the last two years with the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, who you heard from last week, or last council meeting, sorry, uh, been developing a collaborative approach to homelessness across the Coachella Valley in conjunction with all nine cities, the Desert Healthcare District, the tribes, the county, and a number of other players, including our providers, faith-based communities, et cetera. I also chair the Riverside County Continuum of Care, um, so have a good knowledge of not only the countywide programs, but an intrinsic knowledge of what our homeless service provided, provisions are here in the Valley. I also want to uh, offer and let the council and public know that we do have numerous county staff on the line. I will be doing the bulk of the pre presentation tonight, but if there are questions that I am not able to answer, we have some of the most experienced people uh, in the county um, who have decades behind them. That includes Heidi Marshall, our Director of Ho Housing, Homeless Prevention, and Workforce Solutions. I promised Council Member Grace that I wouldn't use um, uh, acronyms, but I put them in parentheses here. We also have Carrie Harmon, who's the Deputy Director of the Department. Department. We have Kim Sarawatari, who's the director of RUH Public Health, and then we have a number of individuals from our Behavioral Health Department, and then Marcus Dillard, who's our Housing Authority Special Programs um, Director, who works with Heidi and Carrie. What I'm going to address tonight, and again, I, I will try to get through this as quickly as possible, but I want to make sure that the, count, the council and public um, are aware of um, the issues that we're facing and what we're trying to address in the county. First of all, I want to address the two uh, hotel uh, issues that we first uh, heard about through Chief Reyes. Uh, secondly, we'll go through uh, high-level county homeless services. Again, I won't get into the eight-hour presentation that I could do. And then again, more importantly, how we're going to be moving forward, not only as a county, but as a valley and as a, as a city together. As far as the public ho health hotel issue, and you know, when Chief Reyes brought this up, uh, two council meetings ago, it was actually a shock to me and to the supervisor. We didn't know this uh, project was in operation. The county has contracted with two hotels in the county since 2004, one in Palm Springs and one in Riverside. Uh, those, uh, that contract is primarily, has been utilized mostly for TB patients and primarily through hospital referrals or self-referrals. Um, and the average per year is about two to three clients. Um, they, there is care of clients while they're housed in those. Um, again, they're referred primarily through the hospitals, um, some through self-referral and some through law enforcement. We do provide an exit strategy for those. Um, not all of those individuals are homeless individuals. Some actually have housing, uh, but may not be uh, able to adequately quarantine. I will say in the public health aspect, um, we, didn't, we realized uh, as we were going through this um, that some of the communication channels between public health and the police department or the city were not as good as they could have been. A lot of this is because of the HIPAA requirements and just the, uh, the nature of the program that really wasn't utilized as much. I will say too that after the council meeting, the supervisor held a meeting with city staff as well as uh, the police department um, and 
and uh, county staff to address uh, both the public health issue as well as Project Room Key, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, I know that council had asked for some, some to statistics. Um, so you can see in 2019, prior to COVID, there was only one person housed in the Palm Springs Hotel, and that was one referred from a hospital. I know they, the council and, and the police department have also asked for cities of origin um, and obviously to either confirm or dispel the notion of dumping. Um, I will say that the county is not actively dumping people into the city of Palm Springs, nor is the sheriff's department. What we do uh, know is that we haven't always been good about tracking the cities of origin, and of course that is one uh, area that we will get much better on. In 2020, obviously COVID uh, came along, and so in the year 2020, we saw 15 people, and again, this is just in the public health operation of the hotel. You can see that there were five self-referrals, excuse me, one was from the Coachella Valley and four known known city of origin. And then we had nine hospitals referrals. Uh, you can see one from the past, three from out of the region, and five from Coachella Valley. Two of those were from Palm Springs. In 2021, uh, we so far have seen 13 people. One of those is a self-referral. Uh, we've had eight re hospital referrals, and then four from corrections with known no known area of origin. I think this is where we ran into um, the issue around uh, the arrest that happened, and then this is how the issue came to light um, for um, Chief Reyes in the police department. So that's the public health uh, hotel aspect. Again, I, I will reiterate that uh, our, not only our director of public health, but as well as um, Barbara Cole, who um, oversees that program, uh, has already uh, looked into how we do much better communication, not only with the city, with the police department. And again, as we move through COVID, luckily with vaccinations, uh, we anticipate hopefully that number going down that we have to do and are looking at other opportunities and other methods of housing people that need to be uh, quarantined or isolated. The second hotel project was Project Room Key. And uh, the County of Riverside started this program in March of 2020, well before actually the governor announced this was a statewide program. Um, the reason we did this was because of the fear of a, a potential enormous outbreak amongst our homeless population, specifically our most vulnerable seniors over 65. So we established the program, uh, again, with seniors 65 and over, pregnant women, or those with severe medical needs. We provided food on a daily basis, uh, case management. This is much more extensive than what the public health operation is. Um, and there's extensive case management from county staff, behavioral staff, as well as DPSS staff. Um, and our uh, housing uh, and homeless prevention staff as well. And then each, can each um, client that we put into a hotel room, we developed a housing exit plan and really tried to manage uh, the expectations of the client as well as the need for them to exit. I just wanted to provide a little bit of data as well, countywide, and um, this has been one of the most successful housing initiatives that we've done. I'll get into the lessons learned in just, in just a second, but countywide, we have had 908 individuals placed in hotels. 348 of those have been permanently housed. Uh, in the Coachella Valley alone, 214 people have been placed in hotels. Uh, the breakdown of those hotels, because I know that was a question from the council, was six hotels in Palm Springs, six in Indio, two in Desert Hot Springs, and one in Cathedral City, and actually one in Blythe, if we're going to talk about the fourth district. 96 people in the Coachella Valley um, were, were permanently housed so far. And then Palm Springs specifically, we've had 103... 133 individuals placed in hotels. 29 of those are still in hotels currently, and then 58 have been permanently housed. Also wanted to point out that um, we actually had hotels begging us really across the valley, but especially in Palm Springs, uh, when COVID first hit and they heard of this program, we had more hotels offer us than we were actually capable of providing. And you can see that the economic impact to Palm Springs is $1.8 million in, in hotel revenue um, to date. I wanted to get into some key observations, and uh, I, I, I'm going to start with the success of the program, and I know we've had challenges, and I'll address those in just a second, but if you look at the rate of permanently housed people out of the number that were placed, that is far more successful than a shelter operation. It's just about on par with the CV Housing First uh, program that the uh, CVAG presented on uh, in the prior council meeting. Um, the... Uh, Prioritization uh, for Section 8 and other voucher programs. Um, there's a lot of rules and regulations on how we can use Section 8 vouchers, but we made sure that we prioritized those for the, our senior residents in Project Room Key so that we could assist in the successful exit to permanent housing. 
The third bullet point here is a quick reaction versus thorough communication. And I think this is where maybe some of the breakdown happened, especially in a communication aspect. But the county, as I said, quickly reacted because we were really fearful of a public health outbreak amongst our homeless population. Not necessarily in our congregate uh, shelter facilities in the East Valley because we um, uh, addressed some of the precautions that needed to take place, but more importantly, those on the street. And especially because of the transient nature um, of, of the homeless population. We'd like to say that um, homelessness knows no bound city boundaries in the Coachella Valley here. While there are concentrations in Palm Springs and the Eastern Valley, there's also concentrations in Desert Hot Springs and Cathedral City, but we do notice that clients move across the valley on a regular basis. Where you know we could have done better is, and I know we did let the city know that we were doing this program, um, but we could have done a more thorough communication effort. I think also too, and this came up in earlier comments, is really looking at the concentration of services and the hotels uh, in relation to other service providers as well. Um, the county. Um, of course, too, we make our best efforts on placement. Um, there's been a lot of questions on uh, how we determine where people come from, um, what the case management aspect is, and what the program management is. And we really did try our best effort um, to place residents that were homelessness in Palm Springs into the Palm Springs Hotel, and then, of course, house those in hotels from other locations uh, in the city of origin. Uh, I will be the first to admit that wasn't always the case, but we really did try um, to make that a key focus as well. So those are the two homeless programs. And so the next section I really want to focus on a little bit is kind of county homelessness services. I'm going to give you kind of a little 30,000 foot overview here. But I really want to reemphasize again that the county, we realize that homelessness is an issue. We realize the, the problems that we have, not only throughout the county, but especially in Palm Springs as well. I'm a resident of Palm Springs. I see it on a daily basis. I will commit it to you that not only does your council, um, but the county, uh, the county uh, staff, um, our office, as well as the service providers take this as a very serious problem and are working daily to make sure that we can find really positive solutions to this. Um, the county... Um, established a 10-year homeless plan a few years back uh, that's being under revision. I'll get into it in just a second. But they've really shown a, a commitment to addressing homelessness across Riverside County. In fact, it was a couple years ago that they established a position within the ex executive office specifically for homeless services. While that position has been eliminated on the second bullet point, the reason that was eliminated is because a year ago this month in March, instead of the um, fragmented... Um, services that we had throughout the county through a number of departments. We established the Department of Housing, Homelessness, Prevention, and Workforce Solutions Department. What the beauty of this is, is it's allowed those, that fragmentation um, to decrease, if not almost eliminated. It's decreased the silos amongst county departments. It's increased the amount of communication. And more importantly, has increased the strategic initiatives um, coming out of the county in partnership with our cities, all 28 cities within the county, to address homelessness. We also, uh, the continuum of care, again, that I chair and the Board of Governance, um, uh, we have a strategic planning and action plan process underway right now um, that is going to specifically look at addressing regional and collaborative approaches. And obviously, one of those reasons would be the Coachella Valley. Our homelessness management information system uh, are going under an upgrade right now. In fact, we've gone dark as effective as of yesterday for a full implementation by April 6. We heard a lot about data in the last questions, and data is extremely important when we're trying to not only track our demographics of our homeless population, but more importantly, how we're providing services, and even more importantly, how we're exiting them into uh, permanent housing. It is critical, and we as a county um, require that anyone that is receiving any federal dollars, state dollars, or county dollars are required now to input information into our HMIS system. Um, not only does this data help us track how we're doing as a county, but it provides you and our other elected officials and elected bodies with uh, real-time statistics on where we can go, but more importantly, how we can improve it and do better. And then also, we all know, the biggest issue that we're all facing is the resource challenges. But there's also opportunities. It's important to note that even just two years ago, the only funding that was coming in for homeless services in the county was through the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. So it was federal dollars about nine, to the tune of about $9.5 million a year. 
What we've seen over the last two years, thanks to Governor Newsom, is a commitment by the state and, of course, the State Assembly and State Senate uh, for increased money through allocations of special program funding. Additionally, we've seen that COVID, with all the challenges we've had, has actually been somewhat of a godsend for homelessness funding um, with uh, not only a Project Room Key but other additional resources. We also know that there's additional resources coming from the American Rescue Plan and the county is looking at how we can best not only utilize those funds but leverage those funds with other individuals as well. We know still though that it's not enough and um, we will continue to of course advocate for more resources. I want to run, uh, sorry I went backwards. I want to run through really quickly just the county's homeless COVID-19 response. Again, a lot of this was in partnership with our cities and a lot of our community-based organizations. I talked about the fear in the beginning of uh, spreading of the pandemic within our homeless population. We Im immediately mobilized all our providers in the valley and throughout the county to provide PPE, uh, safety information, and how they can still provide services during the pandemic in a safe way. I will say, unlike many other counties in the state of California, we had an extremely low rate of infection within our congregate uh, shelter settings, and we should all be very proud of that uh, statistic. We, in our first round of rental assistance, did $33 million. 2,600, a little over, of households were served in the Coachella Valley, over 300 of those in Palm Springs. Uh, we have a new round of $57 million um, that the county has started uh, dispersing. There's also another $60 million from the state that the state will be dispersing as well. We ran the Great Plates program, which was a huge success here in Palm Springs. One of our um, major, uh, one, of the, one of the largest cities uh, uh, utilized that program. And that, of course, was to provide meals to homebound seniors. A lot of nonprofit assistance that the county provided, and that went to many organizations like Jewish Family Services, CVRM, Martha's, again, to to help them in the COVID and how to address. And then obviously I've already touched on Project Room Key and then Project Home Key, uh, which was the uh, second coming, for lack of a better word, of Project Room Key. But again, that was the acquisition of either hotels, apartment buildings for permanent supportive units. I'll address that a little bit uh, in just a second. Um, and we actually submitted three projects from the county to the state and actually two of those were accepted in the Coachella Valley. I again want to expand a little bit more on what the county's done specifically in the Coachella Valley and uh, uh, in relation to Palm Springs. Uh, we've talked a lot about ROIs. I uh, only want to emphasize that, of course, the county was the major funder in addition to really the support from the very beginning of Palm Springs and the city of Rancho Mirage. Not every city participated uh, to uh, run that shelter. There were a lot of challenges, not only in location, but it ended up that we weren't providing daytime wraparound services that was the original intent which of course I know that um, uh, former council member uh, Fote intended. And so it really just wasn't operating uh, when we closed that in to the, to the extent it should have been when we closed that in 2017. As you heard a uh, previous council meeting before, uh, uh, we work very closely with CVAG and the CV Housing First program. The county is, one, is the number one municipal funder um, of that program. And then and additionally, we work in partnership with them on a daily basis on um, behavioral health services and other supportive services through the county. We heard that uh, five individuals were sent out to CVRM uh, yesterday. Uh, we believe that was because of the partnership between CV Housing First, the county outreach staff, thanks to Marcus Dillard on the phone, as well as CVRM in an outreach event we did in those high concentrated areas of Baristo Park uh, and Indian Ca uh, Canyon and Ramon yesterday. Um, so we would like to think those five people um, are going to get some help going forward. Uh, many of you are aware of the cooling centers. The county um, funded three of those the last two summers. I really want to give a kudos to Palm Springs, though, that when the pandemic hit, they maintained the activities through January, February, correct me, David, if I'm wrong, um, and then the county again took over uh, for funding those as well. Um, we, uh, the county provides millions and millions of dollars, um, as I stated, not just HUD money anymore, but also state money uh, and some county general uh, fund money to a regional effort. And this really is all about collaboration. Again, homelessness doesn't stop at our county borders, um, and we really have to approach this. As I said, I've been working for the last couple of years on a collaborative approaches to this. I won't go through the whole list of people that we fund, but I will just highlight that the two major ones are Coachella Valley Rescue Mission and Martha's. And when we talk about you know only helping people within our city boundaries, um, a lot of the reasons that Roy's was developed was because there was so much reliance on the East Valley for homelessness services. 
those services are still utilized by residents of Palm Springs, for instance, in 20, 2,500 individuals, and this may not be all unduplicated, um, uh, were helped at CVRM, and 20% 20, 20 of Martha's staff, or not staff, I'm sorry, but residents are Palm Springs residents. Again, this is a collaborative Valley approach. We all have a responsibility to address this as well. Um, the next couple bullet points, just again, we've uh, increased our general fund budget increase for general assistance. Again, a lot of this is for um, homelessness prevention, but a lot of our homelessness clients that are put into permanent supportive housing rely on that general assistance to provide some sort of income and support until they find regular jobs. And then obviously we have a numerous amount of voucher programs that we utilize throughout. Uh, the uh, housing opportunities for persons with AIDS for years has been well utilized in the city of Palm Springs uh, in conjunction in partnership with Desert AIDS Project, DAP Health, um, and then of course Veterans uh, Affairs Supportive Housing and then our housing support program and obviously the Section 8 vouchers as well. Um, I really kind of wanted to highlight one department, uh, and because behavioral health, and um, Captain Kolovev will, will attest to this, and I'm sure his officers will, are, are the ones on the front line and really do have um, the kind of initial contact and really help us, not only as a county, but our city's jurisdictions, um, get people into services, getting them access, and, and eventually, hopefully, permanent supportive housing. With that being said, in addition to the homelessness housing, or, I'm sorry, the Housing, Homelessness Prevention, and Workforce Solutions Department. We have Adult Protective Services, DPSS, Animal Services, numerous other departments that actually assist in these efforts. But I wanted to highlight behavioral health, and especially wanted to highlight, um, under the leadership of Dr. Chang, um, uh, the uh, intense recruitment um, that we're doing and expansion of not only the community behavioral assessment team, CBAT, uh, but also uh, just the overall behavioral health outreach for homelessness services. So you can see that we have currently 10 outreach staff that's covering the desert um, with seven new positions that are in recruitment. We have one current homeless focused licensed clinical therapist and we have five of those in recruitment. So this is a really big, uh, not only financial commitment by the county, but it's going to be critical in addressing the real behavioral health needs of our homeless population. You can see we have, the, again, the community behavioral health assessment teams. Palm Springs was the leader in this. With, these are the ride along teams. Um, uh, Indio, or, I'm sorry, th this, is in, this is a different program than the ride along teams. I apologize. Um, but what we're doing is doing four new teams uh, to mirror uh, the behavioral assessment teams uh, that we have in Indio. And then we have Palm Springs and Palm Desert uh, that have partnered again with uh, Riverside University Health System's behavioral health partnership in those ride-along teams. Um, and what's important to note here too is that it, not only, uh, again, uh, appreciating the contracting with the city, but the county does have a larger commitment once these individuals are placed into services. And so the county is picking up you know, the housing services, the, the ongoing behavioral health services, and any other um, services out, outside side of the regular outreach portion. And then really finally on, on the county's role, I, I, I really wanted to address housing in a little bit. And of course, we all know, and David, you know we could get into three to four hours in conversations about um, the affordable housing and permanent housing and all of that. I, I, I will say that um, I'm very proud not only of the county, but more specifically of our Coachella Valley providers um, uh, in conjunction with law enforcement, with the support of the Desert Health Care District, that you know we're doing a really good job of outreach. We're doing a pretty good job of transitional housing. Um, we're doing a much better job of case management. Where we're lacking in the throughput is the number of permanent doors that we can place people in. And that's not only in permanent supportive housing units, but just affordable housing units overall. I just want to briefly talk about the Project Home Key. I, uh, obviously, most of you in Palm Springs know that we did, as a county, uh, put in an offer for the Ivy Palm Hotel. Unfortunately, that uh, property was in bankruptcy, and the judge denied uh, the purchase uh, by the county. So um, luckily, though, uh, what we thought we would have to return that allocation back to the state, we were actually able to utilize that for 107 units, uh, manufactured units in the eastern portion of the valley. Um, uh, so still got some permanent um, housing out of that. 
why I list the three projects that were mentioned before earlier by, by city staff is what we wanted to do as a county is really kind of step up and we worked with the city um, to figure out how can we as a county help contribute to make sure that those permanent supportive units that we were really excited about in Ivy Palm could remain in that portfolio. So you can see that the Agave, we're having 25 units, uh, the uh, DAP Health Project, 29 project-based vouchers. Um, we've also donated the land, uh, the county to uh, DAP Health, and then the Mon Monarch Apartments, uh, again, 15 county vouchers and a million dollar capital support. The county has also been uh, doing a lot of work with uh, Chalk Development on the Monarch to really help them uh, through the uh, application process, and we're really confident they're going to have a successful uh, uh, outcome. And then, of course, you can, the total per, uh, uh, contribution basically by the county is about $12.9 million in voucher commitments, and this won't be the last time we do that. I wanted to highlight one project, too, is No Place Like Home Funds. Um, um, these are extremely competitive funds. Uh, the Cathedral Palms complex that we've been working on for years uh, finally is opening units. Uh, that was a $7.7 .7 million investment. Um, and we actually, um, through CV200, have placed a Palm Springs resident in that facility within the last couple months. And overall in the county, we have about 800 units in production of affordable housing. Um, this is far more units than we've seen in a number of years. And again, all of these, or at least the vast majority of these, will, incru will include uh, permanent supportive units. And then just briefly, many of you are aware of the county's collaboration with Lift to Rise, the nonprofit here in the Valley, on their Connect Capital campaign. This is to build 10,000 units in the next 10 years. This is a really exciting part public-private partnership that is getting national and statewide recognition on uh, not only the collaboration between developers, planners, elected officials, um, but also funders, um, and, and getting, uh, again, uh, huge kudos from the state. So my main thing I want to focus on tonight is how we move forward, and how we move forward as partners. Um, and again, I will reiterate that I have really enjoyed the working relationship, um, not just with staff within the city here, um, but the entire um, council, um, as well as the rest of the region, uh, in trying to address homelessness. Um, I, what we need to do, we need to continue to advocate for the resources. We know not only on uh, state and federal level, but also county general fund allocations as well. I've been a huge proponent of that. Um, my executive office may not like that so much, but I'm going to keep doing that and uh, enjoy the partnership of the, of, of the city as well on that as well. Additionally, though, too, and I have long talked about this, is looking into phil philanthropic um, partnerships. And I'll get into some of that in just a second. Um, but we know we have a very philanthropic community here in the desert. and. Uh, uh, we can raise money along around a lot of good causes, and I think if we really have a good vision, which I think we do, um, that we should be able to tap into some of that. I think we need to look into continued support of regional funding and programming and collaboration. Not one government entity can do this alone. The county cannot do this alone. We do not expect the city to do this alone. Um, we can't count on law enforcement to take care of this alone. It really is a collaborative and regional approach, and I think we've set a really good framework for that. I think we also need to be utilizing, and I'm excited to announce the, they are not in place yet, but uh, will be soon, uh, new county regional outreach teams. Uh, this will be for not only medical care, but behavioral health and case management services. Again, this is getting back to the continuum of care and the Board of Government's uh, goal and to Heidi's department's goal of really looking at how we can provide a point of contact within the county, somebody that our law enforcement officials, our city partners can contact and work with to deliver uh, services as as well as work with our uh, providers. Uh, we need to look at a second round of Project Home Key. I know um, the Housing Authority is already keeping an eye on that. We're already looking into possible um, uh, properties that we can purchase. This is a unique opportunity to tap into uh, sufficient, I mean, and um, enormous, actually, for lack of a better word, is the word I'm trying to find, um, state resources to actually really develop some permanent supportive housing units in a much quicker time than what a traditional affordable uh, housing uh, project might do. I get back to communication and partnership. And then again, I think you know a lot of this, and you know we will take a lot of the blame on this, and I will personally on, on some of the miscommunication on whether we're dumping or not, or, or the hotel operations. And we always look at a way to better communicate and, again, partnership. And you know I, I, 
uh, Heidi and I have been talking about this the last couple of weeks since I uh, first came up at the council. And, you know, the county really wants to be a good neighbor. And, you know, we've tried to show that, um, again, over this relationship they've tried to build two years. And um, that, that will be our goal moving forward. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on really looking at are we creating enabling environments with our homeless services or are we providing real solutions? And, you know, for the lack of sounding cold, <laughs> um, it's a discussion that needs to happen. And we know that when there are concentrations of enabling services in locales, it does attract individuals into those locales. When we really are focused more on a housing first type solution, when we're really focused on intense behavioral health, intense case management, those are the ways that we can actually get people off the street. We've got to make sure that we are not creating environments um, that uh, make people feel comfortable that they can get three meals a day, um, shower, and then don't have to worry about um, what implications that means on our law enforcement, our in emergency rooms, um, or other public uh, services that uh, strain our budgets, not only at a city level, but county level as well. And then my final point I'm going to go into is we've heard a lot about shelters, and we know, and I give uh, former council member Fote credit for a lot of the, the initial discussions back in the day when the CVAG Homeless Committee was formed, because that was the original intent of that committee was to develop a shelter type system uh, in the west part of the valley, um, and that was what Roy's was supposed to be. Uh, what we do know now, though, especially that CV, or that, I'm sorry, that the Housing First model is really the preferred method, and I will give huge credit to CVRM and Martha's for adapting purely shelter-based programs into incredible examples of what a shelter slash um, Housing First operation could be. So I really believe, and we heard this mentioned tonight, that this is probably the next step that we really need to look at. I'm going to give you just a kind of photo rendering, um, and this is a project that um, uh, both uh, Council Member Kors, Council Member Holstage, uh, almost all city staff, Jay, um, David as well, um, have begun discussions about six months ago. And these discussions actually started with private business owners um, on how we can look at uh, not a shelter, but a navigation, access center, whatever fancy word you want to use in 2021. But what this does provide is an access point. Um, it does have an element of overnight shelter beds. Um, we know that we can't always just transfer somebody from the street into whether it's a crisis stabilization unit. Some don't want to go all the way to the East Valley Forest Shelter. And to be honest with you, not everybody wants to go into a shelter at all. So really creating more of a welcome type access center. Within this center, of course, you would have partnerships with behavioral health. You would have partnerships with um, you know, our DPSS to, to wrap around services and all that. What you see in the back, though, is what's the really key to a campus type environment like this, and that's the element of permanent support of housing units. So th again, these are, if this would be a timed entry point, you know, a certain number of, of days uh, within the shelter type system, and then we would move you into these permanent supportive housing units. What the beauty of this too is, is it's a mixed kind of use where you'd have long term, but more importantly, you could have a, a variety of, of crisis stabilization units or transitional housing. You could also have some discharge units. We know there's a big problem, not, a, not as big as it used to be, but there is an issue with hospitals not having a place to discharge homeless people. Um, and of course, we do not want them discharged to the, to the street. As I said, we've been working on this for about six months. We're having a, a very good meeting. I'm, I'm hoping on Wednesday to uh, go through some discussions. I really want to emphasize that there is no set location at present. Um, we, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff to be determined out about who would operate it, um, whose purview of responsibility, what the financing will be. There's obviously going to have to be, again, a collaborative approach on not only financing, but operation as well. I will say that in my research over the last year, um, it's these type of models that work. It's the campus model. Um, we hear a lot of uh, people, you know, why can't we build a tiny home village and all that. Those are basically a modified encampment um, that's an enabling environment, and they do not necessarily provide the wraparound services. They don't provide a sense of a permanent home, and really, again, to have this type of access center um, uh, and permanent supportive housing element. I'm going to close, and then I'm going to take questions. And again, I appreciate you indulging me in this time. But uh, I want to thank, again, um, for the opportunity. Um, and again, emphasize that we get this as a problem. Um, I, I go to bed on a nightly basis about this problem. Um, I get frustrated about the lack of movement within government, and that's at all levels of government, but primarily um, 
the frustration that we can't help people and the frustration that a lot of people we want to help and try to help won't take that help. Um, it's getting better. Um, our resources are getting better. I think we're on a great trajectory. I, I really want to give Palm Springs, first of all, I want to say you bug me a lot and I love it, <laughs> um, but I get it. And so does the supervisor and so does the county. And we want you to know that, you know, we've got your back and we will continue to move in the direction together um, to get people um, off the streets. And with that, I am more than happy to take questions. Thank you, Greg. We really appreciate the thorough uh, presentation and all of the work that you did in the supervisor's office, as well as all the um, department heads for the county um, in your work preparing it. Um, are there any questions of Greg or the county staff? Councilmember Garner. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that presentation. Um, I want to know more about the navigation center. Can you tell me? I understand it's it's not fully uh, flushed out, but what does it take to build something like this? How quickly can it go up? Uh, how much does it cost? I'd love to hear at least some some figures about what exactly it would take to do this, and 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 also how much land is needed. Um, because I think really right now what we need is something as quickly as possible. Um, and I, I want to know what we're looking at. And, and thank you, Council, Council, the Council Member Gardner, it's been a long day. Um, uh, and I should have addressed some of that because I have those notes written on my paper. But um, uh, in that rendering, what you saw, that's not a traditional like stick built building. There's a company out of the East Valley and it's more of a modular type concept. And so the production time and construction time from what we're told is six to nine months. So for a building of that capacity is pretty amazing. Um, obviously we would need assistance from the city um, on, on moving that through planning process and all that. We know that there are a couple parcels of city land that could be donated. So that would of course reduce that cost. Um, what you're looking for on the structure that we're looking at that I showed you the rendering. And again, this can be, you know, the size can be reduced or increased. And the nice thing about the modular is you can, if you started with a smaller um, footprint, you could always add on to that footprint as well. Um, but what that one was looking at, I'm going to try and test my memory on the discussion, but I believe it was 170 permanent supportive units, uh, 50 to 75 shelter beds, and then of course the office space for all the wraparound services was about a $6 million capital cost. Where and where the discussion needs to go, not after the capital. I'm not as worried about capital <laughs> um, as I am about operational. And then this is where we have to make sure that on an ongoing basis, you're looking at probably for a facility of that magnitude um, about 1.4 to 1.5 million dollar annual operating budget. With that being said, though, as I've actually started to do some research in the last couple of weeks on because if we had an element of permanent support of housing units in there, um, that could be a revenue source for uh, the project there. Um, additional other, you know, state funding as well. So those are kind of the rough figures. Um, uh, what I'm hoping um, to Council Mem Member Gardner is on, in, on Wednesday is really kind of targeting more about what the actual costs are going to be, again, the operational costs. But more importantly, how can we start talking about who can take a part in what part of that funding? So some, can some of that capital cost or operational costs come from that allocation that the city has? What can the county's role play. Um, again, a lot of this discussion was talked with uh, business leaders and then um, Jeff uh, uh, arranged a meeting between myself and Tom Kirk with CVAG with um, a fund uh, developer in the Valley just a couple weeks ago and, and what can be the private um, source. Um, in, you know, in my conversations with people like Tim Ellis and Oftop, they feel the business community is willing um, to, you know, to take on a project like this. You hit the nail on the head though, um, uh, Grace, and it, I feel the same way is that we can't start talking about this and then, you know, even if we come up with a building design and an operation, is wait two to three years to get it built. We don't have that time anymore. Councilmember Forrest. Just to uh, stay on this one, Greg, and I appreciate, um, and I don't, I know I was on meetings with you sort of on this modular project a couple months ago and I really appreciate to see the potential for this to move forward. I think it'd be really helpful. Um, I'm not sure who from council is going to be there Wednesday, but to have count, council and someone from staff there, um, you know, as we look at potential sites and uh, to really see, you know, and I appreciate 
the sense of urgency, but how quickly we could make something happen. So um, whether uh, you know, Mayor Holstead or Council Member Garner as liaisons um, could be at that meeting and maybe you're planning on it. But I do think we want to have that and maybe the planning director just so we, we're moving all the pieces as quickly as possible. Uh, because if we can make this happen, uh, you know, with the city funding that's available in the county and other access, you know, to funding that wasn't available years ago, I think this really has great potential. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and Council Member, um, uh, Council Member Gardner and Council Member Hostage have already been invited as well as uh, staff. So they were on the invite list in the very beginning. Um, I, I also do, uh, again, I'll go back to some of the funding we see coming down, whether it's through the um, American Rescue Plan um, or other uh, funding streams coming from the state. I think there's some very good potential that we could utilize it for this. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, and Greg, I, I'll just stay with the, uh, uh, the building and the site that you talked about. Uh, and I think all of us are incredibly excited uh, by the potential of doing something and working with you uh, and working with the county. This is going to have to be a partnership. Um, but I've got to say, uh, that our experience with uh, the Ivy Palm uh, left a lot of us uh, very uh, uh, concerned about the ability of the county to uh, follow through. Um, and yeah, res respectfully, Mayor Pro Tem, is um, we were ready to follow through on that project. We had funding all lined up. We had um, uh, uh, all the wraparound services you could imagine, um, a, a, an expedited timeline. Um, the only reason we did not go through with that was because of the bankruptcy court. Unfortunately, and you know, that decision was made, uh, I want to say November 7th. Um, and as you're aware, that pot of money um, for Project Home Key had to be expended by December 30th. Um, we did look if there was the opportunity to purchase another property. There would have been no way we could have closed escrow or, 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 or continue. But I, I guarantee you, Mayor Pro Tem, we were fully excited about this project. Uh, we were ready to go. Um, and we were really looking at it as a model for when we expect the round two to come around. Obviously, as I said, we're doing a little bit more due diligence now um, as a county, hopefully, so that w we don't apparently disappoint you in the future. Thank you for that. And uh, uh, we want to be your partner. Uh, and uh, we understand the importance of the kind of wraparound services uh, that uh, can be built from scratch. Uh, I've got a lot of questions and some comments on some other issues, but I want to let my uh, colleagues uh, ask any questions or make any comments regarding uh, the potential for a center. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Any other questions or comments on that issue from Council? Greg, I do. Um, so what would be the next steps to move a project like that forward? Obviously, we've heard from our community that they want this $10 million um, and then the county funding as well, um, since none of us can do this alone, but they want it um, right away. And obviously it's at crisis levels and people are unhoused and their lives are at risk right now. Um, so what would be the next steps in terms of a city process or county process to move this forward? So as I said, next Wednesday, hopefully will be, I, what we really need to do is make sure that we um, get some costs nailed down, what the scope of the project is going to be, um, and then have those discussions. I, you know, I, I will be candid with you. I can't stand up here and commit county funding. Um, that obviously has to go through a process. Um, it's an it's, it's issue or a project I'm willing to advocate for. I'm sure the supervisor would as well. Um, but I think that's what we need to determine is, is one is nailing down, first of all, what the cost is going to be, not only just for capital construction, but again, for what the anticipated operational costs would be um, with any assistance from any type of revenue sources. Um, and then we would go um, forward with, from there. Thank you. 
Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, do you want to continue your questions and comments since you said you had others? Thank you. Uh, I want to get into, uh, well, first, uh, let me ask just a, a couple of quick questions on the program uh, that housed individuals uh, uh, who had been hospitalized, uh, the two hotels. Uh, that program, as I understand it, uh, started back in 2004. I think we can all appreciate that there are situations where individuals need to be housed following a hospitalization. Uh, but uh, it mushroomed, and there were only two hotels. One of them was in uh, Palm Springs. I'd like to, to know what criteria went in to the selection of the hotel that was used in Palm Springs. I, I, I will probably turn this over to Kim Saratari, but I, I do want to just clarify a little bit that um, in the public health hotel use, it's not just it's not people just discharged from the hotel. It's specifically individuals who have a communicable um, disease. So, like I said, that's either TB and then of course now would be COVID. I, I'm not pervy, and I don't know if Kim does on how that hotel was selected. Um, Kim, are you available? Hi, Greg. Yes, I am. Good evening. Um, so I was not um, in my current position back in 2004 when the contract was negotiated, but what I can do is tell you that we look at hotels um, that have certain precautions for communicable diseases. So, for example, they have outdoor entrances to the rooms. There's separate ventilation to the room. Um, and then, and those are very important just so that we're not um, mixing airflow in the event of a communicable disease. Um, we also look for hotels that are willing to work with us in terms of um, not going in and doing cleaning in the rooms uh, if, if a person is communicable or while they're communicable. Um, we uh, look for somebody who is willing to work with us in terms of providing services. So we provide nutrition services through our programs um, and we do shopping for the individual to make sure that their basic needs are met. So uh, it's really a combination of communicable disease requirements meant to reduce any possibility of transmission to anybody else uh, in the facility and then also the ability to support the services that are needed to um, meet those daily needs. All of those sound uh, incredibly important, and I appreciate that. Uh, does your review also include uh, uh, working with uh, the local police department, the local code enforcement department, uh, to determine whether or not uh, this particular hotel has been one that has been uh, problematic uh, in terms of uh, uh, it? community issues? Mayor Pro Tem, to date, it had not included those types of discussions. Um, part of the reason had been uh, trying to protect the confidentiality of the patient themselves. Um, but I do think that uh, this has been a, a great, well, I don't want to say great, but um, a learning process to go through and see the, the um, potential need for much better communication all around. Um, but historically, no, that has not been done. Uh, from the, the tone of your voice, I think I understand that you, you realize that's something that does need to be considered uh, in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and as we go through this conversation on hotels, I'm not going to mention the names. I understand from our city attorney uh, that, uh, and he can correct me if I misstate this, uh, that uh, there is no reason, uh, uh, as we understand under HIPAA, why we cannot identify the hotels. Uh, but uh, in fairness to the request from the county that we not identify them, I'm not going to identify them right now uh, or in the course of this evening. Uh, but I will, before this evening is over, uh, ask the city attorney to take actions to uh, uh, with notice to the county uh, so that the public is aware of what facilities have been used. Uh, Greg, you uh, gave us some 
some data on the hotels that were being used for Operation Room Key. And I think this is fairly recent data, but it shows that, uh, uh, at least as of the date that you gave it to us, uh, there were 191 rooms that were being operated under Operation Room Key. 51 of those are in Palm Springs, uh, which is uh, a little better than uh, uh, 25 percent. Uh, it is, uh, there were another 42 that were in operation in, uh, in the balance of, or excuse me, uh, 51 in the Coachella Valley. And of those 51 in the Coachella Valley, 38 were in Palm Springs. Uh, that's a very significant number. And frankly, uh, those hotels are within a couple of blocks of one another. And this list doesn't even include the hotel uh, that, uh, when we go back to that $1.8 million number, one of those hotels that's showing now as having zero rooms collected $791,462.50 in funding from the county. And now they have no, no one there. Uh, and we've received numerous reports from our police department regarding uh, activities that took place at that hotel. Thank, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I, if I could address the first thing about naming the hotels, it wasn't specifically only about HIPAA issues. What we were worried about is um, retaliatory efforts against the hotel owners themselves. Uh, what we were worried about is retaliatory efforts against the clients that were there. Um, additionally, not necessarily publicly announcing them, so you got a greater concentration of people around there. So it wasn't specifically HIPAA issues around there. I'm going to try and address as much of the numbers as we can, and, and, I, I, and I, I might turn this over to Heidi or Carrie. Um, I'm going to get back to the point that a lot of this was done on the fly and because of a public health crisis. Uh, we'll be the first to admit we probably didn't track all the data, especially the data that you're asking for us now. Um, but with um, the, uh, I, I go back to what I mentioned in my presentation is when, when we first started this program, we got far more interest from hotel, motel properties in Palm Springs than in the other jurisdiction. Um, we also, uh, if you look at the numbers of those placed um, throughout the valley, uh, a vast majority and the highest demand was actually from um, the city of Palm Springs. As far as the hotel that you mentioned that has zero and was one of the highest um, uh, economic impact to the city, um, we felt as a county, it was made quite clear to the county uh, a week and a half or two weeks ago that they did not want anyone else in that hotel. And, and, and I will get back, and again, this is not a defensive means either, and we realized, and as I mentioned in my report, is we did realize that there was a concentration um, in yeah, in an area that was discussed in the earlier section tonight, um, and felt that you know by by eliminating that property, um, we could hopefully help a little in that. Um, we know that in the beginning, and I don't remember if Captain was involved either uh, at that time. I believe he was, but I know Chief Reyes was that at that uh, individual place that we were talking about, we had had some issues. Um, with drug use and, and unwanted visitors. And, and the county immediately held a call, in addition with Heidi and Karen and myself and, and, and public safety here in Palm Springs, and immediately implemented security. Should we have done that in the beginning? Probably, but again, we learned that as well. Um, but the, uh, I will also mention, too, that as we speak, the county is uh, winding down. The project room key operations effectively will probably end um, June 30th. Um, I also, though, do want to emphasize that doesn't mean that we don't care about the 65 and old seniors that still need to have housing and services and are looking at other options on how and developing programs on how we make sure that they're getting the right care, but at a less impact to either you as a city or to um, hotels. And again, as we see, we know as the economy comes back, especially in this city, um, you know, those rooms need to be utilized for tourists. So. Okay, Greg, I appreciate that, and I really appreciate uh, the responsiveness of the county when it comes to the one hotel. Uh, also, from the numbers that we're seeing, uh, 
uh, many of the individuals that uh, were housed through Operation Room Key, it appears that uh, they had a successful result. They moved into more permanent uh, housing. Uh, some of the numbers that, uh, that you showed us earlier this evening uh, were encouraging in that. Uh, but they also show a significant number of individuals uh, that at least from the data I have before me, I can't tell uh, what happened to them after they left uh, uh, the hotel rooms. Uh, for for those that were, I'm sorry, for those that were not permanently housed, what happened? I, I, I'm gonna, I'll speculate here, but I, I have, I feel comfortable speculating a little bit, but then I will turn it over to Carrie um, or Heidi. They may be able to answer this uh, a little more in depth than I can, but like any housing program um, or homeless service program, you, you, you don't have a 100% success rate. Would that be great? Yes, it would. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of those exited probably did not want services. I will say too, there was probably a little bit of uh, an enabling environment again. You know, when we first announced this program and it allowed people to stay in a hotel room for free, they were getting food. Um, but then when the county really emphasized, again, I will get back to the fact that we did case management, set exit plans, and that when that client probably realized that, or we as a county realized they're not meeting up to that exit plan or the, or the client doesn't want to live up to that exit plan, then that's how they're exited. But um, Heidi or Carrie, I don't know if you'd like to add on to any of that. Hi, good evening, Honorable Counsel. This is Heidi Marshall. I, I will say that Greg's speculation is spot on. Um, the individuals who were not placed or haven't been placed in a permanent housing opportunity uh, were terminated from the program. Um, there were a variety of folks who were not able to abide by the rules of the program that we're running. And so when they were terminated, they were offered an opportunity to be reconnected to the shelter or other programs. Um, and some chose to um, follow that plan and some chose to not follow that plan. So I appreciate that. And all of us know that uh, how hard it is to have success. Uh, what I fear is uh, those that didn't follow the rules, those that you had to make that hard decision to uh, have them leave ended up on my streets. Yes, uh, it is absolutely our concern as well. As, um, as you can imagine, our preference would be to make sure that everybody is successfully placed. Um, as Greg referenced earlier, our good neighbor policy is something that we take very seriously and we are working to refine that policy to make sure that we develop not just a model communication, uh, but also a service protocol so that those clients are being provided not just assistance opportunity initially, but that there is a thorough follow-up so that they're not just left without a backup plan. Uh, thank you. I, I, I could ask, I could ask you another three or four days worth of questions, but that wouldn't be fair to you or to my colleagues. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. If I could just ask a follow-up question on that. Um, how many people were placed in Palm Springs um, and then failed the program or exited um, who didn't exit to permanent housing or who are still in the program. So how many people were exited, um, you know, as failures or as a failure for the program or sorry, that's not the right word. We've been on Zoom for um, six and a half hours straight, um, but who were terminated from the program um, who didn't transition into another location that the county knows about. Yeah, so, so in, in the numbers, um, basically 133 Palm Springs, uh, there were 130, 133 people placed in Palm Springs hotels. So um, 38 of those have been permanently housed. Um, so, um, and then there's still 29, you're making me do really fast math here, Christy. Um, or 50, 58 of those were permanently housed, though. So, um, so I have 46 is the remainder, right? So 46 out of the 133 Correct. were placed if, in house? Correct. 
and and so that so those those would be the individuals that either were terminated from the program for lack of either following the rules or not wanting to do the exit plan, or exited the program on their own. Um, I, I, and I don't know. Uh, I, probably your next question I'm going to uh, anticipate would be, do we know where they're at, <laughs> um, and, and how can we help them? So this also addresses Mayor Pro Tem's uh, comment and question as well. This is like any homeless service program, and we deal with this in you know CV. 200 and other programs, even sometimes we can get someone to something like this, and even if, they're, if they fall out, they're not successful, that doesn't mean we still don't try and do the outreach. We still don't try and re-engage them. Um, ideally, uh, we know, and then again, you know, with the CV200 working with the captain and, and the chief, uh, identifying again these high utilizers. But Heidi, I don't know if you'd have any more clarification on that as well. And again, um, Mayor, I, I apologize again, and you know I'm a data geek when it comes to this stuff, and it, it's just some of this is a transient nature again too, because we have, even within a, a one hotel setting, we will sometimes move individuals to another property uh, if they're having issues, say, with somebody within that uh, property as well. So our, our data is not as clean and as, as crisp as I would like it, um, but that's about the best explanation I can give you. And I, Heidi, I don't know if you could expand any more on that. Only to say that um, aside from a number who were um, referred and did go to other shelters, we also did have a large number of folks that were connected to family. That is something that our team, because we have a, a large number of navigators that are working through these programs, um, as they get to know the folks that we house through this program, they they become familiar with their not just their where they were initially found, but also with their supportive network. And that leads us sometimes to make successful connections to family members and friends who are um, open and able to take them back into the fold. Thank you. So I'd love to see those numbers. I mean, in my calculation, if 46 people were not successful in going through the program to permanent housing, um, and we don't know about the people still in hotels, I guess, but overall that would be a 66% success rate, which is actually a really good success rate for a homelessness program, especially compared to a shelter. Um, and I do want to, I was wanted to ask a follow-up, applaud the county and Greg and Heidi and Carrie and um, all of the staff there really for building this program as we were entering a public health crisis. And we know that it's not perfect. Um, and we know that you're really doing your best every day to house folks and to help people who are unhoused. Um, and so we appreciate it. I think our policy interests all together as the county and the city um, and the other agencies we serve on is, you know, what can we why is homelessness increasing um, in the city and where do those numbers come from so that we know which solutions um, we need to work on and which populations we need to address. So if you could follow up um, with, if you have additional data about if those 46 people um, came to Palm Springs or remained in Palm Springs and then were exited to the streets, because that would be a large uh, increase. Um, if that were the case, right? And you said a lot were already from Palm Springs, so we just want to, I think, see that data and and know, you know, how many people were exited to the streets in Palm Springs and how that has contributed to the increase in numbers. So, Mayor, I, I'll, I'll work with county staff to see if we can dive into that data a little bit better. I, I do want to point out one thing that you mentioned about the 60-some-odd percent success rate. That's almost unheard of in homelessness services. What it does show and what Project Room Key, even with all the headaches and challenges we faced, is housing first works. You put a roof over someone's head and you provide the services, it works. Thank you, Greg. I was just going to say the same thing. Housing people right away, it works um, without a lot of barriers. So thank you for your work doing that over this last year. Um, I just have a few other questions. I don't know if we want to flag them and answer them now um, or, you know, provide an update. But you didn't go into in depth the shelter, the overnight shelter 
uh, provided by the county during the pandemic. So first it was at Palm Springs High School in my district, and then it was at the Methodist Church. Um, and you didn't give us the data about how many people came to the city or remained in the city for that shelter, and then what their exits looked like. Um, I, I would have to get you that, Mayor. I wasn't. I didn't have that prepared. I, I believe I presented that at another council meeting or CVAG meeting. I can't remember <laughs> anymore. But um, I, ca I can get that data for you. Um, what we did notice, though, Mayor, is that um, uh, uh, much of the clientele, and in fact, in all three locations—Desert Hot Springs, Cathedral City, and Palm Springs—that we saw this summer were many repeat from the prior summer as well. So, but let me delve down. I'd be happy to get that information to you and staff. So. Thank you. That would be helpful. Do other council members have questions or comments? Council member reports. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just while we have the county on um, and echo the appreciation for the work and the concerns and sort of the path forward, because uh, ultimately it's about solutions. Um, as we're getting to the end of March, it's going to be summer soon um, and appreciate, you know, the efforts to have summer shelters in the West Valley in not just Palm Springs, but Desert Hot Springs and Cathedral City. Are there any plans in place for those at this point for this upcoming summer? So there have already been conversations started. I'm not waiting till May or June this year. <laughs> um, there, there are some serious conversations to have. Obviously, you know, it's the resource issue. I've been lucky enough to somehow wrangle that $300,000 the last two years. Um, you know, there is the opportunity with some of the, uh, the funding sources. Um, you, you know, again, um, Councilmember Kors is, we really have to look at these as, are, are, are these part of the solution or are they an enabling aspect as well? Um, we had very little placement in the first year of this. We didn't really have a lot this last year either, primarily due to COVID. That doesn't mean we shouldn't look at doing them, but to specifically answer your questions, already in conversations with Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, already uh, scouting out some of the locations and then, uh, you know, again, trying to decide how we move forward. Yeah, great. And, and I appreciate all the data and research that has been discussed tonight, but also over the years on shelters are not the permanent solution, uh, but it's 110 degrees out at night, just from a humanitarian um, aspect, I, it's just important to do uh, nonetheless. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and the other question, I guess, and I don't know if this is really for you or for our staff, or but just how we work together, Right. Even if we're able to do the kind of project we talked about earlier, the modular, you know, campus project, the element with obviously drug use, severe mental health and the criminal elements are not likely to go to those projects. Right. And that's a lot of what we heard about in some of the public testimony um, and how we can work together on those. I know there are a lot of limitations, especially um, which the captain shared on what our options are, but has the county sort of looked into what options there are in those situations? We look constantly at it. And, um, you know, I've got a whole behavioral health team on here um, that could address the behavioral health aspects and the substance use. Our county is a national leader when it comes to substance use treatment, uh, especially in our peer-to-peer -peer, uh, programs, as well as our behavioral health programs. You know, I, I didn't mention, but it is one element to um, the short answer is just yes, we're constantly looking at ways to, to deal with this. I think, you know, I, you know, as a bleeding heart liberal, I'm going to agree with Captain Kolovev on Prop 47 and some of the limitations that's put on us. Um, I would never be one for criminalizing hom homeless, especially because they are residents. I, I will say, you know, uh, that what the county will continue to do is expand not only on its behavioral health treatment, substance use treatment. That was a huge factor of Roy's being a 96 bed uh, uh, augmented board and care facility. That helps our throughput on our 5150 issues and, and allowing space for our law enforcement to place people in, in those higher acuity settings. Um, I, I, Jeff, I wish I could stand up here and give you the answer and you know you wish you could too. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't continue to look at innovative ways to try and deal with this. I, I, I'll go back to that, um, you know, we have some really good outreach efforts and, and I will again give Tom Cox credit and we did a really good event yesterday that we coordinated you know, with the various outreach teams so that we're not stepping on each other's toes. But really through the CV200 and, you know, we're looking at, again, the regional coordinators through the county
county is identifying what you know the high impact areas and what the major issues are because you know drug use or, or um, behavioral health might be more acute in Palm Springs than say it is in Mecca. Um, and so, you know, you do have to look at this and how it affects its weight. But I, I guarantee you, um, Jeff, and, and I know for a fact, uh, uh, Heidi and Carrie, uh, her entire department, I, I know the executive office um, um, care deeply about this and uh, are doing everything we can, um, you know, to, to try and solve this. I think we all are not going to kid ourselves that we will never solve this 100%, um, but we know we can make a huge dent in this. And, and, and again, I, I, I would just say I believe that especially us as of a valley have really laid a fantastic foundation for this, and it's really about how we now build upon that foundation um, to really make a dent. Thank you. Council Member Wood. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Greg, I want to take advantage of the staff that's here and just ask a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, I applaud your computer program to collect better data that you're rolling out on April. I believe it was April 6th that you're rolling out. I hope that really does help us understand the movement of homeless people and the success rate of homeless people. But, you know, we as the city council are getting a lot of heat from our local constituents and our business community that we're not doing enough. But is it not true that it's the county's responsibility and the county is the one that gets the funding for homelessness? Well, the, there's many jurisdictions that get funding for homelessness. In fact, you as a city receive $10 million in a state allocation as well. And, you know, we can, um, and, you know, we can, we can go back and forth legally. I'm not an attorney, so I can't give you a definite interpretation. There are um, interpretations on both sides of is it a joint responsibility? Um, is it solely the county's responsibility? I, I would just say in, in my work, or at least the intensive work I've done over the last three and a half, four years, that the only way to solve this and address it is a collaborative approach, everybody working together. I think the Coachella Valley is a perfect example of that. Through CVAG, where you've got literally this year, probably all nine cities for the first time, contributing money to CV200, the rapid resolution programs, uh, leveraging the Desert Healthcare District dollars. Uh, county contributes to that as well. Um, you know, Dennis, to be honest, you know, this is a county of 2.4 million people. Um, there are 27 other cities in the county who are experiencing many of the same problems. Um, we do not have the discretionary budget um, to solve all of it. Um, I wish we did. I know county staff wishes we did. That will get back to my point is that's where we need to all work in partnership on advocating for that. If the county were allocated enough revenue to take care of it and didn't have to have any kind of joint help from the city, I'm sure we'd love that. But that's just not the reality where we are. But again, on the legal interpretation, I, I would leave that to Mr. Ballinger and county council to discuss. So the other question I want to ask is just a situational question. And that is, um, let's say that I'm addicted to drugs. Let's say I'm homeless, I'm addicted to drugs, and I have a mental health issue. And I am either sleeping in the wash in Palm Springs or I'm sleeping in the door front of a store. And in the day, I might go to Well in the Desert. I might get a free, free meal um, at any of the churches that are offering free meals. How do you find me? One, the first question is, how do you find me and what's my geographic movement through the process to, to, be, to, to heal? I mean, where do I go? What do you do with me? And then secondly, as the storefront that I'm sleeping in front of, what can the storekeeper do? So obviously, no, not every client is the same. Um, everybody has different acuity levels, but I'll take your example. Um, as I said, we have numerous outreach teams. Um, we have mental health uh, professionals that are embedded with law enforcement and other outreach efforts. And when I'm talking about outreach teams, it's, you know, Coach Elevator Rescue Mission, it's Martha's, it's the county um, behavioral health. I pointed out the number of individuals we're even bringing on board. So if, if we find an individual that has those um, uh, comorbidities, basically, is if, if they're, one, is they're going to have to have some sort of willingness um, to seek service. 
So obviously, if it's an acute, if there's a health condition, obviously into a clinic or a hospital setting. If it's a behavioral health issue, obviously placed into treatment. Um, same thing with substance use. Um, and again, um, um, Council Member Woods, it would depend on, say for instance, you've got someone that has a higher level of substance use than say behavioral health issues. Well, let's tackle that substance use first because probably the majority of behavioral health issues are coming from that substance use. Same thing would be vice versa. Um, what's the beauty is that we've got, you know, there, there's a variety of ways you can do it. It's, you know, if, if there's a severe mental illness and they'd be willing for, you know, a 72 hour 5150 hold and get into the system that way. Um, if they're willing just to do, if they only need inpatient or outpatient care, um, obviously utilizing the resources that you heard about two weeks ago and that we utilize with other programs throughout the county on getting them into a crisis stabilization unit. So again, providing a roof over their head and providing the wraparound services. Um, I, I will say to that point too, council member, is that um, an individual like that probably on average takes 30 to 40 I engagements before they would actually obtain services. Um, how, what, what the beauty, again, it, not only about the data system, but we're looking it into um, GIS mapping uh, for what we call our frequent flyers or high utilizers. Um, that's the beauty of a regional and collaborative approach amongst our cities and the county is working with our law enforcement and, and, and emergency and medical facilities that we know kind of the movements of where these individuals go, especially those that are uh, of high acute nature. And as a storefront owner, um, what can the storefront owner do when they see me sleeping on the street in front of their door? What, what, what's, who do they call? What do they be said to the police department? It, there... it, yeah, if, if, it's a, if it's a private property issue and they're sleeping there, they can call law enforcement. But to the captain's point, um, they're going to be out in the street in probably, what, two hours, Captain, <laughs> if that. Um, but technically, and so you could even say, so the corner at Ramon and Indian, um, which is technically private land, if there's a no trespassing order, which I think a sign just went up there, um, technically you can call law enforcement. Um, but, you know, to the captain's point, their resources are stressed, and, and, and people are not going to be held in jail for trespassing. And, and, and there, right. you know, there's been legal opinion um, and laws in the state of California to the point where you cannot criminalize um, homelessness. So I'm trying to understand, Greg, how one gets into, the, you have outreach, are they, is it through, well, in the desert that you're farming me, like people like myself who's homeless and, and, and have some, some, some morbidity issues? Or is it, are you actually going into the field like when we do the count and finding these people and trying to help them? It, it's a variety. So, um, it, yes, it's, it's a lot of field work. Um, it's out in the washes. It's out behind the Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, that was my whole point today uh, or yesterday on the county collaboration with CVRM and um, uh, CVAG on the uh, outreach we did in those high concentrated uh, areas that Dr. Reddy showed in the photographs. But again, it, it, it's not a one size fits all for everybody. So, I mean, we could utilize a CVAG crisis a stabilization unit. We could utilize CVRM and Martha's as a shelter environment. Um, we could, uh, um, I mean, you technically could use well. Um, they tend to be more of a day service type uh, operator than um, more of an access point into actual wraparound services and care. So it, it just, it depends on what the need of the individual it is. It depends on the willingness um, of whether they want to go to a shelter or not. I think it's very important to point out, you can build all the shelters you want, but not everybody, even if they want services, will enter a shelter. Um, so it, it's hard to really say that this is the one way that people get into the system because there's just numerous channels for them to get into that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Greg or other county staff who are on the line? Greg, I just have a quick few ones. Um, so you said that the program will be ending June 30th, Project Room Key. So where will those people go and what are the exit plans um, for those people to ensure that they um, aren't just transitioned onto the street? 
obviously I know you'll work hard to house everyone, but, um, you know, I am concerned with the number of people who are housed through Project Room Key in Palm Springs and then did not complete their exit plans and then were transitioned into this, onto the street. Yeah, and, and again, not all of those of the 46 were transitioned to the streets. Some did go back to family and all that. But to your point is we will continue to work on the exit strategies and exit plans. I, I, I might ask Heidi to help follow up on this, but that will be the plan <laughs> um, going forward. So. And obviously this is a free country and people who are homeless don't lose their rights to go where they like. But um, I just wanna make sure as we're thinking through these programs that there aren't those impacts to the total number of people who are homeless, which, um, you know, harms all of the great work that we're all doing together. Um, and then are you providing on-site security for all of the hotel sites? I know that um, we worked with you, thank you, um, when we found out that um, the Quality Inn was being used and housing a lot of people. Um, that's already been public that the chief had talked about. Um, and thank you for working with us to provide on-site security. So are you seeing other public safety impacts in other locations, um, because I think we are, um, that might benefit from for from private security? Yeah, and um, Mayor, I'm not as involved in the details of the other operations, so um, Heidi or Marcus Dillard might be able to answer that better from the staff. Yes, I can absolutely help um, with that one. The strategy with regard to security was that we went ahead and provided um, those services for the larger hotels. Some of the hotels have their own security on site, and so it's a combination um, of where it was needed and who, who was going to provide that service. As far as the continuity of service, while the program or project is ending at, as of the end of June, um, the folks that remain are, are now very well known to our staff, and because they're long-term clients, we do have a permanent placement plan that we're working on for each of them. Um, the fact that they are still in the program means that they are abiding by the contract and the program rules, which means that there is a higher likelihood um, that we will be successful in identifying a long-term long -term permanent placement for each of them. Mayor, if I could, thank you. Mayor, if I could add mm -hmm. on to that too is, again, this gets back to the uniqueness of the client. Is you know some people take a little bit longer to get certain paperwork that's needed. We call that doc ready in the homeless service. So you know, depending on again what the QE level is, not just and I use that word not just in a healthcare aspect, but in their level of readiness to interact with the housing. And then you know we may be facing challenges on actual doors available, but you know the departments work daily on that. So. Thank you, and thank you for all your work. And we've heard you that really the problem in the system is the lack of permanent supportive housing and homes for people to end up with. And that's why we've dedicated, the school council has decided to dedicate a large portion of the $10 million that we um, obtained um, for permanent supportive units. Um, and you know, I think that your work on that is really important. Um, so, you know, with that, I we appreciate you you being here. Um, we appreciate your ongoing partnership. I think some of what you heard from the council and the public is that these are structural problems. I think it's pretty clear, at least in my opinion, that the county is not spending enough resources on homelessness and housing. And that's not to say that any individual on this call is not working incredibly hard. I see Greg working 80 hours a week on this issue. Um, you know, and I know I've worked personally with everyone on this call from the county. Everyone is doing incredible work, but it's a structural issue that there isn't enough resources dedicated to this issue, both at the city level, the state level, the county level. So we appreciate your partnership in trying to find more funding um, in order to alleviate um, you know, homelessness and to house all of our unhoused neighbors um, and residents. So thank you very much, Greg and, and county staff for all of your work here and being late, uh, being here late with us tonight. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you. Uh, Greg, I sent uh, you uh, and uh, the city manager of on uh, a week ago, a very long list of questions. You provided some very good answers uh, to those questions. Uh, Captain Kovalev has also 
provided a very uh, good report. Uh, I'm going to be asking the city attorney to work with you and with the captain uh, to make sure that there's no information that uh, should not be released to the public, but uh, uh, that all information that is not protected that was in the uh, my questions, your responses, and Captain Kovalev's uh, uh, report uh, be released to the public. And Mayor Pro Tem, more than happy to do that. I don't anticipate there is a lot in there. Uh, again, our really only issue was just, you know how emotional this issue can get. Um, and that was our fears. We didn't want any of your businesses harmed or any clients harmed, but I'm happy to work with uh, Mr. Ballinger and, and be able to. We, the county, we are all about transparency, at least that this homelessness operation, trust me. So um, we'll get that for you. I appreciate that, Greg, and I, your, your effort. Other questions or comments for Greg and the county staff? I just want to say thanks to the county staff for being on, and, and I want you to know as a city, and I, I know you've recognized this already, that when you've asked um, for questions and input from them, that they're very available, and I just want to commit to you that any time, um, they're more than willing to come on. So. Thank you. We really appreciate that, and I think what we've learned through this process and working together, especially during the pandemic, is um, we ask that you come to us first and that you notify us ahead of time um, for a lot of these programs just so we can help you. Palm Springs has been a really open and willing partner in this. Um, and our residents have been really um, supportive um, in our businesses and we want to continue that partnership. And I think um, it only helps when we all work together um, as opposed to seeing impacts later on or not being notified about um, programs, which you know we've, we've addressed here tonight. So thank you. With that, I, um, I got a request to take a 10 minute break um, and then we will come, we will go to recess for 10 minutes and then we will come back and deliberate about the well in the desert CUP and then move on to the additional items for the night. So we will go ahead and recess for 10 minutes.
We will re-adjourn, come back from recess, and we are at item 2A, let's see, we're going back to 2A2, which is the public hearing, the city council review of the conditional use permit issued for well in the desert. So city council, and, and just for the public and for the council, the reason I thought it would be important to do it that order is because these issues are kind of all together, right? That we've seen an increase in the area. We've seen an increase in homelessness overall. There are public safety impacts. There are complaints about um, drug use and other, you know, related issues and, and other sort of elements. And so um, it's, found it important to get kind of the update from the city, an update from the well in the desert, an update from the county, and then have a broader discussion or a narrow discussion just about the well in the desert once we've heard all of that. So is there um, council comments and discussion um, or other questions of staff for the well in the desert CUP issue? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and then Council Member Garner. Thank you, and I've also got some comments I just want to make regarding the general issue of homelessness once we finish with uh, with the well, uh, but I think we need to deal with uh, that CUP ex uh, extension uh, uh, right at the beginning. Uh, staff did not recommend that we, we do any modifications to uh, the CUP, and uh, by the time we have now finished all of the discussions that have moved forward, I think staff is absolutely correct that there should not be uh, any further modifications uh, to the CUP. Um, but I think it's uh, abundantly evident that the location is not working and uh, that we have to uh, find a different location. Uh, and so, uh, and I think we need to put a time frame to that. I don't know what the specific number of months uh, is, but uh, uh, the location is, has to change. Uh, it's not working in terms of the interactions with the neighbors. It's not working with the interactions with uh, downtown. Um, but we also need to step back when we look at the kind of wraparound program uh, that uh, Greg Rodriguez was uh, presenting to us, and our, ask ourselves what are the what's the kind of program that we need in place uh, in Palm Springs to respond. Uh, so I would like us to uh, do an extension of the CUP for a number of months, as it is uh, right now, uh, for the purpose of. Working with the county, uh, working with the community, uh, developing uh, as quickly as we can uh, an action plan around uh, the wraparound permanent supportive uh, model that uh, Mr. Rodriguez showed us uh, at the end. Uh, and then uh, making a determination as to uh, what, what's the right kinds of services and places uh, for the well to operate. Councilmember Garner. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that the location issue, your, Mayor Pratam, I think you're you're right. Um, you know, I I was I've been to the well several times, and I was there fairly recently. And the thing that's always struck me is that it's, you know, basically the size of a a large apartment, and and that's it. And it, and it's just simply not enough space for Arlene, for her volunteers, for the staff from lots of programs that, that work there, um, for the, the folks that are using those services. Um, it's just not adequate. We, we have a much greater need. Um, and I, I think that hearing from Arlene and hearing that the well is, is willing, and it sounds like, um, I, I don't wanna read too much into it, but she's just even kind of eager to be able to move to a bigger space. Um, I think that we should we should really take advantage of of that and that momentum and and help with finding a better location and a, and a much bigger location. Um, if that does include some some modular elements in order to make that happen quickly, then I think we should do that. 
Um, I also think that we should use some of the extra funding that we do have for homelessness to, to make that happen. Um, I think what we're hearing from our residents is that um, they care. <laughs> they, they want this to be something that is, um, they, they want us to use this money effectively and they want us to provide support for people who are unhoused. Um, and that it's just not, our, the current system is not enough. Um, we do need those 24-hour services, like many people called in to say, and we do need that wraparound um, work. So um, I, I vary a little bit, though, with in terms of the uh, requests that were made. Uh, I, I think that the, the smoking area that they've set up in, in the very back, you, you can't see it at all when you drive up, uh, and, it, and it's something that became came out of almost necessity because of the lack of space. So I feel comfortable with being able to allow that to continue to happen because I'm just not sure that there's any way to quite prevent it, right? You're, you, it ends up kind of pushing the problem just out onto the street instead of just keeping it on the well property. Um, in terms of the, the clothing, if that's something that can be, you know, more effectively done in a different way, then great. Um, but again, I think a lot of the things that they're requesting are things that have just happened because of the space. Um, but I do agree with um, Mayor Pro Tem that if we are going to find another location and, and have this move, then we need to uh, put a time frame on it. And I would like to add that we should be offering um, our full support, like Arlene said, help with the move. Absolutely, I think that we should do that. And, and I, I like to publicly say that I'd like to physically be there to help. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think that's, you know, I would love to see many of us do that if possible. Council Member Corey. Great. Um, yeah, and I appreciate those comments. And I agree with Council Member Garner on the smoking, I think, if, if it's not out and back, if they don't have an area, it is going to end up in the street or people end up in Barristo Park. Um, but I, that's the only one I was also thinking uh, we want to do on this sort of temporary basis. I really appreciate uh, Sir Rosenthal's, you know, I heard the same thing, just the, the challenge with that location they're having. And, you know, it's all the issues in that area are not because of the well, uh, but They've been exacerbated by other things happening uh, because when the well was first there, we actually saw some of the criminal activity decrease. Um, but the increase in homelessness, the impacts of COVID uh, are significant. The other thing I really took away was the importance of, um, you know, the well has really been working with a lot of partner organizations um, over the past year. And I really appreciate seeing that because the well is most effective when in what they do, which is so important from a humanitarian um, viewpoint, when they're partnering with Martha's and their clients can get those other services in that combination. So we're getting wraparound services tied in with the well, which gets people somewhere where you can then help them. Uh, so I think working with them to find that space is critical um, as we did for this space. Uh, and um, I will join you in that effort. I think we do have to help them move on a both personal and professional level. Um, and I think we need to work to the well, which uh, you know, we really heard the willingness tonight to make sure that we're getting better data on their, their clients, right? They're getting entered into the homeless management information system that uh, we're getting outcomes because if we can help do that with them and with the other organizations uh, who we fund, right? We fund the county crisis teams. We fund uh, Martha's with the Desert Healthcare District as well, funds these. Um, it's going to help the well be able to get grants. Uh, so getting that data, where the people are coming from, what the outcomes are, uh, how many do get you know reunited with family, how many do end up in housing, I think it's really going to help the community understand the benefit and the need for this kind of uh, program. But clearly that location, given the current situation, is not working for them. It's not uh, working for the neighbors. Uh, you know, we've you know, also heard right, every weekend there are different people in downtown who want to be helpful, so they give people who are asking for money money. And a lot of that is not obviously going to get them housing. It's going for 
uh, drugs or alcohol. So that location, I think, is, is not working, and I think we just need to get right on it, right, and work with the well to find that location. And it was good hearing that they have some locations they've seen, and I think we can work with them uh, to find a better location that will work for them and work for our city. So thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Wood. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I won't repeat what people said, but I agree. Um, I agree that maybe we should allow the smoking area in the back. I agree that we should look at relocating it. The only thing I would like to add is maybe we want her to start collecting better statistics or work with wraparound programs that collect better statistics on what's going on. Um, it's a perfect place to do that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I agree with all the comments that have been said. So for city staff, what's the direction? Do you have a recommendation um, in hearing the direction of council for um, the, the CUP? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, members of council, I would, uh, just, just to cl clarify, so, so in essence you want to extend the, the conditional use permit temporarily while uh, an alternate site is found. Uh, and I, I just want to make sure that that is the general direction. And now that being said, um, there's a couple ways to approach this. Uh, obviously, the, the one site that has been discussed previously is the former boxing club site on El Cielo. That clearly is a, a space that is not large enough. However, it does have the ability to be expanded with, with modulars, um, at least on a temporary uh, basis. Now, that's the only uh, parcel that this that are building the facility that the city has that, that we could turn that around in any uh, time frame to, to match uh, your expectations. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other sites around the city uh, with on private private land or private buildings. So I would recommend that um, staff come back to you as quickly as possible within 30 days, no more than 30 days, of, of, of a detailed plan of what it would look like at the boxing club, uh, what it would take to get it retrofitted, uh, what it would take to uh, maintain it, secure it, et cetera. So you'd have a little bit more of the operating and what that would require. And then also if there's any additional sites uh, that staff can identify uh, for your consideration. Council Member Garner. Thank you. Um, I, I agree, David, with what you're what you said. Um, and I also just want to um, put out there for the record that we should be including the well in all of these conversations and working closely with them on that. I know that they've um, specifically requested that of us, and and I just want to make sure that they hear that we are we are um, wanting to do that. Other comments from council members? Council member Kors. Just as we look at alternatives, because obviously the boxing club size-wise is not um, a solution without modulars, we also have other property where you know, we might be able to do it with modulars with air conditioning bathrooms and showers, you know, on other city owned property as well. Just, you know, as, as staff looks at this, I just wanted to make sure we keep that in uh, with it. And, you know, I think the county may be able to also have some ideas on locations based on what land they may have. So, you know, let's just talk to all potential partners on this. So I'll make a motion. Well, uh, hold on, Mayor, if I could just uh, want to confirm also, uh, Flynn, there was a, a condi one condition that you wanted to... Council Member Garner mentioned the allowance for an outside smoking area as an amendment to the conditions of approval. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, that's correct. <laughs> Uh, I think all of us uh, can support the uh, smoking area. Thank you. Thank you. So if I can summarize what I heard the direction to be. So um, 
staff will come back within 30 days of a detailed plan, um, looking at the boxing club, additional sites, working with the well and the county and other partners um, to come up with a good um, recommended location or lo location. Um, we're adding and approving the um, requested condition about the smoking section outdoors. Um, and then I also heard direction from multiple council members to think through a condition or request um, to get better data on the clients at the well to integrate that data into HMIS or other um, county systems in order. And, you know, I would also add with the CB200 list um, where we have a by name list um, where we're offering assistance and housing um, to people who are homeless in Palm Springs. Does that sound like the general direction? Is there anything any council member wants to add? Uh, Mayor, I would also, uh, if you wanted to add a, um, a time certain for this extension, uh, I, I think certainly uh, six months would be the outside, probably uh, if it's, you know, may be able to achieve it in three months, but uh, you may want to add a time certain on the extension. What would council like to do with that? I personally, I'd, I'd like us to see, I'd like us to move as quickly as possible, not only with so well, but with all of these, the issue as a whole. Um, if we could do that in four months, I think that would be great. I, I'm hesitant to say six months, it just seems like four months might require an extension. I'd rather not see it get too out of hand. I think the magic is that we've got to get moving on this as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, I feel comfortable if staff comes back in 30 days with recommendations that uh, we'll be able to set the, the right kind of time frame. I agree. I think we're at crisis levels in that area for a variety of reasons. And like Council Member Kors said, you know, those issues pre-existed the well, though they changed, um, you know, when the well was there. And then obviously with all of the impacts, um, it's changed a lot. So I think it's urgent. Um, and I would like to see staff work with the well and other county providers um, to come up with a good plan uh, to move locations in a time frame that would be um, adequate, considering that the fact that it's going to be hot very soon and summer and it's an ongoing humanitarian crisis and just to think through you know the needs of our homeless residents um, during this time and the transition of a site for the well. City of Stafford, Dr. Reddy, do you need additional direction? No, I think I think that's clear. Just to, to summarize on that, uh, we're going to, staff's going to come back to uh, City Council no later than 30 days, which would be, which would be the two meetings from now, uh, with a detailed, uh, well, alternatives on, on a couple sites with a recommendation, and then and you will pick a time for the extension to sunset at that time. Thank you. So do we need to continue the public hearing for this item, or what do we need to do for uh, Yes. Yeah. We recommend continuing the public hearing to the second meeting in the first meeting in May. Well, second meeting in April, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, so that would be the April 22nd meeting. So I'll make that motion. So is just a question. So is that for another round of comments and voting, or is it really an update? The, I mean, the, it seems the, we should the make a decision and then just get an update from staff. The hearing would be continued, but the council's not obligated to open the public hearing. They would still be able to speak under public comment under the Brown Act, but the public hearing does not need to be open, but it gives you the option of opening it if you want. What's the alternative? We could make a decision on this conditional use permit and then get an update from 
staff and a discussion item. Well, if you, for, for example, if you uh, made the decision to a time certain now, uh, then you wouldn't need to do anything with the public hearing. Uh, in essence, we'd come back in 30 days, and let's say you approved the plan, and then we would get going. Uh, if staff was not able to complete that by the time certain, then it would come back then for an extension as a public hearing. Uh, if we could meet the time frame, uh, it would not not be required, unless the new site location requires a conditional use permit. And I'll let the planning director opine on that. If the new site is zoned for civic use, then a conditional use permit would not be required. If it has standard commercial or industrial zoning, then a conditional use permit would be required. The boxing club is zoned civic use, and so a conditional use permit would not be required at the boxing club site. Right. It would seem we want to get public comment once we have options, as a, you know, and a staff update. Um, so maybe we do give the set time, and then when, we're, when we get the update in 30 days, we can obviously that'll be on the agenda, and we'll take public comment. But I think that's what we I think we want, right? Is to staff to come back with options, yeah. and us to then discuss that and get public input on that. The, then, then I, I would recommend uh, I, I like uh, Councilmember Gardner's uh, four months, um, six months maybe a little too long, three months, a little too short. Four months should give us a good running start, and if we're substantially there, uh, certainly council can extend it for a short period of time, but uh, four months would be a, a good starting point. I'm just not comfortable, like Mayor Pro Tem Middleton said, extending for a time without knowing the options, because I think it depends. I think that, you know, we heard that there might be better alternatives, that there might be other assistance available, and I, I just think it might depend on the options and the location, the transition plan and timing. Four months would put us in July or August, so that would be the heat of the summer, which I don't think is ideal since that's the real um, one really important value of the well uh, during the summer especially. Yeah, I think all of that has to be built into the plan and what we're asking staff to come back uh, in 30 days is with a plan. Um, clearly, wherever uh, any entity is relocated to, whether it be the well or anyone uh, else, uh, the public is going to want to weigh in uh, in public comment on that. and every right to weigh in. So uh, we can't uh, wave away uh, the fact that uh, there needs to be uh, a public uh, hearing and discussion uh, when it comes time to uh, make a site selection. And, and I would just note that under any circumstance, the cost involved, the, the, all that will come back to city council, so there will be opportunity for, for public comment. Uh, and even though that, if it doesn't need a CUP, it wouldn't be a public hearing. However, however, we could notice it and you could treat it as a public hearing uh, to, to make sure that you get the appropriate uh, notice and input. I would just like to add that um I do not think the boxing club is an ideal location personally, and I'd like to actually have us look seriously at other locations. And I know that's on the radar, but I just wanted to add that to the public record. Thank you. So, Dr. Reddy, what's your recommendation yeah. about how to proceed well, to continue uh, public hearing more? Sure. Uh, so, so my my best recommendation here is is I understand that there there is going to be some desire to have a, a site alternative other than the boxing club. Having been through this at least seven or eight times, uh, I know the, the the complexity and the difficulty. Then it's certainly going to take longer than three or four months, particularly if if you know that that great plan of the of the you know, navigation center or whatever that ultimately is, you know, that's probably too far out 
to, to help us in this now, uh, but you know that may be an ultimate goal. So uh, you, you may need to have a temporary site uh, up to that. So, so for example, a boxing club site may be uh, for the next year and a half until the larger, more permanent facility is done somewhere else. So it could be any combination of those. So I think uh, it, it may be better to uh, my sense is going back to you close the public hearing, you at least uh, move it for 30 days, uh, staff comes back, once council can start to assess where we're going with this, uh, then you can make a decision on this CUP, whether you're gonna need to extend it for a year, six months, or, or less. Uh, but, but you could close the hearing uh, and you wouldn't have to reopen it for public comment on that meeting, uh, however, once a site is selected with direction, then the subsequent meeting would obviously be noticed and there would be plenty of comment. Thank you. So my motion is to continue the public hearing to a date certain of April 22nd. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Can you have a roll call vote, please. <coughs> Mayor Holstich. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero to continue the public hearing to April twenty second. Thank you. The next item is item two B. Um, a public hearing to consider a request by the city to amend portions of the zoning code and municipal code adopting revisions to the architectural review process and associated entitlement processes. I am recusing on this item, city attorney, if you could provide the legal reasoning of why I'm supposed to recuse here, that would be helpful. Uh, yes, uh, because of your spouse uh, and uh, the potential impact on your source of income, it'd be appropriate for you to recuse yourself on this item. Thank you. So I will be placed in the Zoom room and Mayor Pro Tem Middleton will continue the, um, facilitating this item. All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, item 2B, a public hearing request by the City of Palm Springs to amend portions of Chapter 91, 92, 93, 94 of the Palm Springs Zoning Code and to amend Section 93.63.080 of the Palm Springs Municipal Code, adopting revisions to the architectural review process and associated entitlement processes. Uh, I would like to first ask for a staff report. Mayor Pro Tem and members of City Council, I had a rather extensive presentation prepared for you this evening, but looking at the hour, I'm going to go through the presentation rather quickly and leave it open for questions at the end of this. 14 months ago, you all gave direction to staff to look at streamlining our entitlement processes and specifically looking at reversing our Architectural Advisory Committee and Planning Commission process for architectural review. We put together a subcommittee in July of 2020 consisting of Chair Wermuck and Commissioner Song of the Planning Commission and Chair Jakeway of the Architectural Advisory Committee to study the issue. We looked at the regulations and architectural review processes of other cities in the Coachella Valley as well as other cities throughout the state of California. In looking at our existing process, one of the unique things about the way we do things here in Palm Springs is that we don't have a separate site plan review process. We have a merged site plan and architectural review process. And because of that, that creates an overlap in the responsibilities of our architectural advisory committee and planning commission. And as you all have seen, it sometimes leads to conflict uh, between the two bodies in terms of recommendations. In terms of our existing process, the procedures right now are the formal submittal is step one to the Department of Planning. Step two is that the AAC, the Architectural Advisory Committee, reviews for conformance to our architectural criteria. 
They make a recommendation to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission can either uh, entertain the recommendations of the AAC or, as we see in certain cases, they overturn those recommendations and make their own recommendations and either approve the project where they have final action or in certain cases where there's a general plan amendment or change of zone, it gets forwarded to the city council. Now, that seems rather straightforward, but unfortunately, many times what we see happen is it takes multiple visits with the architectural advisory committee and the applicant redesigning the project to meet the expectations of both the architectural advisory committee and the planning commission, resulting in a somewhat lengthy process. What is being proposed is that we split our process into two separate steps that the Planning Commission would be responsible for what would be called a development permit, where they would review the use, the layout of the site, conformance to development standards, environmental impacts, approve the project at that stage, and then forward it to the Architectural Advisory Committee for architectural review, where the AAC would then refine the architectural details. What this does is to help keep the responsibilities of the two groups separate so that we don't have the issue of overlapping responsibilities. One of the other things that we're proposing is to have a pre-submittal conference with staff. This is something that we saw in other jurisdictions and in my own professional experience. I've used that in other cities. It helps to uh, assist the applicant in preparing a better application. By having a more complete uh, application at the beginning of the process, it also helps to get things through more quickly. So in terms of the changes to the procedure, step one would be a pre-submittal conference with staff. Step two would be the formal submittal of the application. Step three would be the planning commission reviewing the development permit. If approved by the planning commission, then the project is approved and they basically have their entitlements at that stage. Uh, only if required for a general plan amendment or a change of zone, city council would then have the next step in the process. If not, it would then be forwarded to the architectural advisory committee to finalize the architectural details, refine the architecture, and, and approve the architecture. So again, how this shortens the process is the planning commission is essentially entitling the project at step three, and then the architectural review process is really your last step before submitting for building permits. I'll skip through this quickly. I was just going to talk briefly about how uh, the Planning Commission has certain responsibilities and what they do versus what the Architectural Advisory Committee would do. One of the things that I need to point out relative to the Architectural Advisory Committee is historically, the Architectural Advisory Committee members have been appointed by the Planning Commission. What the Planning Commission has recommended is that they continue to have that role, even though the Architectural Advisory Committee will no longer uh, make specific recommendations to the Planning Commission, that they'll exist as two separate bodies. Um, it was uncertain whether or not the City Council would prefer to appoint the members of the Architectural Advisory Committee uh, with this change to the process. Uh, but again, the recommendation of the Planning Commission was to leave that in the hands of the Planning Commission. We're also proposing changes to other processes, not just the architectural review process, as a way to shorten entitlement timeframes. We had a, a chart in your backup materials to talk about that. I'll just go quickly through some of those other changes. Relative to sign programs, currently it requires approval by both the Architectural Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission. What we're proposing is that be shortened just to the Architectural Advisory Committee, so one step instead of two. Also, we are proposing that instead of City Council having to approve sign districts, that that responsibility would be given to the Planning Commission. Relative to conditional use permits, our code currently requires that certain conditional use permits be reviewed by the Planning Commission and approved by the City Council instead of Planning Commission having final action on conditional use permits, which is typically what you see in other jurisdictions. What we're proposing is to revise that section of the code so that Planning Commission would have final action on conditional use permits. 
The other thing that we are proposing is relative to the MAP process, the subdivision MAP process. In reviewing state law requirements, uh, the tentative MAP can be approved by the Planning Commission. Currently, we give that responsibility to the City Council. And so what we're proposing is to shorten the process and allow the Planning Commission to approve tentative MAPs. City Council is required by state law to approve final laps, so you would retain that responsibility. Keep in mind as we talk about these changes to the process and giving more responsibility to the Planning Commission is that City Council can still call up actions of its boards and commissions. And so you would still retain that responsibility. We would report out on the actions of both the Planning Commission and the Architectural Advisory Committee to the City Council if you choose to call those items forward. In terms of the appeal process, staff level approvals would be appealed to either the Planning Commission or the Architectural Advisory Commission, uh, depending on the uh, type of application. For the Planning Commission approvals of development permits, that would be appealed to City Council. And then for architectural review, that would be appealed to the Planning Commission. In discussing these changes to architectural review, we would also need to make some amendments to some of our specific plans. And so what we are proposing that staff would bring forward those changes so the approval process in the specific plans matches the approval process for other application types. Those require their own public hearings and again, we would bring those to you at a later date. In terms of implementation of these changes, uh, in addition to approving the amendments to our municipal code and our zoning code, we would also need to amend the fee schedule as these application types will be changing. The intent is to keep our fee schedule more or less the same so applicants aren't paying more. We will probably need to make certain adjustments to accommodate the pre-submittal conference with staff. Uh, but again, we're looking at more or less maintaining fees generally consistent with what we have now. In certain cases where there will only be a review by one body instead of two, obviously that will assist in reducing the cost of those applications. So at a future meeting date, if these amendments are approved, we'll also bring an amended fee schedule to you. Uh, as I had mentioned, we'll bring forth amendments to the specific plan so they match this process. We would also need a couple of months to begin to prepare for these changes, and so I would recommend at second reading we establish a date to begin this new application process. Uh, we would also need to prepare our staff to conduct the pre-submittal reviews, to prepare checklists, uh, revise our application materials. And then I think even more importantly than that, we would need to do outreach to our development community so that they understand the changes to the process, that they have the opportunity to begin pre-submittal conferences with staff so that we can get those things lined up. One of the things that has been discussed both by the Planning Commission and the Architectural Advisory Committee as well as the community at large is that we need to consider the development of design guidelines that would help to guide applicants in terms of what we expect to see in terms of architectural character. What I would recommend is that we consider this to be a future phase of this project and that city council might consider the appointment of a subcommittee that might consist of representatives from the Architectural Advisory Committee, Planning Commission, and our general design community in terms of developing those guidelines for consideration at a later date. Another thing that I would recommend, with any new ordinance, there's obviously going to be some things that we need to iron out. You never get it right the first time through. There's always little details that you need to correct. And so I'd recommend that we review these changes to our processes in 12 months to see if they are effective in terms of streamlining our processes. So just to summarize, what we're hoping to do with these changes is to eliminate duplicate reviews, uh, make use of a pre-submittal conference to better prepare our applicants for the public meeting process. We are proposing to elim eliminate, sorry, eliminate the overlap of responsibilities between the Architectural Advisory Committee and Planning Commission, and then reduce the number of application types that require council approval, thereby shortening processes. Uh, so that is my presentation and happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you.
Glenn, thank you for a really uh, well executed uh, report. Uh, are there any questions for staff? Council Member Garner, then Council Member Kors. Thank you. Um, Flynn, thank you so much for this. Um, I, I really love this streamlining. Can you, can you just tell us if there's anything that you need to make this happen? You know, there's a couple of things that we need to make this happen. Um, one of them is already underway, and that's our electronic plan submittal process that uh, uh, Aaron is working on and our staff is working on now. Uh, that's something that will certainly help us implement this process. I think more importantly is that we need to have staff that can guide applicants in their preparation of their design materials. Uh, that's gonna be the critical part of this functioning well is being able to work with applicants in getting complete application packages together uh, to help shorten that process. Um, other than that, I, I think that we pretty much can handle the implementation of this. We've had wonderful input from the Architectural Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission in terms of uh, their comfort level with some of these changes. And so I think they're ready for it. The final thing that we need to do is, again, help our development community understand the changes to this process and get them ready to be able to uh, work with the new process. Thank you. Council Member Kors. Um, and Echo the thanks to you and planning and AAC for the work on this. I think streamlining this and that pre-meeting is really going to help move things forward. Um, I only have one little question. I know currently decisions that are final at planning can be appealed or pulled up by council, I think, within 15 days of when we're notified. Would that also apply to any decisions of AAC now that they may be making some that won't be going to planning? Yes, exactly. That's one of the things that we've written into the ordinance is that those final decisions of AAC would also uh, be able to be brought forward to council at your request. Great. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Are there any other questions for staff? All right. At this time, I'd like to open the public <laughs> hearing. The public I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. Uh, Mr. Mejia, do we have any public comments? Yes, uh, and I'm calling her now. Kathy Warmick, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Matt, Madam Assistant Mayor and City Council. I had the pleasure to work on the subcommittee that helped bring this forward uh, with Planning Commissioner Song and uh, Chair Jakeway of the Architectural Advisory Committee. Uh, we studied, we looked at best, best practices in other cities, and this is what we brought you. I'm pretty convinced this will work because I worked for six years in Santa Monica with a system that was very like this. And we actually didn't have any of the duplication uh, that we've seen here uh, with each group making its own decisions. Um, the, the main thing in this that I want to mention is the pre-submittal conference. This uh, really is going to require the city to bring in a new staff person who has both architectural training and urban design experience. Uh, it's really important that the, the process we had before with a review by AAC before it came to planning of certain issues really uh, happen again, but happen at a staff level, happen early on with somebody who has the training to, um, to basically prevent uh, 
about mistakes from coming forward. And it, uh, I think we were all convinced that without uh, this trained staff person, this, this wouldn't work. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, when I was in Santa Monica and the Planning Commission actually reviewed the appeals of the AAC in the six years I was on the commission, we had only two appeals. Uh, the system was was very, it, it worked really well. Anyway, thank you so much for letting me testify. Uh, best of luck in reviewing this. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, uh, that concludes public comment for this public hearing. There being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council? Council Member Woods. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, first of all, I, I thank staff. When I was on Planning Commission, I had asked for a skilled person in urban design and architecture to pre-review um, cases, so I'm glad to see that it's finally coming to fruition. Um, just a couple of things that I want to make a point on. The, the skills of that urban designer and having that urban designer on staff is a key to making this whole system work. So whether we train an existing person or we hire another person, whatever we do, having that person on staff up front is going to make a massive difference in how this program works. The second thing is adopting good design guidelines is also very critical in making this work. I would say that needs to be sooner rather than later. Staff adopt, if staff was recommending it might be a little bit later. I assume that it be, I, I would suggest it be a little bit sooner. Um, I still think the Planning Commission should make comments on the architecture and, re, and send those comments to AAC. Um, and the reason I say that is the Planning Commission is going to be working on massing. And if you're working on massing, massing and architecture kind of go together. So you don't want to squeeze a tall building that looks completely out of proportion. So I think the Planning Commission still should be able to make comments on the architecture and forward that to AAC for their consideration and review. Um, so with that, that's all my comments, Mayor Pro Tem. Are there any other comments? I would just like to add uh, the congratulations uh, that come from all of my colleagues. And uh, we had discussions dating back to when I first went on uh, uh, Planning Commission in 2014 on this. So, uh, Lynn, Kathy, Maria, uh, everyone who is involved, thank you so much. This is uh, outstanding. We have a uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem, just as, as a comment, I would just make two observations. One, uh, this is a long time <clears throat> coming, so uh, thank you for moving forward, Flynn. Uh, this, I think, would be hugely important. Uh, however, I do, I do want to make one one observation, this is just, uh, is, if I could, is a leaving, leaving you with the 20 years experience. Certainly you want to make sure this is staffed correctly, but the one caution is what I've seen happen over and over again, and it actually turned out to be a worse situation, is where uh, we think that the, the, the power is essence vested in, in almost one person informally. And so a developer interacts with this person and uh, that person's bias, come on, well, I think council really doesn't want this, and I think that's sort of how we've done it. And then the next thing you know, the roadblocks start getting caught up by some st a staff person. You know, a lot of it's unintentional. Uh, and so, and, and again, that just comes back to, um, you know, the, the director and the top management staff, you know, obviously being, still being part of that process. That, that's just not one individual that's making these decisions. Uh, that would just be my caution. So, again, I support this wholeheartedly. I, I would just want to make sure that it's not any single staff person making these decisions because that's where you might have some problems. Just an observation. And I have every confidence Flynn will be able to manage that process. Uh, I, I just want, uh, j just giving you my, my, my observation. And Dr. Reddy, a very uh, wise observation. Do we have a motion? I would, uh, oops. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I move to accept staff's recommendation. <laughs> Bye. Councilmember Garner, uh, seconded by Councilmember Woods. 
There you go. Sure. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Motion passes four to zero with Mayor Holstead recused. Uh, uh, Mr. Mejia, you need to read the uh, ordinance by title. Yes, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for that. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, amending portions of Chapter 91, Chapter 92, Chapter 93, and Chapter 94 of the Palm Springs Zoning Code and amending Section 9.63.080 of the Palm Springs Municipal Code to adopt revisions to the architectural review process and associated entitlement processes. Thank you. Thank you. Yay, she's back. Hello. So the next item is item 4A, discussion regarding a temporary moratorium on evictions for commercial tenancies. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, honorable mayor, members of the city council. Uh, the item before you is consideration and uh, possible direction to staff regarding uh, uh, action on the city's commercial moratorium ordinance. Um, as the council will recall, uh, last April, the city council adopted a moratorium for both residential and commercial uh, tenancies that essentially provided that if a tenant uh, was uh, um, impacted by COVID uh, in financial ways, then they could uh, uh, seek relief and they would uh, not be evicted uh, from uh, their their landlords and, and in addition there would be 180 days after the end of the protections uh, uh, in which the tenant would be able to repay the back rent. The, that moratorium was extended several times uh, and last considered by the City Council in September of 2020. Uh, at that time, uh, a new bill was introduced and passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. Uh, and that bill uh, essentially preempted city's ability to further extend residential eviction moratoria. However, it did not have any impact on commercial uh, eviction moratoria. At that time, given the numbers uh, and the kind of reopening that was occurring, uh, the city council decided to not extend the commercial moratorium, uh, and that started the 180-day time period for repayment of uh, commercial rent. As we come upon the end of that 180-day time period and uh, the state of California obviously uh, went through a, a, a shutdown during uh, December and part of January. Um, facts changed and so uh, the thought was we wanted to bring this back to the city council uh, to consider whether the city council wants to take any action on the uh, soon to expire time period for paying back uh, the commercial rent. So before you are several options. Uh, the first option is to do nothing. Uh, that would result in, uh, on March 29th, the 180-day time period for payment of, uh, a repayment of back rent would expire uh, and tenants would uh, uh, owe that amount, whatever that amount is, to their, to their landlords. Um, the second option is uh, potentially to extend the eviction moratorium protection. So uh, the council could uh, decide to extend uh, the protections against eviction uh, as well as repayment of the back rent for some number of, of months, whatever the council decides in its discretion is appropriate. Uh, and then the third option is um, uh, an extension of uh, the eviction moratorium protections uh, with some modifications. And the modifications are really meant to uh, enable the tenants to uh, pay back their back rent um, over time as opposed to all in one lump sum. Uh, and also provide some protections for the landlord. So uh, what's being proposed uh, and recommended by the business retention uh, liaisons is um, uh, providing for an extension of the moratorium uh, for some time period determined by the city council, uh, and then uh, requiring the tenants on a going forward basis to pay uh, all of their uh, rent going forward. Uh, so they would have to stay current as of April going forward. Uh, and then also uh, providing for repayment of their back rent uh, based on some formula determined by the council. So one formula could be um, it has to be paid off uh, in 12 months, and so you divide the um, amount that is currently owing in back rent by 12 months, and that amount has to be paid each month 
in addition to staying current uh, by the tenants. And again, that provides additional protection for the landlords um, so that they're getting a rent paid going forward and also uh, kind of helps the commercial tenants dig themselves out of that hole uh, that's been created these last 12 months as, as they may not have been paying their, their full rent. Um, that uh, would be the recommendation. Again, the specifics of those numbers, uh, those are entirely up to, up to the council, but that would be the recommendation of the business retention uh, liaisons. Uh, in addition, uh, it's, uh, it's possible that the council might want to consider um, uh, providing for uh, obligations to pay their rent as part of the uh, city's uh, business uh, uh, aid program. Um, that would um, that would help ensure that landlords are, are getting paid with some of the funds that are being provided by the city under the uh, under that program. Uh, finally, with regard to the kind of uh, mechanics of how this would work, this is not actually an ordinance uh, that's before you, but instead, should the council decide to take action, it would be direction to the uh, emergency services director, the city manager, uh, and following direction, we would work together to draft uh, the appropriate order. Uh, and that concludes my uh, presentation. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for city staff, council member Corey. Um, enough questions just to share uh, with the council and the public. Um, we did discuss this with the uh, COVID reopening task force. Uh, Michael Braun sort of came up with the idea of as long as people were current in rent, which they want to encourage, um, paying it back over 10 months or a year. Um, which will, as opposed to a lump sum, uh, to some degree when we stopped ours and we gave people six months to pay back rent, we weren't anticipating another full closure. Um, and did hear from um, both tenants who felt that they were current with rent and they could stay current, uh, but paying all their rent back in four days uh, was just not doable. Um, and we sent out a uh, meeting notice to 270 commercial landlords and we had uh, a good conversation on it and um, because the courts are not taking eviction cases you know something to help incentivize people to pay the back rent um, seemed like something most people were very comfortable with so that's sort of where the recommendation comes from so i just want to share that questions or comments from council members council member woods You're on mute, Dennis. I miss saying that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do like the recommendation made by our city attorney that those that are that receive our small business grant actually use that money or make sure that they're not back on rent because we really are trying to preserve the brick and mortar. So I just wanted to put that in there that his recommendation on page two of the staff report at the, the last paragraph. Other comments? Mayor Person Middleton. You know, I, I want to thank the uh, Business Retention Committee for their work and for all of the outreach to uh, our local business community. Um, as we start to move through this, uh, we too often, I think, uh, lump all landlords together as all alike and all uh, commercial renters together uh, as all the same. Uh, I spoke to, uh, over the last year, on a number of occasions to landlords that uh, own a few buildings and uh, some of their renters are uh, uh, extremely large uh, corporations with uh, uh, very, very profitable businesses across the country uh, that just simply uh, said, I'm not paying uh, rent uh, for the next uh, number of months. Uh, I don't want to be protecting uh, those kinds of uh, very large, well-positioned uh, corporate players. Uh, I've also talked to uh, uh, local small business people who are very concerned uh, that uh, their landlords trying to find an opportunity uh, to terminate their lease or at least uh, not renew the lease 
so as to be able to uh, position themselves to uh, turn it over to uh, a chain store or some other type of uh, national operation. Uh, I don't have anything against uh, uh, large organizations as such. Um, but when it comes to protection, the people I'm interested in protecting uh, are the local Palm Springs business uh, community, uh, the people who live here, work here, uh, and own and operate businesses here. Uh, so as we move through this, uh, I, whatever subtlety we can attach to these to make sure it's our business folks that we're protecting, uh, I want to make sure we do that. Councilmember Garner. Thank you. Uh, I I agree with that sentiment. I, I think that we are looking for people to, for if businesses can pay their, their rent, you know, please, they should do that. Um, but certainly we want to be sensitive to the needs of the business community, specifically our small business community. Um, so I, I appreciate the idea that someone, that the businesses would be required to work with the landlord in order to make this payment plan happen. I think that's, that's a reasonable request. Um, but I wouldn't want to put too many restrictions or requirements on that. I think the, the most important part is that they're collaborating and making a plan together. But I think just as Mayor Pro Tem said, um, it's not a one size fits all issue. Um, so I'd like them to, to figure it out um, business by business with their landlord. Yeah, so one thing actually we discussed, um, Mayor and I and the city attorney, is, you know, this would sort of be the base and then you, if the landlord and tenant work on something different that they agree to, um, great, right? Uh, it's really, I think the businesses, and I, the ones I heard from were small businesses concerned that at the end of this month, they have to pay all the back rent and the lump sum and they just can't do it. And while the landlord wouldn't be able to evict them just because of the court back, Log, they don't want, you know, they're on a credit report or to have an issue later. Uh, a lot of the tenant, you know, a lot of tenants I met with and a lot of landlords have worked with their tenants, but not all of them. Um, and so, yes, we definitely want to encourage something that might be ben more beneficial. I also think to Mayor Pro Tem's point, we could do something where sort of like our grants, right? It, if you have five or more locations, maybe this doesn't apply you know, as a chain, similar to what we did with our business grants, right? So just, just want to throw that as an option. If that addressed your concern, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Council Member Wood. A question for our city attorney. Um, earlier, I made a comment. I meant to say at the bottom of page three, but the, the question for the city attorney is, what is a substantial decrease in business income? I, I'm not sure. I mean, how do you, how does one, and that's on the top of page three, the basis for the eviction is non-payment of rent or foreclosure arising out of substantial decrease in business income. And I'm just wondering what substantial means. That is not defined in either the state uh, executive order. That language is, is actually from the state's executive order, uh, and that order does not define that term. And so it would be, it would be um, determined by uh, a court um, in, if, uh, if an eviction action were uh, attempted to be brought by, by a landlord. Thank you. You know, I, I, I share some of the um, comments by Mayor Pro Tem Middleton that landlords and tenants aren't one size fits all. I definitely think we want to support local businesses, especially small businesses um, that have these huge balloon payments of a year's worth of rent due or, you know, many months of rent due. That's just untenable for most to pay. Um, and I don't think it's fair for, you know, our, um, ours to expire and have rent due um, on that date. So we definitely, I do 
support a policy solution for that. Um, I'm struggling um, with what that is. Um, and, you know, we talked about as the liaisons, um, the modification. So um, setting some terms there, I'm just not sure what those terms are. Um, because I think that a lot of tenants and landlords are already in agreement um, for the past due rent. And I'm worried that we might override those and that actually provide incentive not to go along. Whatever we set will be the ceiling maybe of what tenants will pay um, and also not, you know, assist um, both tenants and landlords. So I'm nervous about approving it as an emergency order without having the language worked out. Um, right now, because I think there are still some, and I'm thinking this through and at now, and um, we've done a lot of work on this already, but um, we had talked to the city attorney about, you know, okay, so it applies if a tenant is current on rent starting April, 2021. Is that the right date? You know, what would be the right percentage of rent that we would require. I'm just not sure of all of those terms. So, you know, it's hard because we had a, we allowed the moratorium to be expired because um, we thought that, you know, this might not be required. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested in, in the council suggestions there um, on what might be good terms and how it would be clear enough that we could implement it um, starting you know, tomorrow without having the language in front of us and without the public having that. One idea maybe um, for the city attorney, is there a way we could um, do the the emergency order because it did get, this got kicked back a couple of times um, and now we're in a date crunch um, that will just apply for two weeks and then bring back the specific language at the next council meeting? Um, with a couple options, whether it's you know divided over a year, ten months, you know, and then we could make the long-term decision versus trying to write the policy now at eleven thirty. Uh, but we don't want people people really getting nervous that you know it's doing a I think on the 29th of March and they can't do it and they don't want a grounds for eviction, especially people who have long-term leases who put a lot of money into building a restaurant or something. And they're worried, you know, landlords get someone in and take advantage of those improvements. And I don't think that's, it's a minority, but it's the ones who are really concerned. So is there a way we can do something, a stopgap until we can actually bring the language? Yes, that would be possible. That would be uh, somewhat similar to what you did actually in March of 2020. You did a, a sort of a stopgap uh, eviction moratorium until we could bring back a more tailored ordinance uh, that the council ultimately adopted. Uh, so you could extend it, basically take option two, extend it, you know, one month, and that would give us time to bring back something um, and give, give the council some time to chew on it. And provide the public more notice of what it is specifically so they could weigh in. We can get their input as well. I'm sure and the mayor and I could do another meeting with both the tenants and with the landlords once we have that. Is that good? I would support that. Do you need a motion to take that action? Uh, yes, and it would actually be a motion to direct the emergency services director to uh, extend the protections of the uh, previous ordinance by 30 days. I make that motion. I'll second. My motion is made and seconded. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Holstich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton? Aye. Councilmember Woods? Yes. Councilmember Kors? Yes. Councilmember Garner? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. And could I just confirm, was it Mayor Pro Tem Middleton who made the second? I think it was me, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is public comment. City Clerk, is there any public comment tonight? There is no public comment for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is City Council and City Manager requests an upcoming agenda development. Council Member Kors. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to ask uh, 
And I see on our list, tentative April 8th, uh, for the uh, apology resolution related to Section 14 that the Human Rights Commission passed. Uh, Councilmember Garner and I and Rhonda Hart, the chair of the Human Rights Commission, have discussed um, doing a special joint meeting with the Human Rights Commission on this and in Section 14 in general and providing them time to maybe get some oral histories and really use it as an educational opportunity as well as any actions uh, as a council we want to take. So if council's good with that, I'd like to suggest we look at that for sometime later in April or in May so they have time you know, at their next meeting to really continue the work that they're doing on this. And um, I know Councilmember Garner and I uh, as well have asked just so we have all the records and all the factual information and really use it as an opportunity to educate the public about this period in our history. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you, we had uh, a tremendous amount of conversation uh, today, both in closed session and in open session on homelessness issues. Uh, ultimately, as we uh, got into the public uh, hearing, uh, we were concentrating on the actions of uh, the county and future cooperation that we need with uh, the county, as well as the uh, uh, CUP for the well in the desert. Uh, I think we got we lost some of the conversation that we need to have on much broader issues of homelessness in Palm Springs. Uh, and most particularly in terms of what's the proper responses uh, for the city. Uh, and I'm not going to drag us through a whole long series of conversations. We've all had many. Uh, but there was one conversation I had uh, earlier this week with one of my constituents that I was particularly struck by. Uh, I started the conversation by saying, I understand how angry you are. And he corrected me and said, I'm not angry. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to walk my neighborhood. I'm afraid that my business is going to close. I talk to people every day who are afraid that their businesses are going to close. I talk to people every day who had a break in, who do not uh, let their employees stay at work at 6 p.m. Uh, this has to be uh, the issue before us. Uh, and we've tried to do hard things uh, in Palm Springs. Uh, this is going to be a really hard thing because uh, uh, we want to be a community that provides help to everybody who needs help. Uh, but we also have to protect our residents and our businesses as well. So I, I want to have us to continue. Uh, prioritize in almost every meeting uh, what what are we doing and what do we need to do to deal with the issue of homelessness in our community. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Other council requests? So, Just a note for council, if I can first. Um, there was a consideration um, of bringing forward a request to the U.S. House of Representatives and Congressman Ruiz's office for community project submissions as part of the federal fiscal year 2022 budget process. I know Councilmember Kors has been leading on this issue um, with the Mayor's Coalition in California that um, he also leads. And so um, we had conversations with Congressman Ruiz's staff today. Um, that deadline is now extended to April 14th. So um, we are requesting that that come forward at the next council meeting on April 8th for um, council action to approve a, an application. Um, and if we can, um, council member Kors and I will continue to work with city staff to um, and Congressman Ruiz's staff um, to bring forward a project within those guidelines. Uh, city staff, requests and comments and city manager. Uh, th thank you, Mayor, members of council. Just uh, just to summarize, uh, so I understand this, the section 14 apology would be moved to later in April, so that will not be on the 8th. Um, 
so we will have the discussion of SB 1383, which is ready to go. Uh, Mr. Tallarico is prepared to move forward the organics management and recycling requirements. That's an important topic. Uh, the community workforce agreements, uh, the discussion on the inclusionary ordinance for affordable housing, uh, and then obviously, as you mentioned, Mayor, the, the federal grant opportunity. And then finally, the, the uh, and this is a question if you want that included, the, the Arts Commission had passed a recommendation for a mural ordinance update. Council had mentioned previously, and this was on your list, that that's an issue you want to discuss about. So if, if you are, want to, that is um, available for your discussion. That would come to you as a discussion item only. Um, and that is all that we would have for the meeting of the 8th. Mayor, um, Dr. Reddy, there's also um, a staff report that uh, is getting finalized regarding some questions for council to give direction for the Desert Community Energy Board that uh, Mayor Pro Tem and I have been working on with uh, Patrick. Yes, thank you for that correction, uh, Councilman Coors. Uh, that, that staff report is ready to go, and that would be also done by Mr. Tallarico. Is there a specific direction you need about that agenda, Dr. Reddy? No, I think, well, if, uh, <laughs> and again, this would be uh, Mr. Clifton's first meeting. I think if, if with, without the Section 14 apology on that meeting, you do obviously are going to have some, some, some room for a, c a couple of these other items. Um, so I, I think certainly we have, we have a full enough agenda with those items. Thank you. Any other council? accidentally got muted. Any other council member um, requests at this time? Seeing none, we thank Dr. Reddy for getting through his last city council meeting here in the city of Palm Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, council members, all of you and staff, thank you again so much from the bottom of my heart. God bless all of you and, and wish only the best for Palm Springs and uh, I'll I'll, I'll just always be observing, and, and if I could have a front row seat at a council meeting sometime, that might be a nice thing as well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we will adjourn. The next regular city council meeting will be held on April 8th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.